Next trial in the matter of case number CFI 051-2017 and is being held by way of video conference before His Excellency Justice Shamran Sawalhi appearing from Dubai. Any orders or directions made during or after the course of this hearing will be issued by the registry on the judge's instructions. The claimant is represented by Clyde & Co. and lead counsel is Mr. Tom Montagu Smith Casey. The defendant is represented by Tamimi and Company and lead counsel is Mr. Rupert Reed Casey. Will the judge and the party's representatives please confirm that the situation is as I have stated? I confirm it for the claimant, yes. It is, thank you. Yeah, I uh, confirm from my side and I confirm today is my birthday as well. Oh, happy birthday. birthday. <laughs> I, should, I should also um, just, just mention, uh, Your Excellency, that I have helping me, Mr. Edward Knight, uh, and then Mr. Tim Killen is assisting uh, uh, my learned friend. All right, no worries. Yes, Robert, please go ahead. My Lord, I want to make a few points. Firstly, in terms of Arabic translations, your, Lord, your Excellency will see that um, for most of the cases we have the Arabic. Uh, it may be in respect to the statutes that your Lordship already has, your Excellency already has the Arabic translations, particularly the commercial company law and the uh, civil code. But if, mm. if you don't, then those, those can be provided. Um, uh, secondly, um, I, I would like to thank both legal teams for their work on the bundles. There has been a slight fly in the ointment, which was that an authority was dropped into the middle of the authorities bundle uh, at the end of last week, which yeah. uh, caused Mr. Killen to spend a, a happy few hours uh, arranging or, or adjusting, amending uh, references in notes and cross examinations, etc. Yeah. I, I would just ask that, that that doesn't happen again, that both sides resist the temptation to drop any new documents or, or new authorities anywhere near the middle of the bundle. If anything, they should go at, at the end. Um, and lastly, um, uh, Your Excellency, before Mr. Malone Friend starts, we would just like to make a concession uh, in respect of the arguments of de facto company. Uh, we would accept that a de facto company arises where a company is a nullity that has conducted business, but we say that it arises for limited purposes. Uh, i.e. to satisfy debts owed by the company, not to pursue debts to the company, i.e. to allow third parties to pursue claims against the company. Uh, mm -hmm. And also it, it arises uh, as between partners uh, in a liquidation in respect of ascertained debts. And, and we, we emphasize the word debts rather than uh, unascertained claims. So, my Lord, that, that is a limited concession which you want to start in order that we don't waste your time uh, with, with argument on, on that issue. Yeah, Mr. Tom, would you like to comment on this? Well, any concession is a welcome concession, but I think we're going to have to go back to the authorities anyway, um, because it's very clear that what my learned friend has just said is wrong. Um, it's very clear from the authorities that if you have a company in that situation, um, where, where it's been declared some sort of nullity, then it just remains a legal entity uh, until it is wound up. That's the consequence of, quotes, nullity. Um, so um, well, I'll, I'll have to show you those authorities anyway, it looks like. All right, so just, just a matter of uh, understanding, are we going to go through the uh, e-bundle? Because the, the registry, they sent me a, a, a PDF file. Still, I'm struggling to download that PDF file, to be honest. But I'm I'm happy to go through the e bundle with the the page number the, the usual way we, we we used to do. It. Yes. So, so, so the, I, I propose to give you page numbers. Yeah. Um. I I think somebody is going to try to bring them up on the screen here today. Oh, oh that's, that's um, good. As I go through them, but but you will be able to search through the e bundle with the page yeah. number. Now the the reason we supplied a PDF was because. There is the, the e bundle is colossal, <laughs> yeah. I think is the only word you can use for it. There's a hundred and over 150,000 pages in there. So, just in case the system falls over, we had yeah. provided a PDF just so that everybody could have a, 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 a local document yeah. to work from. And if we do it from there, then we'll have to search that document or, or if it's been cut up, various of them to, um, to find the page number. But I'll be giving you page numbers and hopefully someone will be helping us um, bring those up. Yeah. So the only thing that I just want to make sure that I, I, I'm, I'm not able to download this uh, PDF for maybe an internet problem or working from home, but maybe for tomorrow it wouldn't be any problem. But fingers right. crossed it won't be a problem today either, but we'll see. Yeah, sure. All uh, right. Very good. Starting. 
OK, all right, very good. Thank you, um, Your Excellency. So so I'm going to start the the open my my case. And um, I think in, in our in our submission, this is a very simple case indeed. What happened was that quite a long time ago now, in January 2015, the parties signed a contract uh, and under that contract, the defendant appointed the claimant as an exclusive third party administrator of its insurance portfolio. And as a result of that, the defendant was required to transfer across to the claimant all of its insurance portfolio administration, both the ones that it insured itself and also those which were reinsured by BUPA. So you will have seen in the papers a lot of reference to BUPA. There's an obligation in this contract on the defendant to transfer the BUPA lives. And what happened after that contract was signed is that the parties made very significant preparations for that, for the services to commence. And everybody was ultimately aiming for the services to go live, that is actually commence administration services, on the ultimately on the 24th of May. 2015. And just three days before that happened, or well, that was due to happen, the defendant had a change of heart. Now, we, we, we don't really know why the defendant changed its mind. At the time, what they said was that it was a strategic decision which had been imposed by their board and which it took their management by surprise. That's what they said at the time. And we know that they appointed a new CEO around this time, so that may have had something to do with it. And actually, co co correspondence from the time, and we'll go through this in a bit, suggests that what was happening was that the defendant was particularly concerned that it was going to have to incur the cost during the transition of two sets of administration services. So it would have to pay the claimant to administer the portfolio, but during the course of the transition, until in particular it was able to transfer across the Bupa lives, it was going to incur the cost of administration in relation to that. So the, the, the correspondence suggests that, that its concerns were its own commercial concerns, that it was going to cost more than it had anticipated to comply with this contract. Ultimately, it, do, it doesn't really matter what, what the reason is, because there is no allegation that the claimant was in breach of the contract. So it's it's not said that there's any justification for termination of the contract. So the claimant's case is very simple indeed. The defendant breached the contract by refusing to perform. The claimant's entitled to recover the profit that it would have earned on that contract and as a result of that contract. So what is the what is the, the defendant's response to this claim? And it is, we say, just a series of bad points. My learned friend invites you to take startling positions on a range of issues to escape what we say is a, a very clear and very substantial liability. He also, I'm afraid, invites you to accept that we have conceded things which we have not conceded. And he also makes factual assertions in his skeleton argument, which are demonstrably wrong, and others for which there is no evidential basis at all. And I'll take you through some of those as we go. But the first point that he raises, he says, well, the claimant doesn't exist. Doesn't exist at all. So therefore, the contract cannot exist. That, that's his starting point. This being the company that the defendant has in full knowledge of the um, relevant arrangements, not only contracted with, but contracted to purchase 51% uh, of. That's the nullity argument. And, and if we just pause there to consider the, the consequences of that argument, or I, I, I'll come on to the detail of it. But according to the defendant, the claimant just doesn't exist and therefore was unable to contract. And the logical conclusion of that is, is enormous. It can't have any employees. It can't have any assets. Its bank accounts don't really belong to it. It has a license, but it doesn't because it's not really here. That's the consequence of my learned friend's argument. With respect, the consequence would be absurd. But the problem goes wider than that because this all stems from a common arrangement for shareholders of companies in the UAE. 
And so if the claimant suffers from this problem, so would many other companies in the market who had foreign shareholders, non-domestic shareholders. UA corporate law would be utter chaos and it would have real world implications for business and for the employees. It is an unrealistic position, we say. And there are any numbers of answers to it. So in, in fact, and I'll take you through the side agreement that my the real problem here. There is no illegality problem with it. There isn't, and we will show you that. But even if there was, the consequence would not be that the claimant would suddenly disappear. It would be liable to be wound up. So even if the company is invalid or void or a nullity in the way that my learned friend suggests, it remains a de facto company. It has a legal personality. And you'll see in, in, in the authorities, sometimes they use the phrase de facto, sometimes they use the word actual. It depends on the language that you take. But until it is wound up, then it continues to exist, it continues to function, and the process of winding it up, the process of liquidation, involves not just giving out money, but getting in assets, getting in its rights. And, and you'll see that. It's not a mechanism for debtors of companies or obligors of companies to wriggle out of their contracts. This is an opportunistic point, not only because they say in terms they knew all about it when they entered into the contract. So that's the first line of attack, this, this nullity argument. We say it's just unrealistic. The second argument is that the contract didn't exist. So they say, well, we didn't actually contract. And we say again, that's an equally startling position to take. You, you will, as we go through the evidence, you will see the parties met for two days in January 2015 to hammer out the final wording of the agreement. And then they signed it and they had a signing ceremony when they signed it and then they announced it to the market. They announced it to their health healthcare providers and they changed their contract with their healthcare providers and they announced it to the regulators. And then everybody made substantial preparations to, to get ready for go live. And that involved transferring significant amounts of confidential information to the claimant. And it even uh, involved transferring staff to the claimant. Now, ultimately in this, you're going to be guided largely by the documents rather than anything anybody says about what happened at a meeting eight years ago. And I think my learned friend accepts that in principle. You, the, the documents are going to be a better guide to the facts here. But 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 the bottom line is the parties signed a contract. And so your best guide to what they were agreeing to is in that document. We will look at it. And the documents all we say speak of a contract that was binding. And that was three days away from go live when the defendant decided to pull out. So that's the first uh, line of argument, the uh, second line of argument, sorry, that my learned friend advances. He says there just wasn't a contract. He says that because he says, well, there wasn't an agreement for the contract to start at all. And also it appears that it said, well, also the contract was conditional. So there, was a con there were two conditions precedent on the contract coming into existence. That's what he says. And again, you won't see any of that in the documents, but there are two conditions that he asserts. First, he says the contract was conditional on the transfer of some of the shares in the claimant to another party, which was owned, he says, by the defendant. So there's a share transfer condition, according to my learned friend. And the second is he says that it was conditional on the claimant obtaining certain licenses. Now, we say this is a this is a, a confused plea, at least in the pleadings, and it's not really clarified in my learned friend's skeleton argument, because there's two ways that obligations under a contract might be conditional. The, the first is that the whole contract might be conditional. So in other words, there just isn't any. There's a, some sort of side agreement where everybody says, well, we've signed this document, but, but you know, the, 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 that doesn't come into effect until certain things happen. The other is if you have a binding contract, but obligations under that contract are not triggered until certain events occur. 
That is a very different concept. You still have a binding contract. You can't just say, I'm walking away from this contract because we haven't got to the stage where the obligation arises. Um, and so if you were in that sort of circumstance, then you can't just walk away. There'd be no, no, no possibility uh, of terminating. But either way, none of this appears in the contractual documentation that is relevant. Now, in, in part, the defendant tries to make out this case by pushing together two different and quite separate agreements. And it's important to keep the distinction in mind, because on the one hand, you have the contract between the claimant and the defendant, the contract on which this claim is based. That is the third party administration agreement, the TPA agreement. And on the other hand, you have a document which is a contract which is called the Memorandum of Understanding. That is related to the TPA agreement, but is between different parties. It's effectively a bit like a shareholders agreement. It's at the shareholder level. It's quite separate. It doesn't affect my client's contractual rights because my client is not a party to that document. And so there's no logical or legal basis to push those two agreements together. They are separate contracts between separate parties. But that is that that is effectively the whole case on liability. There's no claimant. There's no contract. If you find that there is a claimant and there is a contract, then that is the end of it. On liability, there's no case, as I say, that the claimant breached the contract. There's no case that termination was justified on any other basis. And that's that's liability. And then we come to quantum. And I will I'll go through in a moment. I'm just summarizing really an outline and then I'll come back to the detail of these aspects of the case if I may. On quantum, my case is for loss of profits. And there are two parts to that. The first, I claim fees and other sums which would have been earned directly as a result of the defendant transferring its insured lives into the claimant's hands for administration. So under the agreement, the TPA agreement itself, the claimant's fees depended on the number of lives insure, in, insured individuals who were actually transferred into the claimant's uh, administration. And there was effectively a fixed fee per life in relation to that. And we know how many lives there would have been because we have the data which shows how many lives were insured by the defendant in the relevant period. It's historical data which just shows that. So we know very clearly how much would have been paid by the defendant to the claimant for administration fees. And the experts have calculated that. Now they do come out at different numbers, but there is a reason for that, and I'll explain why. But on the claimant's side, the claimant's expert says that the fees that would have been earned were, would have been 180 million dirhams. The defendant's expert says, no, it would have been a 99 million dirhams. So there is a difference between that. But the difference relies on legal issues, legal points. And I'll, I'll address those in, in, in due course. So it comes down to the length of the contract uh, and whether or not uh, you have to take into account the Bupa lives. Uh, and, and another um, minor point. But ultimately, what you have is a, a very straightforward claim for fees which would have been earned. Uh, and then you have to work out what the cost would have been associated um, with that to get to the profit on which, again, there's really very limited disputes, much of which is legal. And against that, you've got a series of highly complicated bad points, we say. Now, there's some um, there is some scope for debate on some of the other issues in relation to the quantum of losses, and I'll, 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 I'll take you through those in opening. But we say what you have to do is do your best to assess the losses. That's what courts are supposed to do. Um, and, and when you do that, you will find that the claimant should be awarded a significant sum in damages. So what I had with that general overview, what I'd intended to do was this. 
Firstly, I'm going to take you through a very brief summary of the background and show you one or two of what we say are the key documents in this. Secondly, I'm going to explain a little bit more about what we say about the points on liability. And then thirdly, I'm going to look at quantum. Uh, and I'm going to deal with, firstly, the, the issue of principle of how you approach quantum, because there's a dis difference between the parties on that. And then secondly, I'm going to try to help you understand what are the major differences between the parties in the calculation of quantum. And you'll see actually most of it comes down to uh, disagreements about the law rather than anything factual. So starting then, if I may, with the background. Um, and of course, as ever, Your Excellency, do feel free to interrupt me at any point if there's anything specific that you'd like me to uh, deal with. But, but, but subject to that, um, starting with the background, I, I, as you will have seen, the, the, the role of the claimant is as a third party administrator for the insurance industry. And so what happens is that when you have um, a, an insured person makes a claim under their health insurance, some insurers manage that claim process in-house. They do it themselves. Uh, uh, but many now contract that function out to a third party, and that's a TPA, a, a claims administrator. And there are good reasons for doing that. Um, one of them is that administrators benefit from economies of scale. So they have the technology and the know-how to be able to undertake that process. Um, but they're also the, the administrator um, can uh, aggregate claims together and get advantages from that. So the, the, the health insurance, the health insurer can tap into those advantages by agreeing to allow the administrator to deal with the claims on its behalf. Um, and some of the advantages are the normal ones of economies of scale. So the, the, they're using effectively common resources of the administrator um, that is being applied to multiple insurance portfolios. But the administrators are also able to manage the relationship with the healthcare providers, so the hospitals, the clinics, and so on. And they can negotiate better prices from the providers. And they can also benefit from what are called volume rebates. So that's an important part of the damages claim, the volume rebates. So there's two parts. There's the fees that you earn per life effectively. Sometimes it's done differently, but under this arrangement per life uh, for the administration of the claims. But there's also the opportunity to obtain volume rebates. And then the way that works is at the end of each cycle, the, the healthcare providers repay to the insurer a percentage of the total amount that's been spent on the provider. So they add up everything that's been paid at that hospital and they give a what's called a volume rebate at the end of the cycle. And the more you spend at that hospital, at that clinic, the higher the percentage. And so what the administrator can do is it can group together all of the claims from all of its insurers and therefore access higher levels of discount for all of the insurers. And then the rebate is received and it's split between the administrator and the insurer. So there's a benefit to the insurer, but there's a benefit to the administrator. And that's the sort of second chunk of, of value that uh, administrators get from these arrangements. So there are distinct advantages which can come from channeling claims administration into a third party. And generally speaking, the more lives that are being administered, the better. And those efficiencies, those uh, advantages can be used to improve the offering of the administrator and attract new insurers to the administrator, which in turn generates more fees, more advantages uh, and uh, improves uh, the, the, the um, uh, position of the administrator in the market. Now, the, the claimant is part of uh, the Globe Med Group, which offers these services in the Middle East and also in, in Africa. And the, the, the group was initially providing services in the UA through a free zone company in Dubai Healthcare City, but then the law changed and administrators had to be incorporated on shore. And so the claimant was established in 2013. Now, at that time, but not anymore, the claimant had to be 51% owned by UA, UAE National. 
Uh, and so that is what we say happened. However, the shareholders of the claimant entered into a side agreement. And I'll show you these documents briefly because the defendant puts quite a lot of weight on this. So the first document we're going to look at is in bundle F, and I think it's behind tab 27, and the page is 1513. And I'm showing you the translation. I think we have the um, original above, but, but I'm going to work from the translation. Uh, sorry, uh, the page number again, 1513. One, one, uh, and you can see who the shareholders are, if we just scroll that down a bit. Yes, you get that. Uh, and you'll see Mr. Hello or Mr. Hello, I think is the, the, the wording that we have decided to to fix on because it depends on which translation and he is the 51 percent uh, shareholder as you can see the first party shares 51 percent um, uh, and my learned friend places a lot of um, weight on this document because uh, he, he says actually the effect of it is to amend the company's articles of association or, or a contract of incorporation which provides that Mr Hello is the 51 percent shareholder since he's frozen, so I'm just oh. going to pause. Yeah, I'm OK. Very good. It may just be at my end. Um, so if we go down, please, to page 1514, which is the second page, just a few of these provisions I'll show you. Under the definitions, do you see there the definition of the partnership agreement? That is the memorandum of association uh, of Gulf, of Globe Med Gulf. Um, and then we have underneath it, agreement the agreement of the present partners which differs from the partnership agreement of globe med gulf which is executed before the notary public so we say it's clear that this document is not purporting to be the contract of incorporation or the company document for the company that is the contract of incorporation and then if we go down please to page 15 18 1518 just want to show you a couple of other points here. Article 22, validity of articles and paragraphs. I'm afraid everybody has frozen for me at this point. Um, um, You're still good. OK, thank you. I'll keep going. If I'm sure someone will, will poke me if it stops working. Um, and what it says is if any article or clause thereof Become, uh, becomes null because it violates the law, then this agreement shall continue and shall remain effective as if such article or clause does not exist in this agreement. So we say in relation to this, even if my learned friend was correct and the provisions of this agreement that he relies on were somehow unlawful, then the result would simply be that those offending provisions would just be removed. Uh, and now that might not leave much of the agreement. My learned friend is right about everything that he complains about, but that's what the agreement says. We agree this unless it is unlawful. And that is a perfectly permissible arrangement and one which is entirely sensible. Um, so, so what he says is by entering into this agreement, parties agreed to an unlawful arrangement. The response to that is, well, they can't have done so because it says in terms, if anything is unlawful, we don't agree to it. So what the parties are doing is they're incorporating a company. Uh, and they are saying we we will the shares will be held according to this agreement as long as we're allowed to do it that way. And if we're not, we won't. And that we say just it dispenses with the argument about illegality. And then finally, Article 24 uh, of this uh, agreement. This agreement shall not be interpreted or construed to be creating any partnership or joint venture between the two contracting parties, and none of the parties shall have any authority to create or arrange for any obligation against the other party, except for what is set out under this agreement. It's hereby understood and agreed that the first party was appointed as a citizen part partner, as it is required for the incorporation of the company inside the United Arab Emirates by virtue of federal law number eight, 1984, not as an actual partner in the company, based on the same this agreement shall not be considered interpreted or construed in any case whatsoever as an actual contract between the parties so again we say that makes it absolutely clear 
that the intention of this document is not to affect the agreement of incorporation. And as we go through the bundle, we see the agreement of incorporation itself actually uh, is at page 1661, 1661. It comes after in the bundle because it comes later in time. Right. Do we have the wrong page there? I think it starts a little earlier, doesn't it? I don't think of that. Yeah. Agreement of incorporation. <clears throat> Sorry, my, my reference has gone wrong. Sorry. Yeah, that's the franchising agreement. Bear with me, Excellency. I'm sorry, we've got the wrong one. Five, five, one. Sorry, it's one five five one. Thank you very much. Thank you. So this again, we're working from the translation, but you'll see this is the agreement of incorporation, which is the con company document. Um, and uh, we say, you see there the agreement was concluded on the 7th of October 2013, which is the day after the HELU agreement was uh, concluded. And we say that is also uh, a difficulty for my learned friend in his suggestion that somehow the HELU agreement amended or replaced uh, a document which came later than it. Um, we, we say that doesn't make any sense. Now, this document was the one which was notarized and which was registered with the Dubai Economic Department. The HELU agreement was not. And my learned friend says that there's a side letter which was notarized. Um, he says that in his skeleton argument. He, he appears to be wrong about that. That document you will find at page 1697, 1697. My learned friend relies on that document, the, the, the translation is on the previous page, um, as being a side agreement that is particularly important. He says it's notarised. It's not notarised. It may be confusing because there is a translator's stamp in the bottom left corner. If we look at the original, it's 1697. It's not, it's not a notarised document. But it, it certainly wasn't registered with the Dubai Economic Department. And we say that is the end of any arguments about what is the true contractual document, um, because we say, and I'll show you the authorities on this, only notarised and registered documents can amount to agreements of incorporation. So unless it has been notarised and registered, it isn't the company contract. And I'll show you the authorities when we get to the argument on that. Now, in August 2014, the parties began negotiating for the claimant to take over the administration of the defendant's insurance portfolio. So that's the negotiations begin for the TPA agreement in August 2014. And as I've said previously, they were negotiating two distinct documents. The, the, the third party administration agreement, that is the contract between the claimant and the defendant. That is the contract that you are concerned with, the one on which the claimant sues. Um, and the other was a memorandum of understanding, which was between different entities. But starting with the TPA agreement, just to show you where they got to in the end, we go to page 2049. This is the document which was ultimately signed, as you can see, if we scroll down, at the bottom on the 13th of January 2015. So you can see the parties there. That's the claimant, Gulf Globe Med Gulf Healthcare Solutions, and the defendant, uh, OIC. And then there was a quite a separate contract, related, of course, but between different parties altogether. And we'll see that at page 2092.
And you'll see, so that's the memorandum of understanding signed at the same time as the TPA services agreement, obviously related, but you can see there who the parties were between A, Globe Med Limited, and to be clear, that is not the claimant. That is a different entity. B, Karma Holding, uh, a Lebanese company, and C, Synergize Services, which my friend says is a wholly owned subsidiary of the defendant, but is not the defendant. So the so, so clearly that's a related agreement, but it is not between the same parties. Neither the claimant nor the defendant were parties to that document. It is useful because it gives context to the TPA agreement. And it's obviously we accept related to the TPA agreement, but it's not part of the same contract. It's a separate contract. My well, learned what friend. Is, so, 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 yeah. so, what is the relation between the Global Med Limited and the claimant? Are there any? Uh, Globe Med Limited is one of the shareholders in the claimant. I see. Any any percentage or? Uh, it's changed. I, I think it's a hundred percent now. Yeah. Oh, I think, but previously, obviously, Mr. Helu was the fifty-one percent shareholder, and then there was um the the the. Yeah. So. If we go back to at the time, page one five five one. At one five five, where is it? Two. <clears throat> it wasn't. It was Mr. Car. It was Mr. Karma who um, was the direct shareholder. So it wasn't a direct shareholder. I don't think it was a direct shareholder at, at the original time, because if we look on at the company and corporation document, the agreement of incorporation on page 1551, the parties and therefore the shareholders to that are in fact Mr. Helu, Mr. Karma, Mr. Faroon, and Mr. Niznas. So it wasn't a direct shareholder. And the Lord, in, in the preamble, it expressly explains that Mr. Helu owns the 51% and GlobeMed therefore owns effectively 91.05% of the shares in GMGHS. That's that's the preamble. Yeah. Thank you. Well, my, my learned friend has a case that the agreement of incorporation is not the true document. Um, but um, the true document, we say, is and has to be the agreement of incorporation. Uh, and the agreement of incorporation shows who were the shareholders. Um, and they were the ones identified on page 1551. But ultimately, it, it doesn't really matter because your your excellency will know that uh, the, the concepts of corporate personality mean that the, the company is distinct from its shareholders. And so um, it doesn't really matter for these purposes because the TPA agreement is a freestanding contract between the claimant and the defendant. The fact that there is a separate contract at what might be described as a shareholder level, it doesn't affect the binding nature of the TPA agreement itself. It's a separate contract. You've got then uh, a separate uh, ag agreement between the sh at this, what we might describe as the shareholder level. Um, uh, but the defendant would say, well, you have to kind of merge those two together. They are all part of the same, what they call the same transaction, but they aren't because the claimant is not party to the MOU. And that's a point that has already been made by Mr. Justice Field, Sir Richard Field, in uh, proceedings, in these proceedings, but, but in relation to the claim that was brought by Synergize, which is the party to the, to the MOU. You, you have to treat them separately as it's basic principles of commercial law, uh, sorry, um, company law and, and contract law. Um, but in any event, these two documents were signed following a two day negotiation in Beirut. And we say when you look at them, you see as clear as day that the TPA services agreement was concluded on the 13th of January 2015. So if we just go back to the TPA agreement, if we go to page 2049. I'll just show you some of the features of this document. And the first thing is that it says it on its face page 2049, you can see it says, 
TPA services agreement it's at the top, and then it says entered between Globe Med, Gulf he Healthcare Service Solutions, and Oman Insurance Company on the 13th of January 2015. You'll see it's marked final, but it, it, it is on its face saying it was entered into on that date. And then it's been initialed, as you will see on every page. And if we go down to the final page, page 2069, final page of the main contract, there are appendices that come later. You see it's been signed by both parties. Uh, so we say both parties clearly agreed to the terms. That is all that is required for a contract. Now, clause 12.1 is on page 2064. Thank you. And the, you will see there that the start date was left out from that term. Now, the defendant makes great play of that. It was, my own friend says in his skeleton argument, deliberately left out. You will see no trace of that in the documentation. We say quite the opposite. And I'll, I'll show you very briefly what happened after uh, these agreements were signed. We go to page 2114, please. You'll see there was an exchange of correspondence and an email that came that evening uh, from the claimant's side. You'll see there from Miss Patricia Atala, who you will hear from giving evidence later. And she emailed that evening and said, Dear Hajar and Anwar, we missed to complete the starting date in Article 12.1 of the agreement in the signed versions of the TPA agreement. Kindly add these on your copies in the handwriting to read 13 more 2015 as we agreed. Same will be adjusted on our versions. And then if we go down to page 2122, see the response to this. You see the email that we saw was at the bottom of the page and then in the middle of the page, the response to that from Miss Fidel from the defendant's side, you will not be hearing from her. Dear Patricia, considering that we added the Bupa clause with a one month period to get written approval from Bupa, the agreement can only be effective from the date the approval is obtained. And then above that, this was previously discussed and agreed. We will not go back. The agreement takes effect as of signature. The Bupa clause will not affect our mobilization plans. So what is happening? Miss Fidel is saying we had a discussion about Bupa and it was resolved by inserting the Bupa clause. That clause emerges in the in the memorandum of understanding. That is clause 15 of the memorandum of understanding. I'll show you that in due course. What she's not saying is that there was anything conditional about these documents other than that clause. And we'll look at that clause in due course. But the short point on that clause is that it is a clause in the memorandum of understanding. It is not a clause in the TPA services agreement. And then what happens later is that the claimant then sends a copy, scanned copy of the agreement with the date inserted into clause 12.1. And OAC never comes back and says there's any problem with that. And in response to this correspondence, which says we agreed all of this, there's no, nobody ever comes back and suggests that it was wrong. Now, of course, that is now disputed, but you will see no trace of that in the documentation. So we say when you look at the document, when you look at the surrounding documents, it is clear as day that there was a binding agreement here. At this stage, I'll just show you one or two provisions of the two documents, the TPA services agreement and the memorandum of understanding, which are significant and have been the focus of some de debate. So if, if we can start, please, with the TPA agreement and go to page 2067. It's wrong. Bear with me. I've got another fault reference. 
2607. Sorry. 2057, that's the problem. Thank you very much. 2057. And just scroll down, please, to clause 5.1. So you'll, you'll have seen from the written arguments that there is a big issue about whether or not um, Bupa would have consented to the claimant providing services of this sort in relation to Bupa's portfolio, because the defendant reinsured some of its portfolio through Bupa. And you will see repeatedly in my learned friend's submission uh, reference to what he calls the claimant's failure to obtain Bupa approval. But if we look at clause 5.1, we see who was obliged to get Bupa approval. Clause 5.1 says this, it's about the provision of services. S uh, ex exclusivity, 5.1, subject to exceptions, and I'll come back to those, the client shall contract and work exclusively with GlobeMed in all what relates to the third party medical claim administration services as agreed in this agreement, including the portfolio related to Bupa, UA local claims administration only, which is currently being serviced by the client. Accordingly, except as mentioned in Article 5.2 to 5.5 below, the client shall not carry out personally and or through a third party any work or activity related to the services or issue any healthcare program outside the scope of this agreement unless otherwise agreed to in advance and in writing between both parties so the defendant was obliged to use the claimant as the exclusive administrator for all of its portfolio including expressly Bupa. so as i say you'll see in my learned friend's submission this allegation that the claimant failed to obtain Bupa approval but it was obviously and clearly the defendant who was obliged to transfer that Bupa portfolio, come what may. And of course, it was the defendant's relationship. It was for the defendant, and the defendant was the only one who could ensure that Bupa would come across. Now, the, the MOU contained provision about what would happen if, if Bupa did not consent. And we get that at page 2103. And it's clause 15. So this is the Bupa clause that was referred to by Mr. Fidel. And what it says is this MOU is subject to Bupa's written approval to transfer its portfolio, UA local claim related. Such approval shall be obtained by the investment entity within a period of one month from the date of signing this MOU. In the, in, in the event that said approval is not obtained, parties hereby agree that the terms of this MOU and its fee structure shall be entirely discussed and renegotiated. So there was provision in the MOU for renegotiation of the MOU, but that doesn't affect the TPA services agreement. There's nothing in that or nothing that could be in that document which would lead to the TPA services agreement being uh, somehow not binding. The TPA services agreement is between different parties. It's a self-contained contractual agreement between different people. And, it, and we say it was necessary to agree that and to conclude that agreement so the parties could have certainty and then move on to incur the significant expenditure and disruption of the transfer process, the mobilization process for transferring uh, the lives to, to the claimant's administration. Now, if the MOU was renegotiated, there was clearly going to be impetus from both parties at a shareholder level to reach an agreement to preserve what we say was intended to be a very long term arrangement. But of course, in this case, we are valuing the agreement on the basis of its minimum term. And so on the basis of the fees and the terms that were fixed in the TPA services agreement, not in the MOU, in the TPA services agreement in 2015. And the claimant was entitled to something in that renegotiation, at least as profitable 
as was contained in the TPA. So this clause has no impact on the binding nature of the TPA services agreement. So going back to the TPA agreement, if we go to please to page 2057, You'll recall that in relation to the exclusivity of this arrangement, there were some exceptions uh, and those were, you can see that from the first line of 5.1 set out in articles 5.2, 5.3, 5.4 and 5.5. 5.2 is not, as I understand it, relevant. That, car that carves out uh, a particular portfolio, the Dubai Health Authority portfolio, and, and, and there's no issue in relation to that. But there is an issue in relation to clause 5.3. So I'll just show you that briefly. And this is this comes down to this is relevant to the question of of quantum. There was a specific exception here, um, which says notwithstanding anything to the contrary in this agreement, the parties agree that on an exceptional basis, the client shall have the right to contract and work with any other the TPA company to be able to serve its future customers that approach the client after the date of this agreement, who specifically requests services by another TPA company, provided one, the client performs best efforts to place this business with GlobeMed, and two, wherever possible, GlobeMed is given the chance to meet with this customer and present its services prior to placing the business with another TPA. This exception in all cases and at all times is subject to a total number of individuals not exceeding 50,000 members. Um, so there are three conditions for this to become uh, effective to allow the defendant to send business to another TPA. Uh, the conditions were one that they were new customers, so they have to be customers who were not uh, that who have to approach the client after the date of the agreement. Uh, they have to specifically request services of another TPA company. Uh, and then the uh, defendant has to perform best efforts to put the business with GlobeMed, and then and then the claimant has to have a chance to persuade them. So there's a series of conditions. What the defendant's expert does is just to deduct some lives for this. We say that is not a, an appropriate approach to quantification. Uh, the facility was there, but there's no evidence at all that any of those preconditions uh, were or would have been satisfied. And then just sticking with the terms of this agreement, if we go down to clause back to 12.1, just to show you where there is another area of debate, it's on page 2064. There's a difference between the parties about the minimum term of this agreement. And again, this has probably the most significant impact on the quantity. This is one of the legal issues between the parties. And the argument is whether or not the agreement was a minimum term of three years, as my learned friend says, or four years, as we say. Uh, and we say it was it was clearly four years. So you can see that from uh, the agreement at 12.1. This agreement shall begin as of certain date for a period of three years, automatically renewable for a mutually agreed period or periods unless one of the parties notifies the other of its intention not to renew by providing to the other party at least one year prior notarized notice period at the end of each initial or renewed contractual period. And then for the avoidance of doubt, the client shall continue to renew in force business and place a new one with GlobeMed during the one year notice period. So we say it's absolutely clear you have a three year contract period a party can then at the end of that period give notice of one year and then during that notice period the contract continues. So it's three years plus one. Now so my other friend has... Does, does, it mean, does it mean they have to give the notice by end of the second year? No, it says at the end of the contractual period. So it says, in, this is the fourth line, you see, as we're starting at the end of the third line, it says by providing to the other party at least one year prior notarized notice period at the end of each initial or renewed contractual period. 
So you have the three year contractual period, which is defined term at the, at the, in, 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 do you see that? So the starting point of 12.1, this agreement shall run for a period of three years. And that, that's defined as being the capital C, capital P contractual period. And then at the end of each initial or renewed contractual period, there then has to be a one year notice period as a minimum. So we say you, 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 it's clear it's three years and then one year notice. Now, if there was any doubt about this, you can look and see what the parties intended because they've written it down in the MOU. Or rather, their shareholders have written it down in the MOU and they've described the effect of this term. So if we go to page 2098. This is an extract from the MOU, which, as I say, does it, so it's not it's not contractually binding between the claimant and the defendant, but it is a useful tool for interpreting what they're saying. If you see at the foot of that page, little b. Do you see that they refer to the TPA services agreement? Yeah. It, here and after referred to as a cooperation agreement between investment entity and GMGHS based on the following. Number one, investment entity and any of their UA based subsidiaries or sister companies or companies specialized in the insurance sector and in which they have a shareholding management or control interests, including Oman Insurance, shall sign the standard cooperation agreement with GMGHS, that's the claimant, attached herein, Appendix 1, for a first contractual period of three years and, and then over the page, and an additional one year period being the notice period prior to termination. So it's abs abs I mean, it couldn't be clearer. That that is what the TPA agreement was doing. It was three years contractual period and one year notice period, and that's the minimum term of four years. And my learning friend says, no, 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 it's three years. But we say that's just one example of you being told by the defendant that effectively black is white. Um, it, it, it's, 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 it's not a realistic position. Um, now, the, the, the parties then, after this is all agreed, they, they, they start making preparations for the transfer of the defendant's portfolio from the defendant to the claimant. And a lot had to happen before that could start. Um, and the main thing, obviously, was the transfer of the well, well, the lives but to do that you had to transfer a lot of data for those lives uh, across and, and integrate IT systems and various staff were also actually transferred and so there's a number of examples in the bundle we can see them for example at page 3098 You can see there an email from an individual who is moving across from the defendant to the claimant. He's accepted a, 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 a transfer, um, but there are other examples. There's plenty of other examples. There was a there was a they needed to staff the admit the claims administration process for OIC's insurance portfolio, and, and part of to do that was to move people from the defendant to the claimant. Um, the parties then issued a joint press release. If we go to page 3102. We can see what was announced to the market. GlobeMed Gulf Healthcare Solutions signs new agreement with Oman Insurance Company. Uh, and then they talk about uh, in the second line, the addition of a new client. In the fourth line, this agreement will allow both parties to mutually benefit and so forth. And in the second paragraph, we scroll just to zoom in a little bit. We see it says the uh, this the agreement between Globe Med Gulf. Uh, and if we go down to page three one zero five, we see a similar announcement at the foot of the page. Oman Insurance Company and GlobeMed Gulf Healthcare Solutions sign new agreement uh, and that's on the 7th of April 
2015. So they're announcing to the market that they've reached an agreement. One of the things that the defendant also has to do is it has to contact its healthcare providers, people like the hospitals, and change all of its agreements so that they can deal with the claimant who's going to be administering all of the claims. And they do this uh, by sending out a circular to all of their providers. We see that at 3131. You see the email that's sent out. This is by the defendant to all of its providers saying, dear valued provider, we've amended our existing provider agreement that you have with Oman Insurance Company to reflect our cooperation with GlobeMed Gulf Healthcare Solutions as a TPA for the management of our network. Please refer to the subject and the attachment for details. And then if you go down to the next page, please, we see the, att the, the attachment. Uh, so you'll see the heading there, dear value provider, amendment of existing provider agreement with Omar Insurance Company to reflect our cooperation with GlobeMed Gulf Healthcare Solutions as a TPA for the management of our network. With reference to the above subject, Omar Insurance Company has contracted with GlobeMed Gulf Healthcare Solutions, a third party administrator, to manage part of OIC's healthcare insurance portfolio. So the, the, the case you are being asked to accept is that there is no contract. And yet here they are telling all of their healthcare providers that the parties have contracted. And then if you look at the bottom of the page, this is what they're telling their providers. Mm. Sorry, have you scrolled down? I can't see it. That's, thank you. It says GlobeMed will continue through its team of professionals to honour our agreement. That's with with the with the providers, while assisting our insured members. And then on the next page, please, they say, uh, just scrolling down down to kindly note. Thank you. Kindly note that this document will be attached to and considered an integral part of the existing service agreement between OIC and your facility unless a written objection to this document is received from you within seven calendar days from the date of receipt of this letter by your facility. So they actually were amending the contracts with the healthcare providers. And, and yet they're telling you that there was no contractual relationship with the defendant, with the claimant. Now, the other thing that my learned friend says in his skeleton argument, which is just flatly wrong, one of them, he says twice that some of the providers refused to deal with the claimant. So he says providers objected to this because it was the claimant who would be providing TPA services. And he says that's relevant on the issue of quantum. And that I'm afraid is just not accurate at all. We can see what happened with the providers. If we go to page 3620. So this is an email from the defendant to various parties, including to the claimant, but also internally. Uh, and it says GlobeMed project, and it's giving an update on what is this, amongst other things, the status with uh, providers. And you'll see this is now 5th of May. So getting towards the business end, getting close to the time whenever everything was going to be transferred across. And you can see item one is medical network confirmation and configuration. And it says confirmation percentage is around 92%. So that means that the medical healthcare providers, hospitals, uh, clinics within the network of healthcare providers for OIC, around 92% have confirmed expressly that they're happy with this arrangement. And says, however, eight providers are still pending due to finance outstanding issues with OIC and six out of seven providers who refused until price revision is confirmed by OIC. Some of the highlighted providers are major providers and under discussion with Dr. Pata and Dr. Imran to eliminate the risk. So my learned friend is telling you in his skeleton argument that healthcare providers refused to come across on uh, to re refuse to the change in the in these arrangements 
because they were refusing to deal with the claimant. He says that twice. Um, and um, this is in fact the position. The position is, as reported by the defendant at the time, there were a few holdouts. In fact, they were resolved, but, but there were a few holdouts due to financial discussions with OIC. That, we say, gives you a flavour of how the defendant's case is being presented. And in terms of the agreement, um, the, I mean, just to give you a flavour of how unreal this all is, if we go back to the, the page before, do you see page 3619? Hmm. Paragraph 1. Advance on principle, advance of payment. So th this was the claimant saying to the defendant, we want an advance on the first round of fees that we would earn under the TPA agreement. Advance of payment, as discussed, G Gulf, Globemed Gulf, is facing a significant cash requirement in the span of this week due to high expected spending related to ramp up before go live, with a key consideration being the expected spending for the new office rent and fit out costs. You mentioned that in principle there was no objection to advancing the first quarterly payment of fees from OIC to Globemed Gulf before the go live date. Would appreciate your confirmation on when would be the earliest you could arrange this for, arrange for this advance. And the response comes back from the defendant. This is OK in principle. When were you expecting the cash? So <laughs> they're actually agreeing to advance fees under a contract which Mano Francis doesn't exist. And in addition to that, of course, the defendant added the claimant to its license, named it as the third party administrator. Not only that, but during the course of all of this, if we go please to page 2586. So this is an internal document from the defendant, which was sent out in, on the 15th of February 2015. So we're going back a little bit in time. But um, this wasn't sent to uh, the claimant at the time, but it just gives you a flavour. You'll, you'll hear some evidence uh, this week about what the uh, defendant says it thought was happening with the signing of the agreements. But you see also on the 15th of February, they're actually preparing amendments to the agreements. Uh, and obviously one doesn't amend an agreement that isn't, one doesn't formally amend an agreement that isn't yet binding. So we see um, an email from Mr Kishore, who, who was the in the legal department for the defendant. He, he was the subordinate to Mr Al Khatib, who you will hear from later this week um, and, and or next week. And uh, it says, Dear Hajar, as requested, please find attached the required amendment addendum to the Globe Meds MOU and the TPA agreement. Um, and then talks about the clauses that have been amended. And then if you go over the page, please, to 2587, you see that it describes itself in draft, of course, this addendum to the TPA services agreement dated 13 January 2015 is made on and so forth. So they're preparing a formal legal document to amend an agreement, which they now say they never concluded. And again, one just has to consider whether that could possibly make any sense. And if we go down to the next page, please, page 2588, you will see as clause four of that. The partners, do you see that clause four? The partners agree that except for amendments as stated in this addendum, all other terms and conditions of the TPA agreement remains valid and binding on the parties. And their case now is that even at this stage, it never was valid, it never was binding. So we say in this context, the case that this was not a binding agreement is just unrealistic. The, the parties were heading towards a go live date for services to commence on the 24th uh, of May 2015. And, and, and very shortly before that, you have the termination. So that, that, that one of the issues that, that arises in relation to this is, is about Hooper. Um, and rather oddly, although Mr. Al-Khatib says that 
the transfer of people was somehow a condition. That is not the pleaded case. The pleaded case is that the conditions were transfer of shares in the claimant and licenses. And so we'll we'll deal with that. But nevertheless, there is this issue about Bupa. My learned friend says, well, um, uh, they didn't agree because uh, they, they wouldn't agree before Bupa came across, I think. Uh, but he also says it affects quantum because if, if Bupa didn't come across, he says, well, that's most of the uh, most of the portfolio. Now, the, so, so there, there might be a factual issue uh, as to whether or not Bupa would have would, would have consented if the if the defendant had continued with this contract. Um, we say it doesn't matter because you have to value the claim on the basis that they would have been transferred because that's the only way that the defendant could have complied with the contract. You have to value the quantum on the basis that the counterfactual is that the defendant complies with its contractual obligations. But we say anyway, if you get into the factual question about whether people would have transferred, there was no reason to think that they would have refused. And you'll hear evidence about this, but it's mostly speculation. The better evidence we say comes from the documentation. If we go to page 2542, you get a flavour of it, 2542. So this is an email from Ms. Ms. Fadell, who was effectively um, a project managing the transfer, uh, and it's dated the 11th of February 2015. And you'll see the subject is feedback from Bupa. Uh, and she says, dear all, as you're aware, our teams have spent the last three weeks working with Bupa on their due diligence of GlobeMed Gulf. While their overall feedback has been positive, Bupa has not made, not yet made a go, no go decision. Bupa has requested additional time to go into greater depth on the operating model and transition plan. To this end, Bupa is mobilising additional resources from their HQ to work with OIC and GlobeMed Gulf. At this point, we see no need to reopen any discussion of the MOU in terms of Section 15. We'll therefore proceed with the transition of our own portfolio as planned and we'll revert to you when Bupa's final decision is made. So A, they're pretty confident that Bupa is on board. B, we're going forward with the transition. And if we go forward to a little bit later in time, if we go to, please to page 2893, Uh, thank you. And if, if we scroll. 2893. Huh. Right, my, my numbers are out, out by one, which is alarming. But there we are. If we scroll down to please to page 2894. My bundle numbering is different. Um, we will see. There it says, dear Patrick. Uh, so this is an email to Mr. Patrick Choffel, who who is the um, I think the CEO is he the chairman of the defendant the CEO sorry of the defendant, and he's been emailed uh, saying position of uh, as discussed the areas we need to clarify and or elaborate further for the following position of Bupa in using GM Golf Services. Uh, and Ms. Fidel has responded. You can see that from the top. She's inserted the blue text. So if you just scroll up to the top of the page. See my answers below. So we have to go back to see the answers. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, position of Bupa. The first members of Bupa UK will be in place next week to start the second round of discussions. As communicated before, they've not made a decision, and their overall feedback is positive, um, and then so on, and then and then in the middle of that page, do you see it says, "Frankly, frankly, we have no reason to believe that they will not join." Um, and then the final one I want to show you on this is page two nine zero four. I think our numbers are out. Beautiful. It's weird. Yeah, and it, the, this is the right number. Something's gone wrong. Um, if we scroll down to the bottom of that page, please. 
and you'll see an email there, thank you, from, from Bupa. I'll just finish this document and then we need to take a break. Um, at the bottom of this document, we've got an email from Bupa itself. Do you see that? And this is now March the 1st, and it says, Greetings, Dr. Pata. So this is from Bupa to OIC, the defendant. Further to our conversation last week, thank you for updating us about the transition of the provider relationship from OIC to GlobeMed starting 10th of March 2015. For clarity and my understanding, OIC will retain the ownership of the contracts for now, and there's a little bit further. And then the second paragraph, this is all fine and agreeable by Bupa Global. Please arrange for a weekly report to be presented to us so that we can go over the results together and gauge the success of this transition. Um, so my learned friend's case is that the claimant sought but failed to obtain Bupa approval and that it was a long way off. The reality is that it was the defendant's obligation to seek Bupa approval and the defendant was doing that, was seeking Bupa approval and it wasn't a long way off. So again, this just shows you the distance between what you are being told on behalf of the defendants and the reality. Your Excellency, we, we've been going for about an hour and 20 minutes. Um, I'm conscious that the transcribers probably need a break at some point. Would, would now be a convenient moment for that? You were on did mute. They, did they ask for a break? They haven't asked yet, but one would normally give them a break after about an hour and 15 minutes, but I'm happy. I'm happy to do it however you would like. No, no, no. If, if there is a need for that, I mean, I'm, I'm happy. Um, I will still stick with our uh, uh, agreed timetable, right? So, uh, yes. And how long do you need to finish your um, opening? After? I'm probably about halfway through, I would suggest, maybe a little okay. bit less. So, I probably need another hour, hour and a yeah. half. You want to, you want to like a short break, five or 10 minutes maximum? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, we'll break for 10 minutes, let's say, and come back. We'll come back okay, at thank 10 you. 30, sharp 10 Thank 30. you very much. Yes. Thank you, Excellency. Um, all right. So, so um, where do we get up to in the story? Um, we, we, I showed you a document from the second of April, um, and then in his skeleton argument, at paragraph seventeen, my own friend says that um, the launch date was originally set for the first of May, twenty fifteen, which is correct, but then he says it was pushed back as it became clear that the claimant was not ready to go live. So just to just to show you again the distance between the case uh, for the defendant and the, and the facts, um, I show you this document, which is page 2817 of the bundle. And this is an email uh, from Ms. Fidel of the defendant, who's the project manager for the defendant, uh, to various other members of her team within the defendant. And just to show you a few bits of this, she says, while a lot of work is going into this transition, the reality is we are we are behind schedule on too many fronts, and it is imperative that everyone deliver their part in accordance with the project plan. And then just going down to the numbered sub paragraphs, one, even if we agree to push the go live date because we're not ready, this doesn't guarantee that OIC will not pay the TPA fees from the 1st of May. This will be a direct hit to our medical P&L. And we won't be in a position to argue with this if many of the delays are caused by OI, OIC. So again, the, the, the idea that there isn't a binding contract at this point is, is just fanciful. But, but not only that, the idea that the 1st of May is being pushed back because the, defe the, because the claimant wasn't ready is, is just not, not accurate. Um, and then two, our CEO and myself are meeting with the CEO of GlobeMed Limited for a status update. I'd like to avoid the embarrassment of having to explain why we are for failing to progress as per the plan. Not everything can be explained by IT limitations. Three, we are and will continue to be under the scrutiny of Bupa for our own transition. Not only we would need to explain the delays, but it is shameful that we've been pressing them to transition with us when we are not ready ourselves. 
the BIPA leadership has requested that OIC shares the SOPs, that's the service providers and SLAs agreed with GM. It's not acceptable that we are still chasing SOPs at this stage of the project. Now that we've kicked off the scoping pro project for BUPA, it's imperative that we give them the assurance that we're on track for a successful transition. If they have doubts about their readiness, our readiness, they will delay theirs. So, so again, just it's difficult to, difficult to convey the distance between my own friend's case and, and the actual facts on the ground. But then clearly at this Fairly soon after this, something something starts happening behind the scenes at the defendant. We don't have full visibility of it, but if we go to page three four seven seven, we get a glimpse. And we see there an email from Mr. Algarer. Sorry, I've got splits in my bundles, which I don't know where they are. Yeah. So we've got an email there from Mr. Algarer, who I believe is the chairman uh, of OIC, the defendant, emailing Mr. El Khatib, who you will hear from later in the week, next week, saying, please, this is 27th of April, please stop all the processes for GlobeMed partnership, as we will have second detailed review of this partnership. I've also instructed Patrick, that's Mr. Choffel, the CEO, for the same. Also, please confirm where we stand on this. And the answer from Mr. Al Khatib is noted the instructions will advise on the current status by tomorrow. However, only a draft of the transfer of shares is being discussed. So cl clearly something is happening behind the scenes. There's been a detailed review. There's a second detailed review. Not, neither of those has been produced in this case. Um, at, but the but the result is all stop. Don't do anything more for now um, while some sort of review takes place. And then if we go forward to 3665, <laughs> Bupa catches on to this. So you get an email from Bupa to the defendant saying we've recently started hearing rumours about a potential hold or delay to the transition to GlobeMed related to the joining of the new CEO. Can you please clarify this further, its impact on the transition and finally on the mode from this office to another? Plainly that put, put, is the transition to GlobeMed still happening or is that stopped? We spent considerable amount of time and energy working against the deadline advised by OIC. And if this has changed, we would then prioritize other projects to make use of recourses uh, a, a, accordingly. Um, so so Beep has heard a rumor that because of the joining of the new CEO, the transition isn't going to happen. We, we the claimant, aren't told any of this. The, the defendant hasn't actually produced the response to that email. So we don't know what Beep was told in response, but internally, there is some documentation at 3670. You see that there's a, an internal response circulated about this particular email from Bupa. Let's discuss on Sunday how to address this. At PJ, please find out from Sandy Nabil what is the status of their review recommendation. So again, internally at this point, there's clearly some review going on. None of that has been disclosed. Um, and, and so as far as the claimant is concerned, this is still all going on. This is still going to happen. Um, and so there's detailed plans continue. There's project meetings, there's discussions about go live and so on. And then out of the blue on the 21st of May, we get the email at 3766. And this is the cancellation email, the termination email, depending on what you want to call it. 21st of May, three days before we'd agreed to go live. Gentlemen, as you've heard by now, we've received instruction from our board to cancel our joint activities in respect to the joint venture, as well as the TPA service agreement. This has taken us all by surprise, and I would like to extend my deepest gratitude to you and your respective personnel for the time, efforts and dedicated dedication invested by all. The decision is a strategic one which has group implications broader than OIC. Nevertheless, I did appreciate your professionalism, which I feel confident will lead you to the deserved success in the UAE as well. Um, and, and there's a response to that at 3768, comes back from the claimant, effectively saying, 
you, you, you can't just you can't just walk away from this deal. It's a, it's a four year contract. You see that in the first paragraph. Um, and, and there is then a discussion with Mr. Algarer, uh, the chairman of the defendant. Um, and uh, you, you get that at page three, eight, four, nine. And, and so there's some sort of meeting. If we start at the foot of the page of this email, this is sometime later in June. Uh, it's down, down, please, at the foot of, foot of the page, please. Thank you. Uh, and you'll see there an email from Michel Ferron uh, to Mr. Algarer, uh, and it's the final paragraph of this and over the page. The many the main concerns you raised this is following a meeting. Sorry, if you could just start at the foot of the page on 3849, go over in a moment. Thank you. Uh, the main concerns you raised relate to OIC having to maintain a parallel team over a long period and the prohibitive cost in so doing. So that's really what was going on. They'd realized it was going to cost them more than they'd hoped. And you can see at the beginning, at the top of the, the previous page, 3849, this is this is the response from the chairman. Looks like this is all made at board level, so this is really the only insight we have because we haven't got the board minutes, we haven't got the board reports. But what we do have is Mr. Algarea's explanation in the second paragraph here. Making the decision to terminate this arrangement was a difficult one, given the time, efforts, resources and passion both our teams have invested over the last year. We have debated internally at length the possible approaches for OIC to minimise costs and disruptions during the transition period, as well as the implications, financial, legal, moral, etc. this decision would have on both our companies. Uh, and then he refuses to change it. And now I've just lost the judge. Hello again. Welcome back. Yeah, I apologize for that. It's, uh, it's happened in your birthday sometimes, you know, you get a, a good luck. <laughs> it happens <laughs> to us all, I think. Freezing, so. so sorry, I apologize, Mr. Tom, for you wasting oh, your time. Uh, please do. I think we we have to make it for you 30 minutes uh, at the end. So we'll, we'll stay until 4.30 or 5, if you like. Uh, That's great. Thank you very much. I mean, I, I think when we had a discussion in the PTR, my yes. friend was saying he, he needs three hours. Um, and I think that, you know, I, I've, I've broadly budgeted for that, but I just think everybody needs to be able to have the time they need to open. So in, in case you're worried, um, my estimate of the time that I'll need with witnesses is is rather less than I've been provided for in my in, in the timetable. So I, I, we are not going to run out of time. I don't think we're in a hurry. All right, so let's, let's start now. OK. <laughs> um, so where, I, where I was up to was, was I was showing you what were effectively the, the sort of final exchanges um, but between the claimant and the defendant, in this case the defendant's chairman, um, and um, suggesting that you can take it from that, that the real issue here was that the defendant had realised that it was going to cost the defendant more to, com to, to perform its obligations under this contract than it had originally anticipated. Um, and it had decided that costs would be prohibitive and therefore it had pulled out. And that's the real, that's really what's going on here. Um, and, and so everything else that has come after that it is a construct to try to come up with excuses. Um, and the, the, the reality of it is that there is no real defence to this. Um, so that that was my going through of the background. So I was going to move on then to uh, liability and deal with the two main points that are raised against me. Firstly, nullity. Se secondly, the contract. Uh, does it exist? And then come on to show you what the differences are on the quantum um, and, and give you an explanation of what we say about those differences. So starting with nullity then. As I say, the claimant says, sorry, the defendant says the claimant doesn't exist. Uh, and as a result, the contract cannot exist. As I've said, that, that is a very extreme case. And I know it's been changed in open quite quite what the impact of that is, um, is difficult to understand. Um, and I'll take you through it because I think my learned friend accepts now that there is something that exists, uh, albeit he says it's not mm -hmm. something that can pursue its rights. Um, so, I mean, it, it, it may be that his position isn't, for example, that, that I am not instructed, but, but his position seems to be that my client couldn't insist on me performing my obligations. Um, my client 
isn't owed any duties by me that it can that can be enforced, for example. Um, but 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 for example, um, the, the, the claimant has money in bank accounts. So on my learned friends approach, that is not money that the claimant could retrieve because it's not in a position to pursue its own rights. It just doesn't exist to that extent. Um, but but it's not just in relation to the claim. I mean, th th as I say, this is ah, oh, we lost the judge again. I I cannot see you, Your Excellency. Oh, that really? looks fine. That yeah, may be something. Okay. It's a problem for me. I think I just can't see you. So um, yeah, I'll, yeah, you, you can hear my voice, right? I can hear your voice. So I'll I'll yeah. I'll, I'll I'll carry on. Um, but I, I think Your Excellency knows that this is a fairly common arrangement, and I, I know that Your Excellency has dealt with these sorts of cases uh, before in this court. Um, mm. So we say that you know the consequences of this would be much wider. There would be there would be a whole lot of business out there, which at least to some extent just doesn't really exist. Um, and and so what we say is that that is a deeply improbable solution, uh, and so you would really need to be driven. To that conclusion you would need no other uh, way of, of explaining what has happened here um, than, than that and, and in this case we say the case just doesn't it doesn't stack up it doesn't make any sense um, yeah. so, so the, the first question is is there a problem with illegality or voidness as a result of this side agreement the hello agreement and the next question is what's the consequence of that dealing first with the first question now, in relation to that, I'm afraid my learned friend rather <laughs> overstates the position. Do, do you have my learned friend's skeleton argument separately in front of you? Because it would probably be helpful to to refer to it. Um, if not, the page numbering is very large um, because we have to go to bundle J2. But I'll, I'll, yeah, if not, I'll, I'll, I can find it from the e-bundle, yes. It's, uh... I see. All right. Well, I mean, what my learned friend says in, in his skeleton argument, paragraph 53, which is on page 17 of that document. Do you want to pull it up, actually? Okay. It's in J2, I think, but I don't know quite what the page numbers are. Um, J2, yeah. Uh, you're able to find it. 154A51. One five four zero oh, five one. Thank you very much. That's Mr. Oh, Killer. So, very helpful. Yeah. Can Can I have this again? One five. One five four zero oh, five one. I think was the number. I, I will want to show you a couple of things that he says in the skeleton, so I'll, I'll see if I can get those yeah. page numbers. Edward, do you mind just running yeah. through the, um, the, the opening, finding out numbers you can share? Um, paragraph? Paragraph 53. I'm afraid this technology is not really working for me, so I can't actually see anything <laughs> that's being shown on the screen, but I'll do my best. Um, paragraph 53, my little friend, it says it doesn't appear to be seriously in dispute. That Mr. Helu was not a genuine partner in the claimant. I don't mind. Mm. Uh, or, thank you. Or, or, or that Mr. Helu purported to hold his shares on behalf of Global Limited and not for his own account. Um, so, so my learned friend says, well, there's no dispute about that. Of course, there is a dispute about that. Quite obviously, we say that is in dispute. And quite how my learned friend can say it doesn't appear to be in dispute um, is difficult to understand. He does it again later, at par paragraph 56, two pages later, uh, the next, I think it's the next page. Um, he, he, he says, uh, on, on the one hand, you see at paragraph 56, on the one hand, uh, the claimant appears to accept, as it must, that Mr. Helly's shareholding in GMGS, GHS was a sham. Well, of course we don't accept that. It's denied in the defence, and of course we don't. It's absurd to suggest that that's, a, that, that, that's conceded, um, and it isn't. Um, and, and, and while we're at it, um, I know that my own friend feels able to accuse my clients of a crime, uh, which appears in footnote 55 of his skeleton argument. Uh, that, of course, is not accepted either. And quite frankly, we say it's not acceptable to raise a serious allegation uh, of criminality like that in, in, in that way. As, you, as, as everybody knows, it needs to be pleaded like that, and uh, it isn't. But the, 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 what matters in this regard is that Mr. Helu 
was the 51% owner in the shares. And we see that from page 1551 and 15, if we go back to the agreement of incorporation. And this is at, at, the, at the time of the contract, he, he was the 51% owner. Uh, he isn't anymore. He's sadly deceased uh, and his shares passed to his heirs who have subsequently sold those shares um, uh, largely to Global Med Limited now. But at, at incorporation, page 1551, uh, he was. Mm. Not come up. Sorry. We can see it. Yeah, I've now got two screens which don't show what you're looking at, so never mind. Um, uh, so, so, and if we go to page 1552, you can see the shareholder split. So that we say is the company contract. That is the document that was notarised and registered. And so the next question is simply, does the HELU agreement change that arrangement? My learned friend places quite a lot of reliance on what people say about the HELU agreement. But what we say is that the party's statements about the effect of the HELU agreement are neither here nor there. So their description mm. of the impact of that agreement don't matter one jot. What matters is what the, the HELU agreement says. You have to look at that HELU agreement and see whether it does anything to make the arrangement unlawful in the way that my learned friend suggests. And the answer we say is that it doesn't, doesn't purport to, and anyway, it can't. So the, the first point is that um, the, the particular provisions of law that are relied on impose restrictions on what arrangements can be made in the company contract. So it's got to be in the company contract to be unlawful. That is Article 18 of the 1984 law. We find that at bundle K2, so K tab 2. And the page number is 154127. And so what that says is if the company contract excludes a partner from profit or exempts him from loss, the contract shall be null and void. And, and so that is what is, I mean, it's apparently, according to my learned friend, a crime. Um, so you have to construe it by reference to its own words. Uh, and the words say it is the company contract that needs to exclude the partner. So a side agreement, unless it's part of the company contract, could not have that effect. And there's no suggestion that absent the HELU agreement, the agreement of incorporation itself is objectionable. Uh, so there's nothing in, unlawful about having a side agreement which has that effect anyway. So as I said, my learned friend's position is, well, the side agreement, he says, amends or supersedes the company contract. He says that at paragraph 62, of his skeleton argument, which you find at page 154055. Yes. So he's, he says, in short, as the side agreement itself makes plain, it is to be read as amending or superseding the company contract. Um, and the answer to that is that it doesn't. First, it doesn't purport to, and second, it can't. As to the first point, if we go to page 1514, I've shown you this before. <coughs> So we can deal with it briefly. The contract defines itself as being different from the company contract. So, so the company. So I'll say that again because that was enough. I think someone just joined and then un 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 unmuted. So hopefully that's that's solved. I'll say it again. Um, so the point there on page one five one four is that the company contract defines itself. Uh, uh, sorry, the, the HELO agreement defines itself as being different from the company contract. Uh, and then at page 1518, Article 24 makes clear it's not intended to change the company contract. And then you've heard my point, it comes before the company contract is agreed, so it can't amend or replace something which is not yet in existence. So it doesn't purport to. 
The second point is that it can't on its own terms do anything unlawful because of Article 22, which we see on the same page, page 1518. So the parties are quite clearly saying this. They're saying, first, we're going to create a company that, that is not in doubt. We, our intention is to create the claimant uh, and the shares will be held in that um, way uh, according to the law. But second, in the HELLO agreement, we agree to the terms of this document that the, that, that, that the parties will deal with their shares in the way described in this document, but only to the extent that we can do so lawfully. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that. We, we create a company, that's, that's the primary intention, and next we agree to, to deal with the shares. But, but if we can't do it that way lawfully, then we don't do it that way. That's what the contract says. And so if my learned friend was right and the, and the HELU agreement was an unlawful way, proposed an unlawful way to hold those shares, what would be the result? The result would be on its own terms, it just falls away. And that makes sense. Because if doing it that way is unlawful, then you can't do it that way. It doesn't mean that the whole <coughs> company is, is simply blown up. And then the third point on this is that the document is not capable the HELU agreement is not capable of being the company contract. And we see that uh, from a number of, uh, well, from one particular, um, I think it's federal Supreme Court case, which is at tab, starts at tab K, tab 30. But if we go forward, please, to page 155076. And we just got to, there's a little bit to read here. This is obviously a translation. Um, but um, what it says is the above pleading is accepted as Article 8 of the company's law provides. But with the exception of joint venture companies, the company's memorandum of association and any amendment thereto shall be written in Arabic and notarized before the official authority. Otherwise, the memorandum of association or the amendment shall be void. In their dealings with one another, parties may maintain memorandum of association is invalid because it is not in writing and not notarized. Article 10 of the same law provides that the testimony upon disagreement between partners shall not be admitted to prove anything which contravenes or exceeds the terms of the company's memorandum of association. Article 11 of the law provides that with the exception of private unlimited companies, the company's memorandum of association and any amendment thereto shall be registered in the commercial register. The above provisions indicate while in principle it is free to use all means of proof without limitation to a specific evidence exception such events and transactions where the law requires to issue and register the contract and provides for specific forms thereof to be enforceable including some commercial <coughs> companies but the economic interest and transparent transaction therein and the determination of the rights of the partners and third parties dealing with such companies to have a written contract which is called the memorandum of association or articles of association of the company and to be registered in the book of the, of, the co of the competent administrative authorities and the commercial register, so that third parties dealing with the company would be aware of all the activities and transactions of the company, its articles of association, memorandum of association, as well as any amendment of the rights of the partners and their shares, and so on. So, and then, and then if you, at some stage, doesn't need to be now, read to the end of that page and over, down to the end of to the middle of 155078. But the, but the point that you get out of this is that it is only the notarized and registered document which governs the way in which the shares are formally held. And that has to be the case because a company is a thing in REM. So it affects all of the world. So third parties who deal with a company need to know the basis on which it is incorporated. That's why you have to register these these corporate agreements. Um, and they, third parties need to know, amongst other things, that the party they are dealing with exists so that they can arrange their affairs accordingly. Because it, if there's some problem with a side agreement, then the result would be the striking down or some effect on that side agreement. And that may mean that a minority shareholder with one of these arrangements is running a risk, even if there was something wrong with it. But the risk is that the majority shareholder gets more rights in the company, not that the company somehow doesn't exist. And you can you can see just how extreme 
the defendant's case is or was. It's hard to know whether this bit survives. So if we go to paragraph 59.3, which is on page 154054. <coughs> My learned friend says at paragraph 59.3, further pursuant to the various articles of the company's law, any agreement excluding a partner from profit or exempting it from loss renders the company null and void, save where a partner contributes only his work, the profit requirement. So the case, Imagine a situation, you've got a company that's been running for a decade and then one shareholder decides, well, I want to step back from actually being involved in this. According to the defendant, if they arrange their agreement in the wrong terms, if they get that wrong, then the company simply vanishes. On the date of that agreement, that is the effect of my known friend's argument. Now, it, it is true that in a number of extreme cases, the courts have found that companies have been established unlawfully. But even then, the result is not that the company disappears, not even for the limited purposes that my learned friend now complains. The result is that the company is liable to be shut down. Now, my, my learned friend originally said, well, there was no authority to support that. There clearly is, and we produced them. My learned friend now concedes that there is what he what has been referred to as a de facto company, but he says, well, that only exists to satisfy debts, not to enforce its rights. Now, in light of my little friend's concession, I don't need to take you to the first authority that I was going to take you to, but I will take you to two others, three others, which we say show that my little friend is plainly wrong in relation to this. <laughs> it's not limited in that way. The first you'll find in bundle K21, And I, if we could go, please, to page, well, it starts at page 154993. And you'll see it's a decision of, an Ab of the Abu Dhabi Court of Cassation. And if we go down to the second page, page one, ending 994, so it's 154994, you'll see the summary there. And I'll just read some of this, if that's all right. Um, whereas it is conditional for the incorporation of the company, as provided in Article 654 of the Civil Transaction Law and Article 4 of the Commercial Transaction Law, that the partners have the intention to take part in specific activity and each partner participates in it by providing share of money or work and to share the profit and loss. Say the joint ventures, the memorandum of association of the company must be drafted in Arabic in accordance with Articles 8 and 219 of the Commercial Companies Act. In accordance with Article 5 of Law Number 5 of 1975 concerning the Commercial Register, and Article 12 and 255 of the Company's Law, Number 8 of 1984, the limited liability company acquires its legal personality only after being entered into the Commercial Register and publishing its official instrument in the publication issued by the Ministry of Economy and Commerce. And it shall not be sufficient to get its memorandum of association notarised or to register it with the Chamber of Commerce and Industry. If the company is not declared in the above way, it shall remain an idea to form a company unless such idea has been turned into external entity by executing its memorandum of association and exercising its activities with all its consequential rights and obligations. And it turns into actual company and its existence as actual company shall not be affected by not declaring it in accordance with the law. If the company did not take any de declaration procedures and did not exercise any of its businesses, it shall have no factual entity and therefore it cannot be regarded as an actual company. And then this is the important bit. Whereas the company liquidation only means, it's provided for in Article 680 and 682 of the Civil Transaction Law and Article 280 of the Commercial Companies Act, the sale of its assets, collection of its dues, payment of its debts, liability of each partner in pro rata to its shares in the capital and distribution of profit and loss between the partners, according to the percentage agreed in the memorandum or provided for in the law. Um, and, and so the result of being liable for liquidation, which appears to be what my friend now accepts, it is that you, 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 it is an entity capable of getting in its dues, collection of its dues. We see that again in a couple of other authorities, one of which is my own friend's own one. So we have uh, a bundle K12, page 154902. <coughs> Let 
And if we go to page 154903. Um, so, sorry to interrupt. Um, I've got the old numbering before the new authority was added in. So if, if my learning friend could give the name of the case, say DCC 395 of 2002. Yeah, of course. Help me navigate. It's, it's, my, my it's, it should it should be all right. It's it's um three nine five of twenty twenty two, is the one. Uh, is that right? Three nine five of two thousand and two. I do apologise. This is Dubai court decision. Yes. Uh, this is the Dubai Court of Cassation, I believe. Mm. And if we look at the second page, so page 154903 for those who have the right numbering. Mm. Um, it should be coming up on the screen. And you can see from the head notes, paragraph two. If it is adjudged that the company shall be invalidated due to the non registration of the memorandum of incorporation thereof. In order to settle the equities of the partners thereof relating to the business taking place between the re request for invalidity, the memorandum of incorporation conditions shall be effective. So, in other words, when, what do you do with the company between its incorporation, but between its start of business and the date of the request for invalidity? Well, then you treat the memorandum of incorporation between the partners as effective. This means that the company was existing actually between the partners during the period from incorporation thereof to the invalidity request when the legislator considered the company as invalid due to the non registration of the contract thereof. However, the legislator stipulates that the company should have actually undertook some of the business thereof by acquiring rights and being obligated under undertakings in order to consider it as a de facto entity so that the partners can settle the joint transactions. This is in order for the consequences of the business of such company, including profit or loss, not to affect one of the partners only without the others. This results in resorting to the idea of the de facto company. In the event that the implementation of the memorandum of incorporation of a company does not commence before the judgment of the invalidity thereof because of a failure to take the registration procedures and the said company does not practice any of the business thereof, then such shall not be a de facto company. So there's an obligation that it has done some business, but that's not an issue in this case. Um, and then uh, accordingly, it shall not be considered as a de facto corporation in that circumstance. Thus, the justification for the non-application of the retrospective effect of the invalidity is ineffective in such case. Paragraph three, according to Article 680 and 682 of the Civil Transaction Law and Article 280 of the Commercial Companies Law, company liquidation shall mean as follows. The inventory and sale of the assets thereof fulfillment of the rights and debts thereof and allocation of an amount in conformity with the capital share and so on. So in other words, my learned friend says, well, at this stage, the company is not able to enforce any of its rights, but it's quite clear <laughs> that it is because that's what the uh, cases say. Bear with me one moment. Yeah, and so if we go to page 154907 in the body of the judgment, we start, however, both memorandums of incorporation are not publicised according to the law. This is not a subject of dispute between the parties. Thus, the said memorandums of incorporation in accordance with the provisions of paragraph one of Article 8 of the Commercial Companies Law are invalid. The petitioner asked the subject matter court to invalidate the said memorandums towards the respondent for such reasons. It's evident in the report of the expert delegated in the case that the company subject of the said memorandums undertook the business thereof before the invalidity request. Thus, the said invalidity shall not have retrospective effect before the judgment of the invalidity. My learned friend's case turns on it having retrospective effect before the judgment of invalidity, but it, it doesn't. Consequently, joint transactions made proceeding to the invalidity request shall be liquidated in order for the consequences thereof, including profit or loss, not to be enjoyed or incurred by one of the parties only. 
the judgment of the court of first instance supported by the appeal judgment and judged the invalidity of the company subject to this dispute due to the non-registration. And then this results in a de facto company jointly established and so forth. And then it says the previous transactions of the said company proceeding to the request for invalidity thereof shall be subject to liquidation. In, in addition, the said judgment settled the rights of each of the parties towards the other according to the conditions of the memorandum of incorporation. Thus, the said judgments correctly applied the law. And then the final one is uh, my friend's own case on this. Uh, not on this, he, he, he presents the case for a different purpose, but it's bundle K tab 37 and the page number starts on page 155173. There's a Dubai Court of Cassation 882 of 2018. <laughs> those who don't have the um, references. So page 173 is, is the uh, start. But if we go forward, and I don't know if my other friends benefit which number this would lead to, but it's 155184. Right, John, could you, could you get the case, the case name again? If, if we could start with the case name, that would help. I did. Help. It was Dubai Court of Cassation 882 of 2018. Thank you. And it'll be the 11th page of your 11th or 12th page of your report. Yes. So it says, whereas the petitioner contends the challenge judgment by the first point of the fifth ground, asserting that it's been issued in violation and with misapplication of the law, deficiency in reasoning and inference, and it's a contraction, contradiction, I think, with the facts established by the documents. This is why, as it is not replied to its plea of inadmissibility of the counterclaim for being initiated by a person of no capacity based on the adjudication of the nullity of the memorandum of association of the fourth respondent, which abolishes its legal personality. So the argument here is that the court has found that uh, there is that the, the, the memorandum of association is void uh, and therefore there's a nullity problem in the response in the, um, the, the respondent. The respondent has then made a counterclaim and the argument is, well, it can't make a counterclaim because it doesn't exist. So it says, and so the case would have been filed by a void company which no, has no capacity or legal personality, a matter which should have been considered by the challenged judgment. The answer is the foregoing contention is groundless. It's established in the precedence of this court that the non-existence of the substantive elements of the company entails the nullity thereof. And that if it conducts its activities, then it shall be considered existing towards third parties as a de facto company, whereby it shall have in this context a legal personality and financial liability independent from the personality and the liability of the partners therein. And the partners shall be jointly and severally liable for any dispositions made in its name by its director or one of the partners if it has no appointed director, so long as the dispositions are made in the course of the commercial activities. It is also established that whenever the defence of the petitioner as regards the contention has no valid legal ground, the trial court may dismiss it with prejudice. So it has a legal personality and we know that it can be let wound up and the provisions for winding it up uh, are set out in Article 16.3 uh, of the Commercial Companies Law, which is the 2015 version, bundle K6, should be right, page 154616. If you see the same provisions track through into the new law. And Article 16, as you can see, 16.3, in all cases where the invalidity of the company is ruled, the conditions set forth in the memorandum shall apply to the liquidation of the company and the settlement of the rights of the shareholders against each other. The debtors of the company may not request the invalidity or hold thereto in order to be discharged from their debts to the company. So effectively, this is simply codifying the existence of the position as it was previously. Um, and what that involves is getting in the assets of the company and then distributing it uh, to the creditors. And um, the final authority actually that I want to show you on this is uh, one, it's added right at the end of the bundle. It's in L tab 19, so the page number is 156016. And the page that we want to go to 
is it, I think 156019. Because I can't see it, someone will have to tell me whether I've got that wrong. Mm. Uh, and it starts in the in the fourth paragraph down, it is evident. Is that, am I in the right place? Uh, maybe 156017 then. <coughs> Yes, thank you very much. So it's 156017, four paragraphs down. It is evident in the company's agreement for incorporation that the appellant's share is 51%, and it is not legally admissible to prove otherwise unless it's made in writing, since the respondent had solely misappropriated the profits achieved by the company without the other partners. Uh, he would not seek to point a liquidator, and as such, the judgment is defective and must be reversed. The above assertion is irrelevant because it's established per the judicial precedence of this court that it is meant by Article 83 1 of the company that a company of any type whatsoever shall be established only if there were multiple partners in the company. The share capital of the company is controlled by any means by one single person. The company shall be dissolved by force of law on the basis that the company shall be established only if there are multiple partners therein, even if it was a corporation de facto. For a corporation de facto to continue, there shall be at least two partners in the corporation. It is well settled principle that a company will be absolutely invalid if the substantive elements of such a company have not been satisfied. Each interested party, whether a partner or third party, may obtain such invalidity in the court, uh, may rule of such invalidity of its own motion. If the company is held to be invalid by a court, such a company will be dissolved and liquidated. Uh, and then we know what is liquidated uh, is bundle K3, page 154263. 154263, this is the Civil Code, <laughs> Article 680. The liquidator shall undertake all the liquidation tasks, such as making the inventory of the partnership's assets, collect its dues, pay its debts, sell its property to the extent that it be ready for partition. So if you get to it, if you were to decide that the HELU agreement uh, and the effect of it is that the agreement of incorporation is void, uh, it doesn't just disappear. Once the company is declared void, it's only then that the company is wound up. Its existing assets don't magically disappear. Um, and then the third point is that it's not open to the defendant to make that application because Article 16.3 uh, says so in terms. We can go back to it, but it's page 154616. Uh, that's what 16.3, Article 16.3 says. It's not open to the uh, to the debtors. Um, and that's brought through into the 2021 legislation as well. Um, in relation to this discrete point, can the defendant actually make this argument? Uh, the defendant says three things. Firstly, they say what matters is the 1984 legislation. And we say, well, this application is made now. So the question of whether the defendant can make it needs to be decided now, and Article 16 is the legal mechanism which allowed the defendant, uh, and, and then the equivalent in the 2021 legislation, is, is the mechanism which allows the defendant to take the point at all. Um, and the defendant needs a present right to take to take that point. It gets it from, well, it got it from the 2016 legislation, gets it now from the 2021 legislation. So you have to judge by reference to that legislation whether or not it has that right. And so it's the current legislation that matters because that's the procedural mechanism that needs to be invoked by the defendant. Um, the next thing they say is that debtors here doesn't mean debtors. It only means partner debtors or debtors in liquidation. Um, but there's nothing in the legislation to confine it. As you can see, it says in all cases. Uh, and there's no reason to distinguish between debtors in liquidation and debtors more generally. What makes a debtor a debtor is not the liquidation, it's the transaction that preceded it. Um, so, so just the plain meaning of the law is that any debtor cannot make this application. And then the third point they say is, well, they're not debtors because to be a debtor, you need a quantified debt. That's a very English understanding of what amounts to a debt, we say. And if one goes to the uh, civil code, for example, um, bundle K, tab 49, if we go to, say, Article 333, page 155479, uh, you will see there that um, the, the way in which the 
Yes. So you see from the heading discharging the debt of another. And then Article 333 says if a person discharges the obligation of another and throughout that, and it's similar in Article 391, which you find on page 155482. Throughout the word debtor and the word obligor are used interchangeably. Um, so we're not dealing with the sort of strict English meaning of the word debt. Uh, so it's, a, it's about obligations. You can't get out of your obligations um, by uh, invoking you know, the, the, the illegality of a company. Um, and um, my learned friend also makes uh, a, a mixed point about policy and quantum and various other issues. He's, he says that I, I think it's hard to characterize exactly what he's saying now that he's made his concession. But I think what he's saying is that um, if there was a de facto company which could enforce its debts, then that would cut across the policy underlying the need for um, local ownership. But the, the policy is that if there is truly something wrong with the company and corporation such that it's void, then you bring the company to an end and, that, and that's enough. You don't invalidate everything that's already happened. Um, so if, the, if, as is the case, there's been no declaration of nullity up to now, um, you, you just simply go on and evaluate uh, the, the position as if the contract had been performed. Uh, and if the contract had been performed, the claimant would have earned money and would have made profit. Um, and then the, that's the third point. The, the fourth point on this, and two more points on, on this nullity. The fourth point is this is all out of date because there's no ban on foreign ownership now. Uh, and the Hellu agreement died with Mr. Hellu. Um, so e even if there was a problem, there isn't a problem now. So as things stand today, there are no grounds to find that the agreement of incorporation is void and that the company can be struck down. So the application we say is prospective, it has to be based on the position as it stands now. And then the final point that we make on this is that the defendant has known about all of this from the very beginning on their own evidence. So that, that it would be extraordinary, we say, if a party could know every detail about the Hellu agreement, enter into a contract, take on obligations, and then just get out of it at any time they liked, because uh, they on, on, the, on the basis of facts that they knew from the very beginning. So on the defendant's case, it might actually have taken the services. It might have just then refused to pay, and then on the defendant's case, they could have just done it that way. They could have said, "Oh well, give us the give us the services. Now we're not going to pay you. Why not? Because you don't exist." It would be an extraordinary conclusion. My learned friend, as I understand it, was asked about this in the Court of Appeal hearing. You'll be aware that there was an application to amend to introduce this point. It was refused at first instance and succeeded on appeal. And he was asked the question, um, you know, didn't your client know all about this? How can they do this? And his response at that stage was, well, the parties knew about it, all about it. And the parties were keen to get on and correct the situation by having the shares transferred. And so either either what he was saying was he, he he was acknowledging that the problem which he relies on now could be cured and therefore you, you're judging it as today's date and therefore there's no problem as today's date alternatively that just wasn't right um and in fact the position that he is taking uh, is that he is entirely entitled to rely on a defect that the defendant knew about but stored up for a rainy day, this being that rainy day. So um, we say there are multiple answers to this nullity argument. It doesn't work. It would be extraordinary if it was correct. There is no, but fundamentally, there's no unlawfulness in the Hello Agreement in that arrangement. And if there was, it would be the Hello Agreement which fell apart. And even if I'm wrong about all of that, you're still left with a, a legal entity that is entitled to uh, enforce its rights. That's all I was going to say about nullity at this stage. I was going to move on then to talk about the question of the contract, because the next set of arguments that, that we get are about whether or not the contract came into effect. And when you consider this, as I said, you've got to keep in mind a couple of distinctions. First, there's a difference between the contract coming into effect on the one hand and the date when services were going to be commenced. Like any complex contract, 
um, that, that there was a period of preparation or mobilization before actual services could be provided. And before you got to that stage, they needed to sign a contract which gave everybody certainty before they embarked on that expensive process. And you can see what was the purpose of the January meeting where these documents were signed. So if we go to page 1985, please. Sorry, I'm having a little technical problem of my own. Yeah, so if we look at the email at the bottom of this page, you've got an email from the defendant to the claim from Ms. Fadel to Mr. Saliba saying, Dear Patricia Roger, please find attached our comments on the MOU and TPA agreement for your review. We kindly advise on your, your management's availability early January to resolve these face to face. Accordingly, our team will visit you in Beirut to finalise and sign off. Please keep in mind that the earliest we finalise, the earliest we can progress on the operational transition, which is critical in this period of renewals. So, and then you, if we go down to um, page 2047, just get a flavour of what was going on. So you see at the bottom, what happens is on day one of a two day meeting, the details are hammered out. You see at the bottom there, Mr Saliba on, on January the 12th in the evening says attaches the version that we worked on during the meeting of today. That's then forwarded on. And then you see above an internal meeting from the defendant, which says gone through the changes, I'm fine with them. Maybe you can request Hajar to chase up Dr Yasser to provide his confirmation also before this is signed off. So that if he has any concerns on these, he should raise them now. Is there any concerns raised now? Why? Because well, once it's signed, that's it. We're moving on. That's, that's the contract. And then once it is signed, the parties do go on and mobilise, and all the steps that were taken would not have been taken, we say, if there was no contract in force. And you've heard my learned friend effectively um, pins his case to the fact that there was a, a the date was not completed in clause 12.1. Um, but I've shown you the document uh, and taken you to the first page, which says this agreement is entered on. Um, and that sort of language appears throughout the document. So, for example, if we go to page 2051, just a little bit further down. We see the heading. This agreement is entered into, is entered into by and between. It's all in the present tense. Uh, and then at the bottom, now, therefore, following negotiations, both parties agreed to the following. That's all you need for a contract. Agreed. There's a number of other points in relation to that, but there's no reservation in that document. There's no conditionality in that document. Now, when you get down to 12.1, sorry, page number immediately. I mean, there is a factual debate about whether or not that date was the subject of express discussions, um, and you will hear evidence about that. But but ultimately, it's all really by the by, because after the meeting, if you go to page 2124, you can see that when the point was made afterwards, no one came back and said, well, that's not correct. Um, uh, and um, the answer actually that comes back is this is all resolved. All of this question about people was resolved by inserting a clause into the MOU, into the Memorandum of Understanding. And none of that can affect the, the terms of the TPA agreement. Um, I mean, we do say if we need to, that you can conclude an agreement by silence or by conduct. If the if the circumstances demand you to say something, silence is enough. Conduct is sufficient otherwise. So if necessary, we would say that that there was a concluded agreement as a result of that, um, because you know if once somebody says this is a this is a binding deal, that's the point, and then we're going to make uh, mobilisation, and that, that's the point when you have to raise it. But but in fact, all of the steps that were taken just demonstrate that everybody knew uh, that there were um, 
that, that there was an agreement in place. And I've shown you quite a lot of the documentation in relation to this, and we can just skip through it relatively quickly. Um, but on page 2542, you see um, the defendant saying, we don't need to reopen section 15 of the MOU. Why not? Because we anticipate people will come across anyway. And so what you have to resist is the defendant's uh, invitation to try to blend together the terms of the MOU on the one hand and the terms of the TPA agreement on the other. They're entirely separate agreements. And so when my learned friend says, for example, in his skeleton argument at paragraph 25, which you'll find on page 154043, he says that the form and content of both agreements makes clear that they are conditional. We are only concerned with the TPA agreement and there's nothing in that whatsoever to the effect that it's conditional. There are two conditions that are asserted. One was that the shares in the claimant should be transferred to a company called Synergize. So my learned friend says, well, the TPA agreement doesn't, didn't come into effect. It wasn't intended to come into effect uh, mm. until after that happened. Um, but um, there, there are a couple of points on this. It was in fact the defendant who stopped that from happening. That's already been the subject of litigation in this case, it's been decided against my learned friend, uh, and you find that at bundle B, page 98. And it's paragraph 71. And the judgment of Sir Richard Field was in these proceedings, the claimant are OIC and Synergize, which each make separate claims and the defendants are globe led. Synergize claims against GlobeMed and Karma Holding without prejudice to the defendants pleaded in CFI 2017 proceedings. The GlobeMed and Karma Holding have failed to transfer to them 51% of the shares in GMGHS, that's the claimant, in breach of clause three of the MOU, for which they're liable in damages. And then Synergize also claims a declaration. If we go down to page 101, please. Paragraph 81. In my judgment, Synergize's claim is bad in law and therefore has no real prospect of success. This is because it's manifest that Synergize's obligation to purchase the shares for a dollar, Globin's obligation to transfer the shares are mutual obligations. And so Sir Richard Phil's already found that the reason why, that, 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 that there was no breach of contract by the claimant for not transferring these shares. So the defendant is trying to rely on its own failure to do what was what was agreed. So whenever you hear and you or, or you read in my learned friend's submissions that the claimant failed to transfer the shares, he's effectively rerunning a case that he's already lost in these proceedings. But the other point is that under the MOU, the shares were to be transferred within six months. So in other words, by July, middle of July 2015. That is after the date when everybody had agreed that services would go live. So quite how that could be a precondition is not um, easy to understand. The other point is in relation to licenses. And, and again, um, my learned friend says, skeleton, skeleton paragraph 79, which you'll find on page 154059. Talking about licenses, he says this is what needed to happen. First, the share transfer, paragraph 78. Second, GMGS was in fact authorised by both HARD and DHA. And then he says, paragraph 79, it does not appear to be in dispute that in fact neither of these had occurred. Well, in fact, um, what had happened is that the defendant, sorry, the claimant had Dubai licenses throughout. There's an issue about conditionality in relation to one, and we'll get into that if we need to. Um, but my learned friend also says that the reason why uh, the claimant's license was conditional, says it's paragraph 14 on page 154040. 
got the wrong reference there, I'm afraid. But one of the things my learned friend says in his skeleton is that the claimant failed to satisfy certain basic drug safety requirements. That That is simply not correct. There's no evidence for that whatsoever. Um, and it is not correct to say that the claimant ever lacked the, the necessary Dubai license. The position was the claimant had a license throughout that it needed in Dubai. As a result, in the changes in licensing requirements in early 2015, it had to apply for a different, for, a, for it had to go through a different application process. The application was made on time. Uh, and the problem was that the um, portal was not capable of receiving the information from the claimant. As a result, the regulator did not deal with the application until after the expiry of the existing license that the claimant held. And so because it hadn't dealt with it, it, it simply changed, thank you, it simply changed um, the status of the claimant's licensing position to conditional. It wasn't because it failed to meet any requirements, it's because the regulator was not in a position to receive and therefore assess the information that the claimant had, which showed that it was in compliance with everything. And ultimately, the claimant was given a condition, an unconditional license at the earliest possible date. So it is not correct to say that there was any substantive problem with uh, the compliance of, of the claimant. And there is no evidence whatsoever that it that it was. So there was and there was never a moment that it lacked the licenses it needed in Dubai. Now, in relation to Abu Dhabi, as part of the process for getting ready to provide services there, the claimant had to establish a branch in Abu Dhabi and get a license there. But there's no, there's no, there was never any suggestion that was essential for day one. And even if it was, it would only affect the go live date. And as it happened, the license arrived on the 27th of May, three days after the, 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 the go live date, which was a bit under discussion anyway. So there is nothing in these conditions points in any event, or none of that really matters because there is nothing to show or nothing, no suggestion that any of this was conditional or, or on either of uh, those factors. And, and that is really the end of the case on liability. You, you just have the, the defendant at that point flatly refusing to perform for its own commercial reasons. And I don't think there is any dispute that if you find that there is a claimant which can enforce its rights, and if you find that there was a contract, then the result is that the defendant's in breach and is liable to compensate the claimant for the damage that the claimant suffered. Mm. So that is what I was going to say on uh, liability and then a few words, if I may, on quantum. Because there's quite a discussion, it's quite a debate about how you should approach questions of quantum. And our position is that the defendant's case on this is just misconceived. The starting point is Article 389 of the civil code, which you'll find on its page 155480. It's Article 389, and it simply says, if the amount of compensation is not fixed by a provision of law or of the contract, the judge shall assess it in an amount equivalent to the harm in fact suffered at the time of the occurrence thereof. And we know if we go back two pages to page 155478, Article 292, in all cases, the indemnity shall be assessed according to the amount of harm suffered by the victim together with loss of profit, provided that that is a natural result of the harmful act. So it is clear that loss of profits is a head of loss that is recoverable in UA law. What is the argument between the parties on, 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 on the way in which you approach that? So the defendant's position, my own friend's position, is that I have to show that the loss was certain to occur at the date of breach. And he says that that flows from how the UA courts have approached these provisions in their judgments. And we say that's wrong. They're wrong about that. They're wrong about their interpretation of the UA law. That's not what UA law requires. But that, as a starting point, is simply beside the point. Why? Because the, the assessment of damages is a procedural matter. So the substantive law, which is UA law, that identifies the head of damage. What types of loss are recoverable? Is loss of profits recoverable? Well, we see that from the substantive law at ease. You look to UA law for that question. 
it's then a, a matter of procedural law as to how you go about assessing what loss or if any has been suffered. So the distinction is between the assessment on the one hand, but, but on the other hand, the actual identification of the heads of loss. And the, the, the DIFC law on, on this um, follows, well, approach to this is follows the English approach, uh, and it was dealt with relatively recently, looked at relatively recently in a case called Larmag Holdings. If we can go please to um, bundle page 155323, you'll see the case Larmag Holdings, uh, and you'll see it's a decision of uh, Justice Sir Richard Field. And if we go down, please, to page 155356, you'll see the issue that arose in that case. So paragraph 217, Sir Richard says, I deal first with Larmag's claim for multiple damages under Article 40, subsection 2 of the DIFC Remedies Law. As stated above, Larmag submitted that this remedy was a matter of procedure in the same way that the assessment and calculation of damages are procedural. Accordingly, so the submission went, the court was free to make an award under this provision if it was satisfied that Mr. Algebiri's conduct producing actual damages was deliberate and particularly egregious or offensive. So the issue was where, which bucket do you put multiple damages under DIFC law? Is it, does it go to the assessment or is it a separate head of loss? Paragraph 218. Adopting the reasoning of Lord Hoffman in Harding and Whelan's, in my judgment, if the UA causes of action relied on by Larmag for its damages claims are all predicated on the claim of having suffered harm, which can be compensated in damages, Larmag's claim under Article 42 must fail. This is because this is because all elements of a cause of action under the law Kauzai are a matter of substance and cannot be departed from on procedural grounds. Mr. Black cited no jurisprudence, doctrine or scholarly writings to show that Article 293 was not limited to moral damages to compensate for non-material harm, but extended to non-compensatory exemplary or punitive damages. The court is left, therefore, to decide this question as a matter of interpretation. And in my opinion, as I've already said, uh, held earlier in this judgment, Article 293 allows for compensatory moral damages, whereas the claimant has suffered non-material harm, such as emotional upset or distress, and does not allow for non-compensatory, exemplary or punitive damages. Paragraph 2919, I reach the same conclusion if I focus primarily on Article 42 and consider, consider whether that provision is procedural or substantial in nature, and if the latter, whether it is sufficiently analogous to Article 293 for it to be relied on by Larmag. In my opinion, consistently with the decision of the House of Lords in Harling and Whelan's, provisions relating to damages will only be of a procedural nature where they, rely, where they deal with the assessment and quantification of damages. Particular heads or types of damage are generally not procedural, but are matters of substance. And then he decides that Article 42 is therefore not procedural. So rules about the assessment and quantification of damages are procedural. Rules about the types yeah, of damage. Can, sorry, Mr. Tom, just, just to make a much clearer, this is, um, um, a case where the judge was applying the DIFC law remedy. He wasn't applying the UAE law. Yes, Is he was right? applying UA law. So he, he was applying UA law. That was the substantive law in LARMAG. I see. So, I, uh, so what, what was being from, said? From this sorry. Case, from, from, sorry, from this case, we want to establish that you ha we, have to do, uh, we have to distinguish between the assessment and uh, and and. Um, the merits or the subject point, um, as it was mentioned earlier. So this yeah, is so the authority you are relying on, yeah? Yes, correct. So so the distinction you make, so so in, in LARMAG and in our case, substantive law is mm. UA law. And then the question is, how do you approach the assessment of damages? Mm. Is that governed by UA law or is that governed by DIFC law? And the point from this case is that if it is assessment of damages it's DIFC law that's how you approach it just as you apply the rules of evidence just as you apply the, the standard of proof yeah. if it goes to the assessment it's UA law. Yeah. now the, the complexity from this case was because um Mr Black as he was um was uh arguing that the multiple damages that you get in the law of damages and remedies for particularly egregious conducts was a form of assessment. 
But the judge was saying, no, it's not a form of assessment. It's quite it's actually a distinct head of loss. Why? Because the head of loss is compensation, compensation for harm. Whereas <laughs> this is not compensatory. This is something additional. This is not based on your heart, the harm to you. This is actually something you're being given in addition to it's punitive uh, and goes beyond mm. that. And therefore it counts as a different head of loss. It's not about assessing what is the compensation due for actual harm been done. So I cannot come before you and say, mm. well, DIFC law on multiple damages applies because that's what LARMAG says doesn't happen. But what I can do is I can say, my learned friend's arguments about how you approach your assessment of the quantum being based on UA law are irrelevant. It doesn't, you don't, you don't apply that. And that's what um, uh, paragraph 217 to 219 are saying. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so my learned friend tries to um, get around this by what we say is a very tortured formulation of his case because if you go to please page 154064 and look at paragraph 96 this skeleton he accuses me of not understanding the difference between procedural law and substantive mm -hmm. law and he says put another way lost profit is recoverable in this case only if it is in accordance with ua law sufficiently certain and in accordance with dic law proved on the balance of probabilities that is a tortured formulation lost so something is is lost, something is only sufficiently certain uh if well if you're if you're trying to work out whether something is sufficiently certain you're assessing its probability it is by definition if it's certain are you certain something applied that means you're 100 percent probable that it occurred or will occur so it's an assessment of probability. So if I say it's not sufficiently certain, I'm saying the probability of it happening or having happened is not sufficiently established. So assessing the certainty of something is assessing the probability of it happening. And so if, as the defendant concedes, in fact, the standard is the, the normal one, the balance of probabilities, is it more likely than not that it happened or would have happened, then that's the end of it. Um, and, and so, I mean, the way to, 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 to answer the question, using the words of the judgment, the way to answer the question is to ask yourself this. <laughs> is the supposed requirement of certainty, is that about the assessment and quantification of damages? Or is it about identifying heads or types of damage? If it's about the assessment and quantification of damages, it's a matter of procedure and it's DIFC law and it's irrelevant. And we say, when you ask yourself that question, the answer is very clear. It's about the assessment and quantification. The head of loss is the lost profit. Now, my learned friend says, well, this is a new point that I'm raising and I needed to plead it. So he takes a pleading point against me on that. That, we say, is just misconceived. If I'm right, if my argument is right, it's just a feature of DIFC procedural law. We don't, it's just a conventional way of assessing damages. I don't need to plead DIFC procedural law. But in any event, we say UA law doesn't do what my learned friend says it does. Even if you did apply U UA law, um, it, it doesn't it doesn't deal with it um, like that. Um, because what he's trying to do is he's trying to impose an impossible test. Uh, and you know, if you had to be certain about the losses, then you would never award anyone any damages because who knows what, what might happen? There might be another pandemic. There might be a war. Um, and on that approach, the DIFC court would not be fulfilling its function, which is primarily to hold parties to their contracts. And that in, must include um, ensuring parties get full compensation when, they're, when, when parties withdraw from contracts, otherwise it's a toothless jurisdiction. Um, we make a number of points about this. Um, I, I'm given, I don't think I'm gonna go through them in, in, in huge detail. But, but just give you the headlines um, in, in relation to the UA law position, which we say just doesn't apply. You don't get there. But, but if you do get there, um, we say when, when you look at what the court is assessing um, in the UA courts, when they comment on things having to be certain or having to be inevitable, it is about what is certain or inevitable as at the date of assessment, not as at the date of breach. 
And you can see this, for example, in my low friend's skeleton argument, paragraph 85. So if we get up, please, page 154061. Yes. You'll see there he quotes paragraph 85. Sorry, it may be the previous page. Four. Mm. 85. Thank you. Sorry, I can't see what's coming up on the screen because it's not working for me, but there we are. Mm -hmm. uh, so so he, my learned friend relies on provision, this particular case, Union Supreme Court case. Article 389 of the Civil Code shows that the criterion for the entitlement of an aggrieved party to compensation is that the damage should have been suffered as a direct result of the default and that it has already happened or will occur in the future. So when they're using those sorts of phrases, my learned friend says you, you're looking at the data breach. But the point there is that, that can't be right. Because if the damage has already happened at the date of breach, it's irrelevant to the question of loss. So looking at this question, what has already happened or will inevitably happen is, a, is an assessment that is being made by the judge as at the date of the assessment, not, as the de not at the date of breach. That follows logically uh, from my learned friend's own uh, authority, because otherwise there would be no point in talking about damage which had already happened. Now, as it stands now, you can look back to the period when the contract would have run, 2015 to 2019, <clears throat> and you can see, therefore, what loss would have what has been suffered as a result of the defendant's failure to transfer the portfolios across, because we know to the to the number what OIC says its insured lives were during that period. It kept the claims management in house for those lives, so we know what would have been transferred across. To the defendant because it was a to the claimant because it was obliged to transfer everything across and we know what fees would have been earned um mm. and, and so it's the question is you take into account things you know have happened as at the date of assessment and that is the same position as, as it is under difc law and that's the um uh, hexagon authority from sir jeremy cook where he says it's just so well known as to be trite um, and um, I'll give you the reference now. I won't take you to that, but it's uh, bundle K tab 46, page 155428, uh, and it's paragraph 231. So we don't need to go to it right now. Yeah. So that's, yeah. the, that's, the, that's the first point in relation to my learned friend's point on UA law. The second point is that it is only necessary to show that the loss, some loss, was is inevitable, even if you are. In, in, in the business of projecting forwards. The quantification of that loss doesn't ever need to be inevitable or certain. There's nothing in the UA authorities um, to suggest that. And so one of the authorities that we rely on um, relates to a road traffic accident. And the question was whether it was, quote, inevitable that the person, the victim, would need <coughs> medical, would need medical support going forwards. And and the, and then they, they looked at that and they said, well, it's 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 clear enough, but there was never any suggestion that it had to be absolutely to the penny certain what they would have to spend on that medical care. The court just reached an assessment in its own terms. So according to the defendant's approach, the court could say, well, I accept it's established that the claimant has suffered, suffered some loss of profits. But because it's not certain how much they would have suffered, I'm not going to give you anything. That's part, in, in, in effect, of what the uh, defendant is saying. That would be a very strange rule um, and not one that you need to adopt. And in this case, we know that the claimant has suffered a loss of profits. The defendant's own expert accepts that. If we go to bundle E on page 13, Nine nine. Yeah. We see the defendant's expert, Mr. Burroughs, and that's his assessment. Sorry. Bear with me. So that, that is the defendant's expert's assessment of the losses that were suffered by the um, claimant. Now it's less 
than the uh, claimants expert has it. And I'll explain a little bit about the differences. But if you look down the cumulative, do you see the cumulative column there? So he, he expresses his, his totals here in, in dollars rather than dirhams. But do, do you see there, there's a, there's a row that says net loss. And in dollars, the net loss was $2.2 million. So that mm. is his assessment. Now he then cuts that in half because he says, well, the shares in the claimant would have been owned 51% by a company called Synergize, which would have been owned by the defendant. And we say that's legally irrelevant. Um, and that's a short legal issue on which we say the defendant's just plainly wrong. But on any view, even if you apply that percentage, he's accepting that there is a loss. The, the, only, the only argument is how much the loss is. And, and, and what we say, putting all of this UA law argument aside, your job in that assessment, as any job, as the job of the court in any case where you have a, a fairly multifactorial, sometimes slightly complex assessment of loss of profits, is you just need to decide on balance, doing the best you can, what that loss probably was. And that involves looking at the counterfactual. The counterfactual being what would have happened if the defendant had uh, complied with its obligations? And then what did happen, which is that we got nothing. Now, I, I, and, and that's, a, that's a, a, a position that the Court of Appeal in the Amira case have, have, have reaffirmed again. And again, I don't think we need to go to it, but you will find the relevant guidance. We recited, I think, in our skeleton that you'll find it on page uh, it's yeah. tab K, K40, page 155262, paragraphs 119 to 120. And that, that is that is the proper approach. You do the best you can to give full compensation to a party that's been that has suffered um, as a result of the other party's breach of contract. So with the with the time that's left, um, I've probably got another 15, 20 minutes just to go through what we say about the main differences in quantum between the parties. I hope it'll be useful because it'll give some context and help you to understand uh, the differences. I don't know whether now is it a, is a convenient time to have a break. I don't know how long we've been going for. I, we've only got half an hour left, so maybe I should carry on and just finish yeah, then by lunch. Yeah. I'm grateful. All right. Um, so in, in 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 my quantum, there are effectively two chunks, two parts to my claim. Now the first, as I've said, is the revenue which would have been received from the defendant under the TPA services agreement together with other benefits, the volume rebates, which we would have been entitled to as a result uh, of the of that particular agreement of the OIC lives being transferred to the claimant. <clears throat> and the second is the revenue which we could have generated as a result of the claimant's improved position in the market. And I'll explain a little bit about each of those uh, now, just, but just starting with the first, which is the most significant element of the claim. And I think the, the key for your excellency to understand is actually there's not a huge amount of difference between the experts. It, even though they come out of very different numbers, they agree that when it comes to administration fees, which is the vast majority of, of the claim, it, if you, once you have resolved three distinct discrete issues between them, which are really legal issues, they would come out at pretty much the same number. So I mentioned this to you. Uh, if we go to please to page 1399, you've seen, are we on that hopefully? Uh, you've mm -hmm. seen that Mr. Burroughs, if you look at total gross revenues across the top, you'll see Mr. Burroughs comes in at 26 million eight six four thousand seven two six. So that is the amount that the defendant would have had to pay the claimant e e to manage the defendant's portfolio of lives. Um, that comes in at, uh, nine, it's about 99 million dirhams if you convert it. Unfortunately, one expert's used dirhams, one's used dollars. So I'm going to convert it into uh, dirhams. Mr. Cottle's calculation, you can see at page 1396. And the top line, which is the main bit of income, you will see is 180 million 
dirhams. Do you see that administration fee income? He calculates it over a number of years and he gets to 180 million. And that comes in at about 53 and a half million dollars if we're doing it that way. <laughs> now, the, 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 the next bit is volume rebates. Um, and uh, Mr. Burroughs, the defendant's expert, gives nothing for volume rebates. That's a discrete issue. But so I'm just going to focus on the administration fee income to start with. And this really largely comes down to three discrete issues. And subject to those points, both experts would come in at the same administration fees. Um, now, in, in relation to this, my learned friend says in his skeleton argument, um, paragraph 106.2, you can find it on page 154066. <coughs> You can see that paragraph 106.2, he says the second case is a mix of projections. Uh, and when he says the second case, he means the case that I'm actually advancing through my expert witness and the rest of it. He says in that the fees to be charged appear to be based on the projected fees in the appendices to the MOU. So what, what, what he's suggesting is that there's some level of projection in, in my primary case on administration fees that is simply wrong um they're not based on projections in the mou at all they're based on the agreement in the third party uh, administration agreement the tpa agreement you'll find that agreement on page 2080 And you see there the appendix to the TPA agreement, which sets out administrative fee calculations. Those are the calculations that both experts are using to get to the fees, which would have been uh, earned on the number of lives that we now know the defendant had during the period. So there isn't actually the difference there at all. You can take this agreed fee scheme, plug in the known data for the period, and that generates the fee income exactly. And that is why the experts reach agreement subject to these three points, because they're both doing the same thing. And so my learned friend repeatedly says that we base this part of the claim on a fee structure in the MOU. We don't. We base it on the agreed fees in the TPA, Appendix 7, financial terms are agreed. So what are the differences between the experts on this? And there are three. The first is the length of the contract because obviously the longer the contract runs, the more the profit that will be gained. And the claimant's position is that it was four years as a minimum. The defendant says three years. That's a short point of construction. I've shown you what matters in relation to this, but just to get it up again, page 2064 is clause 12.1 of the TPA agreement. We say it's clear. It gives you three year contractual period, then a one year notice period. So it's a four year period in total. That is why we adopt that in our calculations. And as I've said, you can see that's what the parties meant because they say so in the MOU in terms on page 2098. That's in the MOU, it's not in the TPA, but it's helpful to guide you as to what the parties meant. So it is hard really to see where there is room for the defendant to go on. It's a four year contract in total. My learned friend says, oh, well, maybe the MOU means three years because the, the MOU itself is two years in length. And he says, oh, by the way, the projections at the end are only for the first three years. Neither point is at all relevant. The words are obvious and clear. It's four years in total. Um, and and our, our, you know, obviously our position is in reality, once the parties have gone to the trouble and expense of moving the lives across, they would likely have continued with that relationship well beyond. But we limit the claim to something which is conservative at every stage. So we limit ourselves to the minimum four year contract term. That's the first big major point of distinction between the two parties. If it's three years, if it's four years, that affects. So it's not an expert point at all. Um, and the experts, it's clear from the experts how much the difference is that that makes. The, the next point is about Bupa lives. Would Bupa lives have been brought across? Now, the, the profit that the claimant would have earned on these arrangements depended on the number of lives that the claimant was managing. So in short, the more lives that were transferred from the defendant to the claimant, the more the profits that would have been earned. And so a significant proportion of the defendant's lives 
were reinsured by Bupa and required Bupa's consent to transfer them across. So there was a significant chunk of the portfolio that was a Bupa portfolio. But it is nowhere near as significant as my learned friend asserts in his skeleton argument. Um, and, and I mean, just to see what he says here, if you go to page 154038, please. Yes. Uh, and if you look at what he says at paragraph 10.7, do you see there four lines down? He says, OIC, in fact, reinsured a significant portfolio of lines with Bupa. And then he says that portfolio accounted for the vast majority of OIC's healthcare business. In footnote 10, he says, see the report of Mr. Burroughs, table 5047, the non bupa policies are marked as basic and the BUPA <coughs> policies as others. And then he says, generally, there are around four times as many BUPA policies in the three years from 2015 to 2018, the non bupa policies. In 2019, the number of BUPA policies was more than twice as many as non bupa policies. None of that is accurate. That is all entirely wrong. It's just flatly wrong. The numbers are in fact very different. And what it was, was there was about 75,000 people lives and it went up to about 85,000. And the, the, the proportion was something like, in, in the first year about a quarter, went down to about 12% by 2019. It is absolutely not correct to say that the vast majority of the portfolio was Bupa. And we know that because well, the defendant has provided the figures and his and my learned friend's expert has, has crunched them and shown us the numbers. And we can see it from page 1 to 20, please. So what you have here is a schedule which has been either produced by or provided to the defendant's experts and what it does is it shows how many lives were under there were insured by them in each year uh, and you can see uh, the first box is for 2015 to 2016 so do you see the first row there starts 2015 13th of january to 12th of january 2016 and you can see there's a total number of lives identified and in relation to each if you go across to the next column across you'll see they're broken down into three categories Basic, Bupa and others. Basic simply means the basic mandatory health insurance under the mandatory employment schemes. Other is anything else. And the, the answer is that every Bupa contract was an other contract, but not every other contract was a Bupa contract. So you can see what the breakdown is because we've got the numbers. So in the first year, if you go along the to the third, the fourth column. You can see in 2015 to 2016, Bupa showing 74,421 lives out of a total of 282,000. In the next year, 2016 to 2017, you've got 85,000 lives out of a total of 555,000. And in the next year, you've got 82,000 out of 582,000. And then it's 84 out of 688. So it is absolutely not accurate to suggest that the majority of the portfolio was Bupa. So my little friend's just overstating that. Bupa, is, Bupa accounted for 22% in the first year down to 12% in 2019. Um, and, and, and that is clear. So what my little friend's done is if we go to page 1134, please. My Lord, uh, I, I, hesitate, I hesitate to interrupt, but uh, we, we do accept there was a mistake made. Uh, it was a mistake in misreading uh, all Bupa lives or others. Um, uh, yeah. And well, just it, it, it really is necessary to, to continue this line. We, we accept that there was an honest mistake made. We were certainly not seeking to mislead. No, I wasn't right. suggesting it was mis it was an attempt to mislead, but it, 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 it's, it's, an, it's an important error because it, my own friend Lowe... It is, it is, and I'm happy to accept the error. We, we really don't need to. No, I, I understand that, but I'm making my submissions. I'm sure you'll have yeah, a response. Yeah, um, so, so the, the, the point is it's an important error because what it does is it massively overestimates the importance does, of Bupa. Does, does, does that error affect the expert opinion? Oh. No, it doesn't. Okay. It doesn't. But it affects the arguments about certainty because what my learned friend does is he loads a lot onto the certainty point. And so he says, well, it was completely uncertain whether Bupa was going to come across and therefore, uh, and that's the majority of the portfolio, 
most of it is you know is completely uncertain and, and therefore the whole thing is completely uncertain in fact when you look at it the uncertainty <coughs> relates to somewhere between 12 and 22 percent of, of, of oic's uh total portfolio over the years now i wasn't suggesting for a minute that it was an, it was a deliberate attempt to mislead you um and and i don't think anything from my submissions could be taken in that way um it, it, what i'm saying is that it illustrates the way in which the defendants have just loaded on to, to you know inaccuracy on inaccuracy to to result to, to to get you to the position where you say oh it's all it's all completely uncertain whereas it isn't and and the the, the point about um Vupa, we say if there is a factual uh question about whether they would have come across the question is answered in in the positive and i've shown you the documentation where they say where they are clearly agreeing to uh, not formally but they are saying we will you know we 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 we, we, we agree with those arrangements and, and and let's have a bi-weekly meeting to discuss the transition um and then the second point is that they did subsequently use the services of other entities within the globe med group um in in particular in kuwait and you've got uh, sorry kuwait lebanon and saudi arabia and you've got the agreements in the bundles in relation to those and it looks like on the evidence they, they did that on the strength of the due diligence that they'd undertaken for this transition so there was no question that they were content uh, with globe med being the administrator because they used globe med in other uh, or globe parts of the globe med network in in other jurisdictions and i'm not going to take you direct to those contracts but i'll give you the references they are pages 4558 4560 4058 and 3970 mm -hmm. But in any event, none of this really matters for the assessment of damages, we say, because the contract obliged the defendant to bring Bupa across. They were obliged to bring them across. That's clause 5.1 of the agreement, which I showed you, which says in terms, they're not allowed to use any other administrator. They're not allowed to administer claims themselves for any of their portfolio, including in terms, Bupa. So you have to assess the damages on the basis that they would have, what would have happened if the defendant had complied with its obligations. And that is if it had brought Bupa across. And then the third issue, which is actually relatively minor on the numbers, is this issue of 50,000 lives, because there was that exception in the TPA about whether they could use the claim exclusively. But that only arose, as I've mentioned, in very specific factual circumstances. And there's no suggestion, well, there's certainly no evidence that those facts would have occurred. So if you're with me on all three of those points, you may not be, but if you are, then the revenue increases from Mr. Burroughs' 99 million dirhams to Mr. Cottle's 180 million dirhams, and the profit increases too. Now, there, there, there is a bit of debate on some of the other aspects. Um, uh, on the other part of the income, which um, Mr. Cottle puts at 17 million dirhams, so a small proportion, about 10%, of the revenue there's an argument about whether or not any volume rebates would have been earned and if so how much and we will explore that in the expert evidence and then there are also one or two differences on the cost of all of this but again most of that comes down to the number of lives and the period of the contract so once you've settled on that actually the differences between the experts are very minor because the more lives uh, you have, the more staff you need to administer it, and then the more uh, office space, for example, you might require. Um, and uh, there's not really, though, as I say, once you've resolved the question of is Bupa coming across, and have you, once you've resolved the question of is it three or four years, there's not a great deal in it. The most significant is one issue about amortisation, um, and it's a slightly complicated issue about two assets that were held on the books of the claimant company um, uh, effectively what had happened is at some point in the past the claimant had paid for a license fee and also for taking over the offshore company's portfolio you, you may recall i mentioned there's previously been a, a, a healthcare city uh, entity and its portfolio had been transferred so there, there are two costs in the book uh, in, in the dim and distant past where the claimant made these payments and then on an accounting basis what happens is they're written down over a period that's the amortization process and so each year there's a charge in the accounts which um, writes down that that capital expense now mr burroughs says that some part of that uh, needs to be um, in included in the calculation 
of what would have been spent uh, by the claimant if it had continued with this contract. So it's about the cost that would have been incurred. And we'll have to look at that in the evidence, but it really only makes quite a small difference. It makes a difference about 5 million dirhams. And we say, actually, when you look at it, when you look at what he says, he's really making a point about mitigation, which um, which we say isn't isn't actually open to the to the defendant anyway. But we'll, we'll we'll look at that. And then and then the other big part of it is there are one or two other bits, but the other big part of it is, of course, this blanket discount that the defendant applies, because as you've seen, the MOU. The memorandum of understanding anticipated that the shares, 51% of the shares in the claimant would be transferred to a company called Synergize. Uh, and so for some reason, my learned friend says, well, the result of that is you just knock 51% off the claim. Um, we say that's just incoherent. It's, it's totally irrelevant to your assessment of damages. The claimant is the claimant. And so you're assessing the claimant's loss. You don't take into account what it would have done with its money. You don't take into account any dividends that might have been paid out ultimately. Those are just basic principles. Um, if, if you took into account dividends that might be paid by a company, you'd never get to a loss of profit because all profit goes out as dividends. Um, so, so it's just irrelevant. Uh, and uh, there is no legally coherent basis for making that sort of deduction. So if you agree with me on these short legal points, then the OIC part of the lost profit will come in much closer to Mr. Cottle's assessment than to Mr. Burroughs' assessment. And, and, and Mr. Cottle puts that part of the claim at uh, $25.8 million, so 90, about 95 million dirhams. <coughs> and, and we say that is where you will end up, give or take some minor points, if you agree with me on the main substantial issues. Um, you could, of course, decide some of those points different ways. You might be against me on one of those points or another of those points. It should be possible to assess the impact on that of that on the claim. Um, alternatively, it would be a pretty straightforward exercise in providing the experts with your findings and asking them whether they can agree the result of that. All, all routes are open to you, um, but, but obviously the, the aim is to ensure once you've got to this stage that you are assessing full compensation for the breach. The other half of the claim, the other, it's not really half, it's a smaller part. The other part of the claim has been referred to as the non-OIC loss, and that is the subject of more discussion and debate. And you'll hear expert evidence from the industry experts in particular on this. The, 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 the point there, the basis for that claim, is that if the defendant had transferred its insured lives to the claimant, then the claimant would have become at a stroke the third biggest third party administrator in the UAE. And we say it would have been very close, if not indistinguishable from the second, but it would have been third at least on the numbers. And, and we say that um, that would have given it the opportunity to build its business just as it had done in other jurisdictions, and in particular in Kuwait. Um, and and um, the, the, the point there is that the benefits that come from having lives under management allow a third party administrator to give a better offering to insurers and then they're in a much better competitive position to build their business. Now, the logic of that is not really in dispute. Mr Ali, who is the defendants expert, he accepts that logic, he accepts that you get a competitive advantage from having um, the, these sort that you're having a numbers of lives. What he says is that he doesn't think that there would be actually a real chance of the claimant getting more business in the UAE because he says the market was dominated by a small number of third party administrators already. Um, and so he, he actually assesses them as having zero chance of getting anything. Now, we say there plainly was a prospect of obtaining uh, further business. There's definitely scope to disagree about that. Um, but we say the claimant quite clearly would have been better placed to, to, to be competitive. There were clearly opportunities to win business uh, and the claimant or, or related entity had won business in Kuwait using the same model, getting in a strategic partner with a large portfolio <coughs> and then using that market position to leverage into uh, obtaining business from other insurers. That part of the claim we put 
at 31 million dirhams. So um, I don't have the number how, in dollars. How, but... how, how that how that been assessed? How that figure been reached? The 31. So we get there by assessing what what the portfolio could have been that the claimant mm -hmm. would have been able to attract, and we come in at 130,000 lives. We say. Um, <clears throat> Using the information that has been provided by Mr. David Yusuf, who is the expert that is instructed on behalf of the claimant, uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Cottle has taken that information uh, and he's calculated that over time the claimant would have been able to develop a second portfolio of lives uh, of something like 130,000. And then he uses that to calculate the fees and profits that would have been earned from that second portfolio and gets to the 31,000 figure. Um, so the, he does that in a conservative, we say a conservative way, um, because what would normally happen is you then say, well, what happens if you get to that position and the, and the defendant withdraws? Well, then you capitalize that business, 130,000 lives and the income stream associated with it. And then you say, well, how much would we, we have got for selling it at that date? But instead, what the expert does is he just effectively um, tapers down the cash flow. 75% one year, 50 and then 25 to reflect the diminishing influence of the relationship of the defendant after the proper termination in 2019. So actually it's a conservative model for estimating. But the critical part of it is, do you think, and, and you'll hear evidence about it, and you'll, the question you have to ask yourself is, do you think that the claimant would have been assisted by having this portfolio such that it would have been able to develop another portfolio of 130,000 lives by the end, not immediately, but over time by, by, by 2019. That's the that's the test. Now, you, you might agree with the defendant and his and his expert and its expert that the claimant wouldn't have attracted any more business. Now, we say that would be a very extreme. That would be an extreme conclusion. You might take the view that there's some middle way. That the claimant wouldn't have got up to it's in fact 127,000 it might have just only got up to 75,000 uh, and 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 we can um, calculate that if needs be but in reality we we point out that an increase of 127,000 is in fact a relatively modest it reflects about 3% of the market it's, it's quite small um it's in line with what the parties expected um and it represents we say a conservative estimate of this part of the claimant's loss and that is really where what why we say that um, if you're going to give full compensation it's something that you need to uh, take into account we we, we I mean, in short on all of this putting those two together we say there is no doubt there can be no real doubt but there is in fact no doubt that um the claimant has suffered a very substantial loss as a result of this contract being pulled away from them um and we say the defences that the defendant offers on all of this is, is absolutely um, paper thin. And, and um, for, for, for those reasons, we, we we are going to be asking you to make a very substantial award of compensation in relation to this. Um, but but it ought to include uh, a significant sum in relation to what's been called the non-OIC business. Now, of course, that that involves a degree of projection, but projection mm -hmm. is fine on the DIC model. It, it, and you just have to come up with a conclusion. You will have to ask yourself that question. How many more lives would the claimant have attracted as a result of this business model? You may, as I say, conclude zero. You may conclude 130,000. You may conclude something in between. Um, in fact, we, we, we will show you, we hope, um, that 130 is, is a relatively uh, conservative approach to it all. Your Excellency, that is what yeah. I was going to say in opening. Um, uh, I just just really... before we leave that, yeah, before we leave that, for, for, for the second part um, of your claim, um, loss of the future benefit, or the, the, I don't know the way how you're going to um, uh, describe it. Do you have any submission on the UAE law? How does the UAE law, um, or what is the UAE law position for the future loss? Or, um, well, have you made any yeah. link to that? It's not for the future, though, so it's not oh, yeah. for the future. This is this is this is for the period from 20 is still for the period from 2015 to 2019. Yeah, well, I, 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 sorry, I meant by future when you say as you if you if the portfolio was, you know, was bigger yeah. or the position was in number two or number three in the market, 
this is what I meant by the future. Yeah, so, I understand. Uh, um, what, what I say is this. Um, firstly, there's no doubt that as a head of claim, it's recoverable. Loss, loss of profits are recoverable um, as long as they're foreseeable, effectively, as long as they're the mm -hmm. natural consequence. So if on the facts you conclude that had this gone ahead, they would have attracted this portfolio, then as a matter of UA mm -hmm. law, it's recoverable. As to the assessment, I've made all my submissions on that. Mm -hmm. As to how you go about that assessment, um, do you need to show that it's definite or certain? My primary position is you don't. But even if it was UA law position, we say it's from the date of assessment, so it's backward looking. So none of this certainty arises. You, you, the, I, the point that, that the Court of Appeal made in the Amira case is sometimes it's very difficult. Sometimes the judge is faced with a difficult assessment and it's hard. You can never be certain <laughs> about anything. Nothing is certain. Mm. But if you your the role of the court in those situations is to do its best to do its best to assess what would have happened and Come when on. you do that you 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 just have to come up but that's a procedural how you go about that is procedural is all difc law but i, I don't think actually there's a huge difference yeah. um, between the two systems but but sure. the, 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 the only issue really of ua law is whether or not it is uh, uh recoverable uh, and the answer is it's loss of profits it is the other question i have for you um I've seen, of course, in Article 24, I guess, of the MOU, there is kind of um, um, clear um, admission that uh, Mr. Adil Al-Hulu is not actual investor or shareholder, it just is 51% for the purpose of the federal law, right? There's something already acknowledged in the MOU. Uh, I've seen this Article 24 of the MOU, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, did you agree with me on that? Um, well, I, I, understand, of... I understand the point. Um, I think so the, the some question of, some is, of... how, how, does, how does that fact um, change your client position or the defendant position? Yeah, absolutely. I don't think it changes the position, but let's get it up so we can see it. I think it's on page... Uh... Um, if you can share the screen, then it's just... Uh, yeah. I think what you're what you're what you're referring to is is this, but I think my my position in relation to that is this: that the the what matters is what's in the Hello Agreement, because that yeah. is what is effectively being described. The description that the parties give to the legal consequences of that agreement isn't legally relevant. So what, 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 I, what I found that way, maybe I'm, I'm confusing the Article 24. This is in the Al Hello Agreement, or it's in oh, Yeah, so sorry. Yeah, so it's the MOU. Let me just get that. Has anyone got a page number for me? Sorry, just for a moment. Ah, yeah, I've got it. I think it's page 1514. Um, article 24 is on page 1518. Can we share this on the screen, please? Because I just uh, have a problem again to go through. Um, 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 page one five one eight. Yes. So this is which this is the Al Hilo agreement, or this is this is the Hello agreement precisely. This is the Hello agreement. Page fifteen thirteen underneath the table. I think is probably yeah. the wording. Oh, I thought he said Article 24. Yeah, I thought it was Article 24 of the Hello Agreement that the judge was asking me about, which is on page 1518. There's no second paragraph Article 24. Oh. Yeah. So uh, the first party, which is Hello, is just been mentioned as a as a shareholder for fifty one percent just for the purpose of the UE law, so he's not actual. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have the page number that we're looking at now. My learned friend has interrupted to give the wrong It was one five one eight. Was was what I was referring to. Yeah. So we're looking at Article twenty four. Mm. So there is an acknowledgement. Mr. Alhilo is not an actual investor or, or partner. It just, it just like a, um, a shadow 
or, or sleeping partner the way how the UAE sometimes. Yeah. Work. So, right. is there so, any effect to that to your position? Or? Well, the effect of that is it's either lawful for that to happen or it's not. If it's not lawful, if you look up the page to Article 22, the clause is simply struck out. So mm -hmm. it doesn't matter whether you think that would be a lawful arrangement or not, because if it's not lawful, it doesn't exist. It's, there's nothing wrong with no. parties saying we want to hold the shares like this. This is how we're going to agree that they are held. But if that's yeah. not lawful, we, we're not going to do it that way. And that, that's the effect of what's happening here. That's why I say if there is a problem with that arrangement, the effect mm. of it, the consequence of it is that it, it, it leads to this side agreement not having the effect that it would otherwise have. And it leaves the minority shareholder subject to the majority shareholders normal rights. So the risk yeah. comes with the side agreement, not with the company existing. We have all these other technical arguments that this isn't actually part of the agreement of incorporation anyway. And therefore, because you saw the Union Supreme Court case, which said it has to be notarized and registered, and, and, and the policy behind that is that third parties need to know what they're dealing with. And, 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 the, and the consequences otherwise are very extreme, because if it's not registered, nobody else knows about it. So you could end up blowing up a company, making it disintegrate without any third party being aware of it. And even though the consequences are not what my learned friend says, it doesn't just disappear. Mm -hmm. That would still have a very significant and severe effect on contra uh, contracting third parties because this company that they think is perfectly solvent suddenly yeah. get, enters insolvency when they don't know about it. So there, there are a number of different answers to it, but one of them is it on its own terms, this agreement cannot lead to a, an unlawful conclusion because anything that is unlawful just gets deleted. Um, but secondly, it, it's, not the, yeah. it's not the agreement of incorporation. The, the other question I have before we leave, before we break for 1 p.m., um, you know, the debate between the, the contract should be three years or four years. Um, my question is whether in this type of business model, do we have any evidence where this type of business model usually run for three years or four years? Um, um, I'm not to... sure we've got anything expressly in the evidence. I think the person who would know that would be Mr. Saliba. So, Okay, so uh, I have no any further questions. So we'll break now and come back. What two p.m. I, I think I agree. Yes, two p.m. Two p.m. Thank you. Thank right. you. We we'll come back for Mr. Reed or back again to you, yes. Mr. Uh, no, I'm finished. Unless the, unless there's anything that occurs to you over lunch, um, that that was uh, my opening. All uh, right then. Well, yeah. Just everyone uh, assist. Me. Uh, my Lord, just we know. So, Lord, we have any plans that we need to of which we need to take take care. No, no, nothing, nothing from my side. Just wanted to do yeah. a celebration. Yeah. <laughs> appreciate it, appreciate it. We'll, we'll, we'll come back at 2 p.m. Yes. Hello. <clears throat> oh. I cannot hear you. Mm, no. Can you hear me now, Your Excellency? Yeah, yes, now is better. Thank you. <clears throat> my Lord, you, you may feel that you've seen enough of my and Mr. Kellen's skeleton this morning, um, uh, but in any event, uh, the detail of our case is as set out in the skeleton. Um, I will hope to pick up some of the points that are raised in it, but as I say, the skeleton is the primary source of, of what we say by way of opening. Yes. Lord, I'd like to start by making a couple of uh, opening observations. Um, first, as we all know, most commercial disputes arise where there have been unforeseen circumstances or where the drafting of an agreement has gone wrong. We are dealing with a case where the drafting occurred at some speed in Beirut at those meetings in January 2015. And uh, we have to accept in starting this case that the drafting of the, of the agreements is not model drafting. There are, as we've seen even this morning, inconsistencies between, for example, drafting in the TPA as to the term, in the, in the term dealing specifically with the length of the term, as against, for example, 
a provision in the MOU, which we uh, do uh, say are uh, obviously interrelated agreements. This is a this is a case where the agreement the, the agreement was drafted at speed. Uh, there were a number of people involved in the drafting, and so inevitably different individuals were putting different clauses uh, into the two related agreements. The consequence of that is that we must be very careful in considering submissions along the lines of, well, if that had been in the intention, it wouldn't have been drafted that way. The, the, that, that logic uh, does not apply in circumstances where uh, as I say, drafting has happened at speed and where there are obviously issues and problems with the drafting. The second observation I'll have in opening is that the relevant contracts are governed by UA law. UA law is in the jargon of private international law, the lex causae, the law that is supposed to govern this uh, commercial dispute. Now, there can be a tendency in the DIFC board sometimes to assimilate UAE and DIFC or English law. And it's fascinating for all of us commercial lawyers sometimes to identify the common strengths between Arab civil law, UAE law on the one hand, uh, and DIFC codified common law on the other hand. But the reality is they come from very different legal traditions. And that difference is, is most obvious uh, in matters such as corporate nullity, where it is a perfectly uh, ordinary uh, feature of UAE and Arab civil law that there are many circumstances, not only registration or nationality requirements or profit requirements or illegality or falsehoods or inaccuracy uh, in the memorandum of association, there are many circumstances where companies are found to be a nullity. Uh, and, and that can be contrasted with the situation in English common law where there are relatively few circumstances because once a company has been registered, then it is it, it is essentially a company. Um, there are certain situations, very limited situations. So, for example, pre-incorporation, there are rules that apply because the company does not in fact exist. And in those circumstances, third parties dealing with the purported company have certain protections, most obviously in terms of rights against people purporting to represent the company. Um, and, and But it's very limited, whereas as we know in UAE law, uh, the nullity or the voidness of the company uh, is a relatively ordinary event. Uh, even in the common law tradition, if you are concerned as a lawyer that you are taking instructions from a, an agent who has not been validly appointed, a director, a trustee who's not been validly appointed, or someone who lacks capacity, then the ordinary response is simply to take an indemnity from some other party so that you're not, as a lawyer, left high and dry. Um, but they are very different legal traditions and your lordship in my submission should resist the siren calls of my learned friend to proceed on common law assumptions. Now there are three planks as are set out in our skeleton. We say each uh, is sufficient so if we succeed on any one of them then essentially this claim falls to be dismissed. The first of those planks is nullity which I've just been um, discussing referring to it is a man or it was a mandatory requirement uh, of UAE law that the majority uh, ownership be a UAE citizen. And it was similarly uh, a mandatory requirement that the shareholders should be sharing profit and loss. Now, GMGHS was entirely a creature of Globet. It was set up in 2013, long before Amman was on the scene. Uh, it was established with Mr. Hello as the local uh, partner, subject to the side agreement we've seen this morning, and he held those shares for GlobeMed Limited, the parent, uh, with no profit share. He had a, an entitlement essentially to a, uh, to a to a salary of 50,000 uh, dirham a month, a relatively small token amount. Now, it follows from that but when it was established in 2013, subject to the Commercial Companies Law 2014, that the company GH, GM GHS was, was then a nullity. And we say that follows without any declaration or judgment by the courts. Indeed, the JJC, when they were asked to consider this, said that the onshore courts, obviously this company being registered onshore, no jurisdiction. So it would be a slightly odd conclusion uh, if uh, 
that if it was found that an application was required to be made in circumstances where the JJC found that no such application could be made to the courts of the jurisdiction of registration. And that nullity arose under the 1984 statute, and we say it follows from that. This company cannot spring back up. So as and when in, in later statute in 2018 and then subsequently 2021, the nationality requirement was relaxed in those circumstances. You can't resurrect uh, the uh, company that has already been null and void for a, a number of years. So that's the nullity point in very broad outline. In terms of the commencement point, so whether the uh, contract had commenced, we say there are two suspensive conditions. In English terms, they would be conditions precedent. And we say that arises both as a matter of UA law, the law of suspensive conditions as we'll, as we'll see it under, under UA law, but also as a matter of the intention of the parties. Uh, and if just pausing there, if I am going to make a point about construction, I, I would say, and I'll come back to this, that although broadly speaking, both English law and UA law look at construction as a matter of both the text, the words used, and the context, the, the matrix of fact, if you like, there is perhaps uh, a slight leaning in UA law towards intention. Uh, and one sees that, for example, in the references in the uh, Ministry of Justice commentary to words as moulds, sorry, words as moulds of meaning, uh, uh, insofar as they should reflect the party's intentions. Now, if there is no commencement pending the satisfaction of conditions, um, there is a question which my learned friend rightly raises in his skeleton as to whether the obligor is locked in until satisfaction has occurred or until or for, for some fixed periods. So insofar as certain conditions had not been satisfied, was it open to Arman to walk away from the joint venture? Is the obligor in those circumstances locked in? And we say, well, of course, they can be locked in if the contract or if the agreement, such agreements as it has, so provides. Now, here there is no such provision in the agreement that the parties have reached. OIC could decide not to pursue the joint venture. Now, to that extent, the parties took their own risk in deploying resource. Now, there was some attempt, or there is some attempt, uh, particularly in the uh, witness evidence, to construct some sort of oral or written uh, amendment uh, but we say uh, that that is bad on the evidence uh, and insofar as it suggested that there was a, an oral agreement. Um, for example, the, uh, it is said that there was an agreement that the, uh, agree that the arrangement would commence on signature. Uh, that uh, oral or written agreement has not been pleaded, but in any event, we say uh, and we will show that it's bad on the evidence. The third plank, again in very brief outline, is certainty, and we do, as my learned friend intimates, rely on Article 292 and 389 of the Civil Code, and in particular the Ministry of Justice commentary uh, in respect of 389. They do generate a requirement of certainty. Your Lordship will be aware of the, 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 the wording that's used in those provisions, the natija tabeya, the idea that uh, the natural result and that obviously has implications in terms or raises issue in terms of whether it's direct loss or indirect loss, but it also raises questions as to whether the loss is, is certain. In some of the case law, you see the reference to the word inevitable, hatmi, and that's all hatmian, for the most step of hatmian. And that, that is used sometimes in the sense of certainty, sometimes in the sense too of mitigation of loss. So is the loss inevitable? insofar as could the claimant have avoided the loss, but it's used in both senses in, in the authorities. But we say that requirement of certainty is up front and centre as a matter of UA law uh, of damages. We say uh, it, it is very difficult as a matter of UA law to seek to uh, recover uh, entirely hypothetical losses of profit under a contract. 
Of course, there are, there are contractual losses that are certain. The most obvious example is a payment obligation where you're required to pay a certain amount. Now, clearly, if it's a breach of that, then it's entirely certain. There may also be a situation where you have another contract to sell on contractual goods, uh, and therefore the profit is entirely certain because you would have bought at uh, one price and you have sold on at a higher price, and the profit is the, is, is the gap, the difference between those two prices. But in circumstances where you're seeking to speculate that by doing uh, this deal or this joint venture, other players in the market would have uh, ascribed credibility and that you could leverage off that credibility in order to build further business with other clients as yet unidentified, is in our submission just going way beyond what could possibly be said to be certain for the purposes of, of UAE law. Just in terms of Article 15, the BUPA clause in the memorandum, which, we, which we've looked at, uh, on, on one analysis, this creates a, a condition subsequent in that insofar as BUPA's approval is not obtained, uh, uh, the parties are then entitled to or required to renegotiate the fee structure. Now, as a matter of reality and or implication, what is likely then to happen, or what may then happen, is that the agreement falls apart. Now, that operates at two levels. Firstly, uh, you might say that that was condition subsequent. It's not, I would concede, worded as a condition subsequent because a condition subsequent says if an event happens, then the obligation will cease. It doesn't say that in terms. It's not worded as a condition subsequent, but it might uh, that might have been the effect. And that's certainly the way that the parties saw it. And my learned friend took you to some email, an email exchange where it certainly is the, those on the Amman side refer to or seem to consider it as if a condition. So it works at that level in terms of informing how the relevant individual saw the Buper clause. It also works in terms of certainty, because if you were in a world where a hypothetical world where if Bupa do not approve, then the parties can go back and renegotiate the fee structure. It becomes almost impossible to model what the renegotiated fee structure would be and then to predict what the hypothetical damages would be uh, following on from the uh, breach in those circumstances. So the Bupa clause uh, is relevant in terms of informing the party's understandings. It's also relevant, critically relevant, we say, as a matter of uh, certainty and on the point of certainty. Now, I do wish to uh, go back, if I may, to the background facts. We've, we've been through some of this morning, and I, if I can take it uh, more quickly, I, I, I will do so. The UAE investment, or the Oman investment, was going to be through Synergize, the, the entity Synergize. Now, the, the reason for that, and we'll see this on the evidence, is that if Oman was visibly the majority owner of GMGAPS, there was a concern that other insurers would not use GMGS as a TPA because they, a, there would be issues as the confidentiality of their, their information, and B, uh, they would be seen to be uh, directing business towards one of their um, competitors. The consequence of that use of Synergize as the investing entity, the UAE investing entity, was that Synergize uh, is a third party. It is an outsider. It's, it's tempting uh, to try to assimilate Oman and synergize, but as a matter of corporate law, given the formal approach to which my friend adverted, they are separate entities as a matter of UAE law. And to that extent, synergize is treated as an outsider that is dealing with the company, GMGHS, that was a nullity. So in terms of UAE law, where you have a company that is a nullity, there is uh, protection for the third party or the outsider, and that's what undermines quite a lot of what my friend was saying this morning about, well, this would be dreadful, the nullity, if it was real nullity, it would be dreadfully unfair on third party outsiders, because the reality is they have significant protections, outsider protections, both in the liability, particularly in the liability of, of the people purporting to act on behalf or signing on behalf of the company. And uh, there is also protection uh, as between uh, four shareholders, as between themselves. And that protection is largely uh, in the form of a de facto company 
uh, and the null, null company is liquidated on the basis that it is a de facto company and that the memorandum applies, even though the company uh, is a nullity. Um, there is no uh, protection for the company as against third parties. So insofar as a third party has claims uh, and he has debts uh, uh, on, on the part of the company, those claims are not protected as a matter of UAE law, save arguably under Article 16.3 of the 2015 uh, Commercial Companies Law. Uh, and uh, insofar as that applies, and we say that it doesn't apply in our situation because the company has already been null and void and nullity since 2013 and can't spring back up. But it applies uh, in liquidation, and we'll look at 16.3, but it's clearly premised on a liquidation situation to protect creditors between themselves. Um, and again, it's not about protecting the company or allowing the company to defend itself from third party claims. Um, as far as we understand, there's no attempt to suggest that uh, Mr. Helu had any meaningful role. I, 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 some suggestion that uh, no such concession has been made, but there is no evidence that I have seen suggesting that Mr. Heller was doing anything uh, meaningful uh, uh, other than essentially being the, the national partner um, for the purposes of seeking to avoid um, the policy of uh, the nationality requirement and the profit requirement. The, stand, the side agreement in our submission is pretty extraordinary in its uh, statutory context. There is no defence that we thought or we imagined that everyone else was doing this. Um, and uh, in, in our submission, it should have its, the relevant statutory provisions and prohibitions and should have their full statutory consequences. Um, uh, I did briefly uh, make the correction. I want to just clarify again that we do can see that Bupa was not all of the other lives, but it was a significant, or it did represent a significant proportion of the lives insured by Oman. And, and al although the number dipped by 2019 to about 12 percent, at the relevant time, it was around 20, in around 2015, 16, it was around 20 percent. Uh, and a reference to your Lordship's note, which I don't think we need to go to, we, we could just go to, in fact, it's an F2-2922. Uh, yes. Sorry. So this is a, this is an email from um, Kailash Wirlingham at Amman to Ellie Tomi, who's on the operations side at, at GlobeMed. Uh, please find attached projections for the number of lives. The actual number of lives, this is at the relevant time, as at end of Feb was 292,893 for Arman, 65,608 for Bupa, and then projections for May 2015, so lives, 202,000, Bupa lives, 67,000. So that is around the 20% mark. Yeah. So looking at the transaction, which we say is both the MOU and the TPA agreement, we say there's an artificiality in seeking to separate those two agreements. Essentially, it is a form of semi-integration where a party uh, contracts uh, or enters an agreement in respect to services um, in circumstances where at the same time uh, buys an interest or acquires an interest intends to buy an interest in the uh, entity with which it's contracting to provide um, services. The TPA is the agreement uh, by which, under which GMGHS would have provided services to Amman, uh, and the MOU is the agreement by which Synergize would take a 51% share in uh, GMGHS. And my learned friend was right to suggest that one appears to be at the shareholder level. 
uh, whereas one is concerned with the provision of services. There is another distinction which one can observe, which is that the MOU appears to contain setup provisions, so establishing the establishment of the uh, relationship. And then the TPA is seems to be the relationship that going forward, once the entire relationship was established, would then uh, govern the performance of services. And that may be why the BUPA uh, clause uh, is in the MOU rather than the TPA, because it's perceived uh, by those drafting as having been part of the setup of the uh, relationship. So uh, once, uh, if Uber isn't brought on, doesn't approve within a month, then there can be some initial renegotiation of fees, etc. That's not part of the relation going forward. That's part of the initial arrangements, if you like. So that that's possibly another ground on which certain provisions end up in the MOU and certain uh, end up in the TPA agreement. Uh, it, it's right to say that they're made by different parties, but it's equally right to say that they were negotiated together but by the very same teams. They were signed on the same day uh, in Beirut in the offices of Globemed. Now, there are a number of clauses that we really need to look at um, in, some, in some detail. If we could start with the uh, TPA at F1 2058. Yes. So clause five uh, is a, as, as you saw this morning, is a derogation from the exclusivity provision, which allows uh, another TPA to be used in respect of up to 50,000 members. Uh, Malone and Friend referred to a requirement that uh, that they be new customers. That, that isn't what it says. It says the, the other TPA should be uh, to serve future customers. So that would be customers in the future. Um, obviously, there are, number, there are some circumstances in terms of best efforts and in terms of the chance to meet. Uh, and it is said against us, well, though those circumstances haven't arisen. Well, of, of course they haven't arisen because the deal wasn't pursued and therefore you know, there isn't uh, evidence as to um, best efforts and meetings with customers, etc. That we are in those circumstances dealing with a hypothetical. Um, and so uh, there's no requirement that we show uh, an actual uh, circumstances where best efforts were applied and there were meetings with customers, etc. What, what is important about this provision is there is a derogation, an exception to the exclusivity requirement for up to 50,000. So to, to assume that the entire portfolio would have been with, uh, uh, or not, uh, sorry, um, Globed in circumstances where there's express derogation for 50,000 to be with some other TPA is important, uh, both in terms of quantification and of course, in terms of certainty of the damage. Um, then if we could look at Article 12, so if you scroll on to Article 12 in the TPA agreement. And, uh, and as was discussed this morning, there are, there are two critically important points that arise out of these five and seven lines. Firstly, the term is described as being uh, three years, that is the contractual period, automatically renewable for a mutually agreed period or periods, unless one of the party notifies the other of an intention not to review. So the implication of that is that if there is no notification, then it automatically renews. If there is notification, then it comes to an end. But the period is described as being one of three years. This is entirely uh, these sorts of provisions are entirely familiar in leases, and your lordship, I've seen this in other contexts where, uh, for example, a lease falls to be renewed or terminated at the end of a year, it's a periodic tenancy. And if there's a requirement of three years, uh, sorry, three months of notice, then all that's required is that notice has been provided by the end of month nine for termination to occur at the end of month 12. 
So, uh, and there is simply no suggestion in the terms of this agreement, sorry, this provision, this agreement, which is purporting precisely to define the term of this agreement, that the term is for a period of three years, renewable unless notice, but if there is notice, uh, then it is not automatically renewed, and the implication of it's not being automatically renewed is that it ends at the end of the three-year term. Uh, the second uh, feature of this uh, paragraph that's critically important for the court is the uh, absence of any provision as to when the agreement shall begin. Now, you can well understand that because there is, it's anticipated that there's going to be a lengthy period of transition. And you would not want your three years to be uh, reduced significantly by that period of transition. So. What is, uh, what is apparent is that the parties had intended at some later date that they would agree uh, a date of commencement, um, but that this was left uh, blank. It is obviously blank. It stands short, short of being highlighted in yellow. It stands out uh, on this page. We are talking about uh, a relatively short agreement, which was negotiated over uh, two days in Beirut. The idea that all of those uh, individuals uh, negotiating and drafting on the Globe Med side somehow overlooked this gaping blank uh, in the provision dealing with term by a fairly fundamental provision is uh, in our submission um, simply unsustainable. It is clearly on our case been left blank. Now there is some discussion on in, in the following emails as to whether that was an oversight. Uh, the Oman representatives declined to agree. It's simply not fair to say that they, they were silent. They didn't, they made their position clear. Um, uh, uh, ultimately, it was decided um, that they should simply pursue BUPA. In, to the extent that BUPA could be brought on board, uh, any issue as to whether this was an oversight or whether it was intentional uh, could be could be removed, but in, in any event, that will be explored uh, with the witnesses. Uh, so other critical provisions, if we could look at the uh, MOU, which uh, is, if we could go to F1103. Uh, just, just, just to, uh, just to follow. There was no any ter termination notice, or there is. I'm just. Um, uh, no, a... the, no, no. There was no termination provision in the TPA agreements. Yeah. Yes. So, Article 15. This, this, of course, is the, uh, is the, um, the Bupa clause, so called. So this MOU is subject to people's written approvals to transfer its portfolio. Sorry, I'm corrected by my learned friend. It's clause 13 of the TPA, the Lord. We may come back to that. Yeah. But there is, uh, sorry, I, I had understood your Lordship to be referring to termination for convenience, which is sometimes a provision that you see in these agreements, and there is no termination for provision. Uh, sure. for, sorry. Mm -hmm. So in terms of Article 15, uh, the MOU is subject to Bupal's written approval. So it, it, some of the language has a feeling of conditionality about it, but the consequence of non-approval is that the parties hereby agree that the terms of the MOU and its fee structure shall be uh, entirely discussed and renegotiated. So essentially you go back to the drafting board in terms of the drawing board, if you like, in terms of the agreement. In other words, the uh, the entire agreement would it, would in effect, in commercial terms, be up up for grabs. And the economics, and and that we say is because the economics of the agreement would have substantially changed. If you're in a situation where twenty percent of the uh, lives cannot be transferred, if you're in a situation where uh, Armand is essentially required to continue administering uh, twenty percent of its original portfolio and to be paying 
fees in respect of the administration to, to, to GM, GHS. That is an entirely different economic proposition. And that is why uh, Oman insisted on the insertion, the inclusion of the Bupa clause. And that's why it was an integral part of the uh, contractual negotiation. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, to, to that extent, the parties were taking a limited risk because they would be mobilizing, in the learned friend's uh, word, they would be applying resource uh, for a month. Now, what's happened in, in reality was that that month was extended because uh, essentially, you, and your lordship saw the email where Ms. Fadel agreed that uh, they did not, at this point, and those are critical words, at this point, they did not need uh, to have a discussion in respect to the application of, of Article 15. But there was an express, we say at this point, is an express reservation of position that she reserved the rights of the right of Amman to come back uh, and have precisely this renegotiation in terms of the terms of the MOU and of the and the fee structure. So to that extent, the parties were proceeding at their own risk. And we say that is because until the conditions precedent had been satisfied, either party was free to walk away. And that was the risk the party took in applying resource to the process of transfer and transition. Um, we, we do have to look at some of the uh, documents relating to Bupa, and that sadly is because we don't really have any witnesses on either side of this case dealing with uh, the attempts that were made um, to, uh, to get Bupa on board, but significant efforts were made on the part of both parties uh, to secure the approval of Bupa. There were a number of rounds of due diligence, uh, sometimes referred to as a due diligence exercise, sometimes referred to as a scoping exercise. Um, now, initially, the parties were very uh, optimistic. If I could take your logic to F1925. <laughs> yes. This is Miss Fuddell on the 6th of January, so before the trip to, Be to Beirut, which was the 12th and the 13th of January, to Andrew Brody, also in Oman. Andrew, the number one priority is to get written confirmation from Bupa to go ahead with GlobeMed, and should ideally happen early next week as we're about to sign off this deal. The ring fencing is not an issue, essentially two separate teams, etc. The urgent thing to do is to schedule a meeting with Bupa, David, SP, Arthur, Ellie told me to resolve any pending issues. This should happen next Sunday, ideally. So she wants to get it all resolved before the agreement. That was the original plan. You might think she was optimistic uh, in terms of, of thinking that Bupa would uh, sign up um, that quickly um, with that little, uh, that, that amount of judice, but that was the original aspiration of the parties. Um, the first round of due diligence didn't start until the 2nd of February, so a couple of weeks after uh, the MOU and the TPA agreement. And if we could look at F, F12324. Yes. So this is the 2nd of February after a visit, but Mr. Shadi Nawa and Mr. Sana Sawaya are both um, Bupa executives. And she writes, Dear Shadi, on the 2nd of February, Dear Shadi and team, this is to confirm your visit to GlobeMed's offices on Wednesday the 4th, Thursday the 5th, to run a new demo. The Bupa local team will be joined by Bill Hempstead, senior project manager for the UK. Please send the agenda for the visit to GlobeMed and OIC can mobilise team members as needed. Kindly allocate time for a wrap-up session to discuss the demo and other related matters in light of all the documentation shared and exchanges over the last two weeks. So again, Ms Fuddle is speculating, is hoping that at the end of this visit on the 4th and 5th of February, there will be a wrap-up session where all of the evidence, all of the documents, everything exchanged over the previous fortnight can be discussed in a wrap-up session where essentially a decision will be taken 
as to whether Bupa can approve of the proposed uh, of the joint venture. And then if we uh, look at 2326, down a couple of pages. See here, Miss Vandal writing to Ellie Tomey, who is essentially her, op her opposite number in the globe on the globe mid side. Ellie, we're in tune that this is a serious point to resolve and reiterate this is a critical point for Bupa's decision making. I received two written offers from Bupa in addition to Sam's verbal request on Monday. As you can appreciate, Bupa was given only three weeks to revert with their final decision, so she's hoping for a final decision after a relatively small number of weeks which put pressure on us to deliver information in a timely manner. I will try to push the deadline to Thursday next week to give us more time to finalise this point. So there are, there's a point that needs resolving. She's trying to buy a little more time, but, but she is looking for a decision from Bupa within a very short period of time, within another small number of weeks. And again, that, that is very much the optimism with which uh, this, this venture started, the, the belief that Bupa could be could be brought on board, could be uh, could approve within a matter of days uh, or weeks. And in our submission, that is critical to one's understanding <coughs> doing and why the parties are willing to take a risk uh, in in pursuing the trans the transfer the transition in circumstances where the conditions haven't yet, in terms of the share transfer and in terms of the licensing, haven't yet been met. Uh, if I could now go to 2332. Yes. So this is the 3rd of February. So the meetings that were referred to by Ms. Fadl, uh, we see referred to here. Dear Hajar, this is Shadi Nawa from the uh, Bupa side. This is confirmed that Bupa's attendees will have representatives from three units. So th at this stage, Bupa look like they are treating you pretty seriously. They are turning up with a number of people from a number of teams. They've flown in Mr. Hempstead from the UK um, and they, they are looking entirely serious about um, taking a decision. We have, uh, we have, we Bupa have already attended for a demo presentation. So the objectives here are to have site meetings with the teams performing these functions and to review the end to end process. Uh, so that, that is, so they, they are clearly Bupa is clearly engaging resource. They are being pushed to some extent by Ms. Fadl uh, on behalf of Omar. Um, and <clears throat> now look at 2350. We see here a task sheet uh, for those two meetings, Wednesday the 4th, Thursday the 5th of February. And you see there uh, the, in the various columns on the right hand side of the page uh, who is attending each bit of the meetings. Uh, so there is a Bupa representatives column. There's a GlobeMed, sorry, thank you. There's a GlobeMed representatives column. The GlobeMed were playing a fairly peripheral part. Most of what was being done was being done by Oman. And you see the final column there, the Oman representatives. So Dr. Khalifa, who's fairly senior at that point within in the Amman team, Dr. Partha, um, I think Senior Vice President Medical and a number of other individuals uh, acting on the uh, on the Amman side. And you can see the extent of the discussions that are being pursued between Bupa and Amman. So Amman is doing everything it can to uh, include in this task sheet everything that is going to need to be discussed is discussing it with Bupa precisely with a view to getting to that approval decision as soon as possible, as we've seen uh, in Ms. Fadl's emails. And if we scroll down, you can see there uh, Thursday, the, uh, the left, sorry, left-hand column, Thursday, the 5th of February, and it relaxed to casual dress by, by the second day. Um, but clearly there's a very substantial amount of um, business being done in terms of discussing everything they can to try and get this approval uh, over the line. And, and then if, if I can jump on to uh, F1 uh, 9.30. Yes. Sorry, it's not on, but if I can jump to page 9.30. Sorry, I've got a page. Uh, sorry, 2.357, I'm sorry. Yes. 
so that's this meeting, and this is a, a, an email from Shadi Nawa to Andrew Brody of Oman. Um, if I can jump straight to the second paragraph regarding the contract, I believe you may, might sign two contracts. One is the partnership agreement, the other is the administration or the TPA agreement. I understand that the partnership agreement includes sensitive commercial information, which is confidential, you can't share. For this one, I'm checking our legal director to understand if any specific areas BUPO would like, like to review and will not consider um, breach of confidentiality of OIC and GlobeMed partnership. The administration or TPA agreement at OIC and GlobeMed, this will provide the required level of detail of all the operational stand, uh, standard service level of agreement, which, which under discussion currently with GlobeMed and OIC being OIC partner. I would appreciate if BUPA has the opportunity to be part of the revision process for the entire administration agreement. This will be great level of insurance. Um, this really is the first sort of indication that actually BUPA are, um, are, are not about to give uh, their approval immediately or anytime soon, not least because they seem to be contemplating a process by which the TPA agreement is going to be revised. And they want TPA, they want BUPA to be part of that uh, process of revising the uh, TPA agreement. So they clearly believe it to be something that is susceptible to ongoing uh, amendment uh, and revision and, and negotiation, and they are clearly not in a position at this point to be proceeding uh, to a to, to, to a final approval. Um, and then if I could go to 2542. Yes. So this is towards the end of what I'm going to call the first round of due diligence. Ms. Fadl on the 11th of February took to Munir Khama, the one of the directors and shareholders in um, Beirut of GlobeMed and others. And uh, she is saying, as you're aware, our teams have spent the last three weeks working with Bupa on their due diligence of GlobeMed Gulf. While their overall feedback has been positive, Bupa has not yet made a no go no decision. Bupa has requested additional times to go into greater depths on the operating model transition plan. So this is this is where the problem is that Bupa are now looking to probe the entire operating model and not only that, but also the plan by which transition is to happen. To this end, Bupa is mobilizing additional resources from their HQ to work with OIC and GlobeMed uh, Gulf. And what then gradually happens over the following months is that the Bupa's position emerges to be one where they will, uh, will essentially watch the transition of OIC um, members to GlobeMed and then take a view, having seen how that tr transition went. And that's why one sees the Bupa uh, date essentially being pushed back um, from 2015 into 2016. And then the, the passage which I had a friend took you this morning, at this point, and those are critical words in terms of reserving uh, Oman's position, we see no need to reopen any discussion on the MOU in terms of section 15. So insofar as we have contractual right, we need to go back, revisit and renegotiate the fees. Uh, at the moment, we will not exercise that right. So it's, it is not being exercised, but it's being expressly reserved. We will therefore proceed with the transition of our own portfolio as planned and will revert to you when Bupa's final decision is known. So essentially at this point they switch to a two-track uh, transfer. So they essentially they're proceeding with the transfer of the uh, non-Bupa lives on the basis that, that they will um, revert in respect of the Bupa lives as and when Bupa reach a final decision as to their approval. Um, the second round of due diligence uh, then occurs in late February, and if we could stay within F1 and turn to uh, 2613. Yeah. So you have that. Yes. Uh, and if we look at the email from Mr. Summer Sawaya of uh, Bupa halfway down the page. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Partha, picking up the second paragraph. Um, I, in light of the due diligence on OIC GlobeMed, not yet a decision stage from Bupa's side, and my worry that it may take some time to get to it, I would like us to continue the discussion around the pre-authorization ring fencing. And I should say there was a suggestion that GlobeMed would have different teams to, to 
to give pre-authorization decisions of, of medical expenditure. So a different team for bupa as opposed to another team for non-bupa claims. So that's that's the ring fencing issue. This can then transition to GlobeMed once bupa reaches a decision. Please let me know. So essentially, accept the, uh, recognizing that there may be a two-track um, solution. Please let me know if tomorrow is a good day for you to kickstart this again. So efforts being made on behalf of bupa to kickstart the whole process of, of due diligence. So a recognition that from their end, um, things have gone quiet. And that's what essentially that heralds the beginning of the second round of due diligence, which we see uh, towards in the end of February. And the economics, if you like, are, are somewhat explained in a further email, switching to uh, also bundle F, but at page uh, 2893. Mm. Yes. yes. Sorry. Um, and we see here, um, this is Luciana Taif and uh, Melania French uh, looked at this briefly uh, this morning. This is Hajar filling in the blue of the questions that have been asked, asked by Mr. Le, Le Taif. I should just say, uh, my understanding is that Mr. Le Taif is a, is a former director of GlobeMed uh, who was close to Mr. Schoffel and who is sort of some, to some extent acting on behalf of GlobeMed. But he writes to um, Mr. Schoffel, the CEO of Amar. Uh, and then, uh, so he explains um, in the first paragraph about their failure, or the fact that Buber have not made a decision on their, over, their overall uh, feedback is positive. And of course, th this is this is uh, Miss Fuddle's <laughs> line. She is, I should say, uh, on the Arman side, a strong enthusiast who is working very hard to drive this um, forward. Uh, they have requested to work with uh, OIC GM in greater detail on the operating model of GM Gulf. And then she says, frankly, we have no reason to believe they will not join. The delay is more to give them the assurances they need on the points they have raised. So she is essentially trying to reassure GlobeMed that everything is still on track uh, and that they're doing everything they can to secure the GlobeMed the Globe agreement. And then two, the starting date issue. Um, now, interesting because starting date, we would say, is precisely the commencement date that we saw in Clause 12. When does the three-year contractual term start? Uh, and clearly, uh, Ms. Fadel is uh, interprets that as when is the go live date so when when will we be uh, when will we have moved the lives to uh, globemed and we say it's a condition of that that globemed has transferred the shares in globemed have been transferred and that globemed is licensed to carry out the relevant tpa services uh, and then looking down at c over page 2894 yes Austin the delay of UFA has no financial impact on GM Gulf over 12 months. So GlobeMed, it's not going to cost them anything if there's a delay. GlobeMed Gulf will require less headcount to scale up its operation, UFA portfolio transferred at a later date, while they receive the same TPA fees of 33 million dirham we agreed on, and which was taking into account GM Gulf handling both OIC and UFA portfolio. So GlobeMed will be getting the same fees as if they were administering both the OIC and the Bupa portfolios. In the reality, in reality, Bupa will still be being administered uh, by uh, uh, Amman, OIC. And on the opposite, this increases runoff costs for OIC, as we need to maintain staff and systems for a longer period to serve the runoff of Bupa. So the learning friend is right to say that the reason this venture becomes increasingly less commercial. And the reason why it, it becomes obvious to Armand that they have to exercise their right to walk away is because they are being put by Bupa in a position where they are required to pay on the existing fee structure, uh, TPA fees for the whole portfolio. 
whereas, whereas they are required, they're, they're effectively uh, to uh, administration because the, the OIC lives, they are administering, but the, uh, sorry, the, the OIC lives will have been, will be administered by GlobeMed, but the Bupa lives, they will have to continue administering. So it becomes increasingly, as that delay uh, uh, increases, it becomes increasingly clear that the <laughs> model of venture is simply uh, uneconomic, and, and that is when and why they they uh, exercise their right uh, to walk away in circumstances where there is nothing that locks them in to the transaction uh, until unless and until the two conditions uh, have been satisfied. Uh, the third round of due diligence uh, is in late March, and, and this is really the period where the wheels come off the carriage. Uh, if we could go, my lord, to 2957. 2957. See this in real time with. Yep. Yes. So this is Miss Fuddle to Mr. Khalifa. And you'll see looking down the page uh, that he is uh, the head of medical underwriting. He's fairly senior within uh, Amman. And he asks halfway down the page, any update on Bupa's decision? Um, and then uh, at the top, the top email in this chain, Miss Fuddle to uh, Mr. Khalifa in reply, um, uh, I met uh, the son of the Bupa UK team who will be involved in the evaluation project of Globe. So at this stage, we've got an almost a new start in terms of a new evaluation uh, uh, project. Um, and then if we go on to uh, Three one three eight. <clears throat> so this is so the, the new process, the third round started in late March. By April, by the nineteenth of April, we have Mr. Nawa writing to Dr. Panda, Ipatha. Based on the trackers figures and with the following percentage, we have 22% confirmation in hospital and clinics network, 11% confirmation in the pharmacy network. And your Lordship will remember, your Excellency will remember, mm -hmm. that uh, essentially the letter was sent to the providers on the basis that uh, silence would be confirmation, but they were also invited to confirm. And, and what is being uh, uh, explained here is that only 22% confirmation has been achieved in respect of hospitals and clinics and 11% confirmation in respect of pharmacies. And he goes on to say, however, I understand the providers transition process enclosed a huge effort and extensive work. Uh, but the current level of acceptance in the network providers is raising a red flag and com compose, I think it means poses a high risk over the level of network coverage and, and service continuity provided to our members. The, the point there is that if you're Bupa, you are high-end uh, insurer, your high-end customers want to feel that they're able to go to the, to the high-end hospitals uh, when they need their medical treatment. And if they can't, and if they don't feel they're getting continuity in terms of their medical treatment, um, then they are going to be unhappy, and that is going to be a problem for Bupa. So that's, that's the red flag essentially that he is uh, raising this uh, relatively uh, uh, late stage. Uh, and now if we could go to 3210. Sorry, I'm going back and I apologize for um, uh, messing with the chronology. So this is again, this is late, late March. Um, Bupa has finally mobilised a project. So this is a report, Miss Fadel re reporting internally within Arman. Bupa has finally mobilised a project team to scope their potential transition <laughs> to GlobeMed. This project will be, uh, and just pausing there, and clearly the, the, the insertion of the word potential transition is raising a red flag even internally. 
This project will kick off on April 1st and last for four weeks, during which beautiful members from the head office in the UK and UAE will work with OIC and Globebed to scope their needs. The objective is to give people the assurances they need on the various points they raise during their due diligence, as well as to engage them in defining the operating model of their portfolio. For this project, we will be running multiple workshops to cover the various functional areas of the target operating model. Next paragraph. Uh, each uh, week, the project teams will regroup for an update and address any issues. At the end of this four week period, Bupa will share the outcomes with their leadership in the UK and make a decision on the transition to Globe. So, ever the optimist, Ms. Fuddle is hoping that at the end of a four week period, there will be a final decision provided by uh, Bupa. And then she refers to a further kickoff, a new kickoff meeting on April the 1st uh, at 3 uh, pm. We could uh, now look at 3227. So this, uh, Your Excellency, is a, um, this is Mr. Another, this is Firas El Khatib in Amman reporting internally. I'm following up on Bupa's, in, sorry, on the 12th of April, I'm following up on Bupa's scoping exercise asking whether he's been contacted by uh, the Bupa team. And Mr. Gramas says there was no contact by Bupa whatsoever. I'll call their HR tomorrow. So there's what we're starting to see is a, is a decline in the interest on the part of Bupa. And, and we're seeing disappointment um, on the Amman side that Bupa aren't, or aren't are no longer are quite as engaged in the process of seeking to secure their consent, their scoping, if you like, of the transition process. Um, uh, and if we could move to 3266. And you see here, this is the, so again, sorry, we're slightly jumping around. We're going in the order which the documents come, but because of the email chains, they're not perfectly in chronological order. But this is Mr. On the 6th of April. This is Mr. Nawa of Bupa writing to Dr. Partha. In reference to the current scoping activity, we we're working together to provide the required level of understanding and assess key impacts for our area of the business as a result of transition. One of the major impacts is the provider's reaction. After the recent communications you sent to them announcing OIC network management has been transferred to GlobeMed effective 22nd of March. And if I could just go on to the third paragraph, there were some must haves points which have been discussed and agreed during the DD, the due diligence activity with OIC. And one fundamental point is no worse terms on coverage, servicing, and pricing than under existing OIC contracts. I'm sure you sharing with me that both of our members experience in this market will be very much affected by the level of network coverage they are receiving. Hence, providers position such as MediClinic or American Hospital from the network transition to GlobeMed is significant impact over the whole process. So if UPA patients or customers have been used to um, having access to the American Hospital, for example, which is seen apparently as a high end medical facility in the UAE, they want uh, they want a continuity. They don't, they want no worse terms on coverage. And Bupa are insisting that what the, the, the transition, a transition of their lives to GlobeMed shouldn't see a reduction in service and a reduction in choice. Hence the, the reference to must haves. From this sense, I'd request to share with us the top 50 claim spend providers received replies. So a nervousness on the part of Mr. Nawa as to the reaction of providers. First of all, he's nervous about the lack of consents, the 22% of consents, but he's also nervous. He wants to see the top 50 providers, what, what they have in fact replied, what, what has been received by way of reply from those providers. Uh, and, 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 and that really is, is uh, a, a, a fair summary of the position. Even by the time, even by uh, early April, when we're midway into the third round of uh, due diligence. And, and it, th it matters get worse because what Bupa then starts to require uh, or to, to focus on is the clinical audit requirements. And we see that if we look, for example, at 1322, 
sorry, do it, sorry, three, three, two, two, I apologize. Three, three, two, yeah. Three, two, two. <clears throat> Again, Mr. Nawa, second paragraph to Dr. To, uh, Dr. Panda. The clinical audit part is a significant element for our cost containment strategy in the UAE through OIC, which was missing and questioned. As I'm heading now, the health and benefits functions for pupa in the UAE and the region and own the sign off for this part of the scoping exit. I have to ensure full visibility through the clinical audit process, and we both agree measurable outcomes of this process. As we to define BUPA's percentage out of the entire operational capacity of clinical audit team, do we have these figures for first quarter 2015? No, uh, and then the answer obviously from uh, to Panda. And second paragraph, third paragraph, as we have a very tight time left in order to submit my recommendations to the project, no more than this week, Wednesday the 29th, uh, hence your collaboration will be much appreciated. So at this stage, he's anticipating a, an imminent decision on approval but what is looming uh, is an issue in respect of the clinical audit process and the clinical audit requirements. Um, so even at this stage, uh, there are major sticking points which are uh, uh, appearing. And then uh, just to show the wheels coming off the carriage, if you like, if one goes uh, in, in, I should say, in May 2015, if one goes to 3657, Oh, sorry. This is bundles. Uh, your lordship will see there are a number of um, there are um, a number of these PSR reports. Ah, if they if that can be rotated. <laughs> <laughs> Um, OK, well, we'll have to do a certain amount of uh, craning. No, uh, yeah. no, um, so this is the 14th of May. So this is essentially a week before the notification letter was sent. And on the second page summary, I'll read it out. Uh, mm -hmm. Overall assessment, potential delay on systems integration, GMG system changes, Abu Dhabi and Abu Dhabi license raised risks on network provider task completion before the go live, go live date. So concerns about licensing, concerns about the acceptance by the uh, providers. And then second item schedule highlighted HAAD, the HAD license risk was changed to an issue. So what had been classified as a risk has now become an issue as its completion date has been changed several times and is close to go live date. And then if we go on to three, I will go on to three, six, five, seven. Um, Bupa scoping uh, and then activities planned for this week. So there are ongoing scoping activities for the following week. They include um, the data flow diagrams, workshops on systems functionalities, conferences on shared APIs, etc. So there's a, a continuing work in respect of Bupa scoping. No end in sight on that. Um, and then if one goes on to 3660, um, in the uh, status column in respect of regulatory licenses, required updates from GlobeMed on DHA related license issues, anticipated progress on GlobeMed license in Abu Dhabi on the 14th of May. So they anticipate there may be some progress on the 14th of May in Abu Dhabi, but uh, there is still clearly concerns in respect of both uh, licenses. Um, and, and what emerges is that um, Bupa essentially have no in interest in giving approval before the launch. If you're going to watch, uh, or tend to watch the launch. Um, uh, and as we have seen, the margins that Oman can make are significantly reduced if uh, Bupa uh, delays. Um, and, and we see this in, a, in a, a number of documents which we which we should look at quickly. Uh, if we can go to 3253.
So this is an email from Ms. Faddle uh, in, to, um, to, to Mr. Sawaya from Bupa and another individual from Bupa, dear Kareem and Summer. As discussed yesterday, please find attached, oh sorry, uh, a summary of the runoff cost to be incurred by, by OIC to transition the administration of the medical portfolio to GlobeMed. We've compared the runoff cost in the event of a potential transition of Bupa six months later than the base scenario. I would re-emphasize that these are high-level estimates which are subject to change depending on commercial terms and agreements of the variables factored in this model. Next paragraph. The six-month gap is not the preferred outcome, rather an illustration of the additional cost that OIC would incur to transition Bupa at a later stage. So essentially she is pleading with them uh, not to transition with Bupa at a later stage. So that insofar as what Bupa have in mind is to watch the transition of the uh, non-Bupa lives and then take a view. She's explaining that this uh, creates significant additional costs to Amman and she's seeking to dissuade them um, from that course. And in terms of the costs of the transition period, if we go and look at 3849, And you saw this one because it's an email from the chair uh, in July, so some time after the notification. This is Mr. Abdelaziz Al Ghurair to Mr. Fahamon and Mr. Kama, the two uh, uh, Lebanese, two of the Lebanese owners of GlobeMed. And then it just just picking up on the second paragraph, second sentence. We've debated internally at length the possible approaches for OIC to minimise cost disruption during the transition period as well as the implications this decision would have on both of our companies. Regrettably, we made the decision to retain claims administration in-house for the time being and would not be able to reverse it without creating considerable confusion in the market. So what they've been debating is whether they could possibly minimise the cost and disruption from the transition period in circumstances where it's becoming clear that BUPA will not approve and that they've reached the sad decision that it's just not possible uh, to reduce, to minimise the cost and disruption. And, and that is the point at which it becomes clear that the uh, proposed venture simply uh, doesn't work. Um, and the, the problem, as I say, has become worse by this stage because we're beginning to see refusals by the providers. Uh, and if, if one looks at, for example, uh, 3240, This is a, an email from Mohamed Tali to Imran Farouk, copy to Dr. Panda. Dear Dr. Imran, please find the status on the GlobeMed Amendment Circular of your records. And then you see a table here, hospitals and clinics uh, in the various um, uh, various Emirates, and then uh, refused 11. Uh, and then in Dubai, 58, and then pharmacy cable refused Abu Dhabi, Dubai. And then if one goes up the chain of emails, so if one goes to the preceding page, 3239, you see an email from uh, Mr. Khalifa to um, Dr. Panda Cop and Firas copy to Ms. Fadl and others. We have a serious situation in Dubai and Sharjah. Any of the hospitals who refuse to key providers is pharmacy situation out of the efficiency of the PBM. What's the time frame to complete the meetings with those providers uh, with conclusion? And then Ms. Fadl uh, internally to Dr. Panda, um, going straight to the second paragraph. Um, Parfa, please look at the summary sheet in case I've forgotten anything before I share with Bupa. And then going up the chain further, second paragraph, Dr. Panda, on the sheet, it looks fine as per our discussion. Don't think we should add anything else as they are. They ask very specific. Well, I'm seizing that a reflection of the frustration with Bupa that if you provide them with information, they are continually drilling uh, down into the detail and asking for further detail. Extent, uh, Dr. Panda doesn't believe that any further information should be provided in addition to the table, but uh, it's uh, pretty clear, as I say, that uh, hospitals and pharmacies uh, are refusing. This is seen as a problem, 
and, and some of the refuseniks, if you like, are uh, key providers. And one sees that from 3241, so if one goes on a page. This is Dr. Panda, email to Mr. Khalifa, uh, copied to Ms. Fadal and others. Dear Dr. Yasser, these are my comments. Uh, any of the hospitals, so he's asking, are any of the hospitals you refused are key providers? And uh, the response from Dr. Panda, yes. And he identifies Belleville, Mediclinic, Bourgeois, Lifeline, etc. Um, so yes, there is a problem. These are not just any providers. Uh, some of these are key uh, providers. Um, there is a particular problem in respect of Mediclinic. If we look at 3360, This is one of the tables listing um, the problem situations. Uh, and then 3360, the fourth provider name in the left hand column, this communication refers to a letter. Uh, and then a query uh, information. Please be informed that GloveMed Gulf is suspended on direct billing with MediClinic effective 3rd of March. The same has been communicated to them with prior notice, warning and notice. This has resulted in treating all of their existing members on cash paying basis effective from the 3rd of, of March 2015. So MediClinic are not are no longer um, working on account uh, for Globe Med Gulf, which is seen as a, a particular problem. Um, and then if we could turn on to 3641. Yeah. So this is essentially a sort of summary of where we're at mid-May, the 14th of May, and we've seen the existing PSR, the, the Progress Status Report. This is from this is this is interesting because this is from the from Ellie Tomey, so this is from the GlobeMed side. Uh, and in terms of PBM, so uh, paragraph one PBM, so that's the pharmacy benefit management. And then a few items down, we have 72 who have so far refused out of 69 relate to life care pharmacy. And then uh, number item two, hospitals. All hospitals have agreed to shift with the exception of some providers who are linking the agreement to shift to the payment of outstanding dues or dis disputed amounts from OIC. Um, so problem seems to be, as my learned friend suggests, that a lot of those hospitals are using their refusal essentially um, as a as a lever in terms of um, disputed amounts or um, their rates. And then items four and five, we see the licensing issues being discussed. So the HAD, the Health Authority of Abu Dhabi license, we'll get back to you once we have confirmation for our lawyers in Abu Dhabi. Okay, so clearly an, an ongoing problem in terms of the Abu Dhabi license and five DHA, the Dubai Health Authority feedback, nothing is yet as the DHA has not yet evaluated anyone's compliance, so that that matter is still ongoing and it still, still isn't uh, a, a, uh, an unconditional uh, license. Um, and then if we uh, look to uh, 3454, Yes. We see another issue which is emerging. So we've got licensing issues. We've got uh, globe. We've got bupa problems. We've got uh, providers not wanting, refusing, or, or not consenting, which is creating further problems with bupa. And then Miss um, Rigo reports on the twenty third of April, copied to Miss Fadel. But in an email to Dr. Panda and Mr. Khalifa, and if one goes to the bottom of that page, other feedback from the ops floor. So we're also experiencing problems at the, the operations level. The uh, one, the rejection communication from GlobeMed to members, both at claims and ops, has triggered an insecurity, driving them to look for opportunities outside. Uh, we're aware that CVs are being sensibly handed out to some of our ex-employees. Two, team members are approaching 
was about internal management having provided a selective list of employees to bloat men to screen. And three, the commitment and the motivation to overtime when required is an absolute low. Or any threat or push from team leads on deliverables to result in, in absenteeism. So what we're seeing is because staff are concerned about being transferred to GlobeMed, that we are seeing staff issues in terms of uh, people leaving, um, uh, morale uh, falling, and yeah. and even absenteeism people not turning up to work. So there is an additional problem in terms of the morale of the Amman staff in circumstances where many of them are concerned about being transferred uh, to GlobeMed. In terms of the uh, management concerns on the Amman side, if we could look at 3648. Three, six, four, eight. Yes. This is Mr. Khalifa, who's fairly who's senior within Amman, and he's emailing on the 14th of May, uh, and he's emailing Mr. Tomi from GlobeMed. I need a confirmation of the following, and then the second bullet, all hospitals agreed to be shifted to GlobeMed. Uh, he also agreed to maintain their volume discounts agreed with OIC. Second bullet, an update on the GlobeMed license with HAAD. And third bullet DHA feedback on GlobeMed compliance. So, um, Mr. Khalifa is uh, is explaining to GlobeMed that he needs all of the hospitals to be shifted to agree to be shifted to GlobeMed, and he needs confirmation on these licenses. So that is that is what is concerning him as a member of the Oman uh, management. Um, and if you look at three six five five, so we're turning on a few pages. Yes. Um, uh, sorry, we, we've already looked at but this. But again, this is the PSR report, uh, which we just about no. uh, yeah. concerned about the issues of licensing um, yeah. in, in particular and the ongoing BUPA um, mm. due to exercise. And then lastly, um, if we could look at 3732. Yeah. So the middle email on this page from Mr. Khalifa to internally on May the 18th. Um, and then the second bullet, if you like, it is quite obvious that we have no go live uh, on the 24th of May. Please check the implications of the view for scoping exercise and OIC expenses in case of pushing the go live date to the 1st of July. So uh, again, um, looking at the complications in terms of the view for scoping exercise and concern about the Oman expenses, so that, that is what's driving the decision making. Uh, and then uh, about two thirds down the page, paragraph beginning in the meantime, underwriting will not start uh, advising existing or new policy with the shift to GM till we have a clearance on reported risk factors as discussed yesterday. So um, real and live concerns in respect of exp expenses and risk factors that have been reported. And one would imagine those are the very ones that have been set out in the um, progress summary report. Um, so what we see by the, by the notification date is a real sense of building crisis or mounting crisis that the licenses haven't been obtained, that the morale of uh, OIC's Oman staff is collapsing, that uh, uh, BUPA are nowhere near um, providing approval and indeed are still asking very detailed questions, still talk, was talking about the process of uh, internal medical audit uh, and what they are therefore facing in economic terms is a situation whereby uh, the BUPA lives will not be transferred until sometime later, so they will be in a situation where they are having to pay uh, fees on the basis of uh, all of the lives being transferred to GlobeMed, when in fact for a significant period it may be that they are also have to maintain their own in-house claims administration or the administration of the BUPA uh, claims and lives. So in those, th those are the circumstances 
in which uh, notification happens. And as we say, notification on our analysis is essentially uh, Omar deciding that it will exercise its right until the conditions have been satisfied to, to walk away um, from this from this venture. Now, I've taken you to see these documents at length. I apologise, particularly on your birthday, uh, Your Excellency, but I, I, I apologise. But they, the, the reason I've done that is because, unfortunately, on the operation side, we have we have no witnesses. So our, our witnesses are essentially the lawyers, the in-house lawyers, and they can tell us mm -hmm. what happened. What they can't tell us is what was happening commercially uh, in leading to the uh, notification uh, on the 21st of, of May. Um, in terms of experts, I, I probably don't need to say anything uh, at, at this point. We do say that, that both the market experts and the forensic experts, the forensic accountants, are important in showing the uncertainty of the hypothetical loss of profits. And uh, that obviously is important as an issue of law as to the recoverability of that head of claim as a matter of, of UAE law. Um, and, and obviously the experts clearly, if the court is against Amman on everything else, uh, then the experts will be important on the issue of causation. And uh, Milan and Friend has helpfully taken you to the key tables at the back of the uh, experts bundle just for your logic's note again, that's at 39, E1396 and 7 and E1399. So you have Mr. Koppel's two tables, his uh, OIC losses and his non-OIC losses. And then you have uh, Mr. Burrow's table, um, which produces uh, losses of uh, 5 million dirham. Uh, yes. Is it is now a good time Lord, to take a seven minute break for the two yeah i'm fine with that um so you should back for how, how long you need more um is there really... uh, well, i could do five minutes my lord but if your lordship wish 10 minutes then we could say 25 to the hour yeah then 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 we'll uh, we need to we're going to finish by 4 30 today or maybe well, uh... i'll let the friends i'll let the friends have three and a half hours um that would give me only two and a half hours so there would be a certain um unfairness in that um but having yeah. said that we have got an over we have got a in the timetable we anticipated that i may overrun into tomorrow so if your logic wants to finish at 4 30 we can do that no, but no, no, no. I'm, i can't stay until five I'm, I'm just worried about the others commitment i mean if if, if everyone is happy to stay until five I'm, I'm fine that would that would give me that would give me three hours which would be half an hour less, less than my learning friend so well, i think in fairness i think half an hour of my time was spent waiting for technical problem to be resolved. So yes, and you, my, my friend started at nine and finished at one and there was half 10 minutes of break and 20 minutes of uh, technical disruption. So I, I think it is no, 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 for, for, for me, I, I have no any, 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 any issue with that. I just want to make sure everyone is, is, is have any, uh, no any commitment after four o'clock because we initially we said it's going to be finished by four o'clock. So that's fine. We'll take a break now and come back in 10 minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes. 35 past the hour. No, I'm no. grateful. Sure. Yeah. Good. Apologies. All right. No, no, no. Please go ahead. Well, I'm going to start on, on the, the plates versus nullity. Now, I, I'd entirely accept that Mr. Justice Field had reservations about this, but he did find that it was a real prospect of success. And, and he was considering the issue at a very early stage, uh, looking at the UA law points on the basis of the draft pleading. And to some extent, in my submission, some of his scepticism uh, can be explained by the fact that he comes from a common law uh, background and that if a company is registered, then you assume that it is a valid company. Possibly more importantly, there were two critical documents that had, he had not uh, seen and were not then before the court. The first was the Hello, uh, the side agreement uh, itself. That's the agreement made back in 2013. Um, now said to be a written record of an unenforceable understanding. Um, but if one looks uh, at the document, it's clearly much more than that. And if we could go back to 1513. F, 1513, that's it. If one goes uh, just uh, up to the previous page, you see the signature page of the Arabic uh, version. 
Mm. Uh, in my submission, that, that is not the sort of signatures one would expect to see on, on a record of an unenforceable near understanding. Clearly, the parties felt they were doing much more than recording some sort of uh, vague uh, understanding. Um, in the agreement, uh, as your Lordship will, uh, has identified, um, there is if we, if we start at 1513, obviously it's important, the paragraph under the table. Um, uh, whereas the shares are divided by the company's memorandum, whereas formal division, which does not reflect the reality of partnership among the parties, and whereas the true relation of parties identified through the present agreement, so that is said to be the true relationship. And then if we turn on to page 1518, as we did this morning, mm. Oh, and actually, if we just before we do that, can we um, can we stop at page fifteen fifteen? And if we go down to Article Ten, the first party undertakes to assign its profits in the company exclusively to the second party against obtaining receiving a lump sum of fifty thousand dirham, representing the value of its annual shareholding in the company. Which will be paid at the beginning of each fiscal year. Uh, if the first party is not fulfilled its obligation for any reason, then the, it shall pay the first party an amount equivalent to the trip of the latest fees paid to the first party. So it's not it's it's an undertaking to assign. It's not an agreement as to some future assignment. It's an undertaking given now to assign from now on all of the profits in the company uh, against the receipt of a lump sum of only fifty thousand dirham um, uh, per year. Um, that's one, one other provision I did want to. Yes, uh, Article 4, if you could just go to that. So what one has here is, is a fig leaf or a pretense that there was something being done by the first party, by Mr. Alhelu. The first party undertakes to cooperate in order to obtain all licenses, permits, visas for the company's employees from the government and non-government authorities for the purpose of running the company's business. The, the reality there has been there is you, you will logically have seen very significant um, evidence of attempt to get to obtain the necessary licenses, but none of those attempts involve Mr. El Helu. He was entirely uninvolved in the process of obtaining licenses. This is, if you like, a uh, a, a window dressing to suggest that Mr. El Helu was providing some form of service um, uh, when that was plainly on the evidence not the case. Um, and then Article 12 at page 1516. And then if I could just read the second paragraph, second sentence of that paragraph, the first party has already undertaken not to claim any share of any type of the company's assets and capital as it didn't participate in the same. The first party admits that the company's funding and formation of its capital was carried by the, the other parties to the company. And then 1518. The critical paragraph to which your Lordship referred this morning, Article 24, and then we've seen the second paragraph is hereby understood and agreed that the first party was appointed as a citizen par partner as is required to incorporate the company inside the UAE by virtue of federal law number eight of 1984. That is the 1984 uh, commercial companies law and not an actual partner, so not a sharif barely of the company, not actual, not real. Based on the same, this agreement should be considered interpreted or construed in any case whatsoever as an actual contract between the parties. Uh, and so that we say is the side agreement. Uh, it is a, an obvious attempt to avoid uh, the requirement of the nationality requirement and indeed the profit requirements as we've um, defined them. Um, they are further um, uh, explained, if you like, by the waiver letter at 1696. As my friend explained this morning, it is uh, significantly later in time. It's April 2014, still long before um, the uh, discussions of the venture, joint venture with Oman. Um, but reference in the first paragraph to the shares being held for uh, GML, Globe Med Limited's account. 
Uh, and then um, uh, second paragraph, uh, the reference to the shares being possessed on trust and on your behalf. Um, that is the uh, the word the English word used is trust. Uh, it's less clear on the Arabic uh, uh, as to whether trust or whether it's to the, to the credit or whether it's on account of. Uh, it's certainly no suggestion that English or DRFC concepts of trust are being invoked there. What is this suggestion that those shares are being held on behalf of GML? And then uh, a statement by Mr. El Hello, we do not have the right to dispose or transfer or forfeit or use them as guarantee in any way. So any rights that a normal shareholder would have to dispose of their shares are um, renounced. We have no, we, we, we do not have any acquired or other rights to dispose of the shares to any person or third party. Um, and, and finally, accordingly, we hereby finally completely irrevocably waive these shares to Globe Med Limited. So uh, absolute clarity as to uh, the nature of the shareholding. <clears throat> I should just say, and we may come back to these, but there have been a couple of documents which uh, have um, are included at uh, in bundle L at 156022. Yeah, I, I received this from the registry today morning. That wasn't filed in the bundle. Or... No, uh, it, it, it was discussed uh, and previous, these documents were heavily discussed at the previous hearing. We assumed they were in the trial bundle, but when we looked, they had somehow they've been overlooked. Um, they do seem important in that they obviously seem to be announcements to the market in terms of uh, equity structure clarification. So the first of those are 156022. Um, can, can you give me the, 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 the reference number again? Page number? Sorry, yes, uh, L. Lima 156022. I, I, I cannot see the red number on the top right. I just want to make sure I okay. have it. In there. Ah, yeah, yeah, this is the one I'm looking for. Oh, Your Excellency, that's not the current number. The current number is, as I said, ah, L. Um, yeah. 156022. <laughs> so you have Sorry. to give this, yeah, you have to give, you give it to me again. 156. One five six zero two two zero two two. Okay, and zero two three. Uh, all right, so it's a given invalid number, so this is why it's been sent. To the all right, no worries. Okay, okay. So, so the first says, uh, first paragraph, we opted to register an optimal time by having the shares held nominally by individuals as follows. So then, Mr. Adam Ibrahim, 51%. <laughs> Bold. However, the actual ownership, which is documented between the holders and owners, is as follows: Globe Med 91.5 percent, Karma Holdings 8.95. So they, clearly, they felt they needed to explain to someone that really this is 91 percent a Globe Med uh, entity and owned by Globe Med Limited. Um, and then, and then something fairly similar uh, again, some sort of formal announcement or communication to the same effect. So what, 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 what do you conclude from the fact that Mr. Uh, Al Hello is not the actual uh, shareholder? Not, um, well, well in, so, in so far as there's a requirement that a national be the shareholder, where they are not the actual shareholder mm. or the sharif fairly, then we say that is in breach and we say the cons and also well, we'll, we'll come to the, the relevant statutory requirement, but also there's a requirement that they participate in the profit and where they give up their right to profit, that again is a breach of the commercial uh, company's law and again is a, is a basis for nullity. A and indeed, we say too, that where the side agreement as a matter of context shows that what is said in the company contract or the memorandum, however you want to see it, is false, that in that in its in, in essence also is a ground for nullity because, uh, as we've seen, and as Melanie Friend explained, that that by reference to the footnote in our skeleton argument, that that itself is a basis. Well, it's firstly is a is is, is a criminal offence, but is also a basis for nullity because where you where the where what is said 
in the company contract is shown to be false, or is falsified by a side agreement. Uh, that is a further ground uh, in our submission for saying that, there is a, that the company itself is a nullity. Because the, the very public document, as my learned friend emphasised, public document to which third parties can look in order to uh, ascertain the reality or the, 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 the ownership of the company, if that document is falsified, by a side agreement which shows that it, the truth is far from what is said in the company contract, that itself um, is a further ground for nullity. That, 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 that is, it's, it, it's, it's, it's not simply a case of uh, it having been placed, superseded. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I, will, I'll, I will come on to explain this. Um, and, and in fact, it probably helped we now looked at the company contract, which is at 1551. Yes. You you will see you you have the Arabic, the notarized Arabic version immediately above it. But just uh, while we're looking at the the uh, the English translation. Yes. So it is said that the first party. Has that's the same as to El Hello has the fifty one percent. Well, we've established that the side agreement shows that he's not the actual, he's not the real shareholder of those fifty one percent. And then, for example, you have uh, over page fifteen fifty three provisions for transfer. So, if any partner wishes to transfer his shares or share or shares, he can give notice. So, there are essentially there are preemption rights that exist on a, for a transfer. Well. We know that Mr. El Helig is is prevented from transferring. So again, in terms of um, there are significant restrictions on the rights of uh, Mr. Helu, contrary to what is said in the uh, company contract. And then if we um, go to 1550. Uh, um, mm -hmm. Bottom of that page, you see clause 13.2. Profit and loss will be distributed among the partners as follows. So it is suggested that the first party, Mr. Hello, is entitled to 20% of the profits. Well, we've seen that isn't true because he doesn't get any profits. He's, all profits have been waived in return for his entitlement to 50,000 dirham a year. So that's clearly a misrepresentation. Um, so, so as we see, there are a suggestion that Mr. El Hello is the 51% shareholder, that he <laughs> says that he's entitled to 20% of the profit. All of those uh, provisions are essentially undermined or falsified by what is said, agreed in the side agreement. And indeed, it's Mr. El Hello who appears to sign the company contract. One sees that on the final page, page 1560. <clears throat> and so to that extent, we say we don't shy from saying, shrink from saying that the company contract is misleading and that to, that, to that extent it is a sham agreement. And indeed, that is precisely why the nationality requirement cannot be avoided by the simple expedient of moving all of the offending uh, provisions into a side agreement. Because when you do that, you precisely falsify the company contract. You render it uh, misleading and you render it a, a sham insofar as it purports to describe provisions that have been essentially reversed by way of the side agreement. And the statutory requirement, we say, would be nonsense if it was that easy. If you, all you had to do was sweep all of the offending provisions uh, in terms of the real ownership, in terms of entitlement to profit, into a side agreement. And that's why GMS is essentially driven to our GMGHS is essentially driven to argue that there can be no prohibition on any side agreement. Well, that that's that's in our respect, our submission is wrong. Because when you have these offending provisions in a side agreement, uh, you render uh, false and misleading the 
uh, company contract. And I just want to look at the relevant provisions in respect of this uh, matter of public policy. Uh, it, it, it was a matter of public policy that the majority of shares in a UA company should be held by a UA national, and that that UA national should be entitled to a share in a profit. They should be a real uh, shareholder, if you like. And that obviously was a key provision in the 1984 Commercial Companies Law, and we have that in K. Uh, 154124. Does your lordship have that? And then if yes. we go Article 4, the company is contract under which two or more persons undertake to con contribute to an economic project to achieve profit by each providing a share or money or work or sharing whatever profits or losses result therefrom. So the, re the, re the requirement of a company that it's uh, uh, that members each contribute and achieve profit uh, is critical to the definition of a company under the company of statute. And Article uh, 6, then a company that didn't establish based on types that have been mentioned in the our previous article shall be considered null, and the persons who contracted in the name shall be responsible individually and jointly for the resulted obligations from this contracting. So to the extent that you don't fit into one of those categories, the relevant company is null. Um, and then Article 8, second paragraph, the company's partners may in a dispute amongst themselves support their claims by seeking an annulment to the company's contract when said Contract has not been written or endorsed, however, they might they may not resort to the same in a dispute with an outside party. So you see the beginnings of outsider or third party protection. Uh, and Article 9, when a company ruling made by a company renders a com company loy null and void, the request of a party outside the company, the company shall be null and void with respect to the said party. And the persons who enter into contracts with said party in the company's name shall be personally and jointly responsible for all liabilities arising from such contracts. However, if the company is declared null and void at one partner's request, it shall only be null and void as of the date in which the court's ruling was issued. So this is the earlier equivalent of Section 16, as we see in the 2015 statute. So this is the provision that applies in respect of the nullity in 2013 of GM GHS, and we see here that a, an outsider may uh, have the uh, company rendered null and void, and that it, the company shall be null and void with respect to that third party. So that's essentially 16.1 as it later becomes, and then the liability of the person can, pur purporting to contract on behalf of the party, that's 16.2. Uh, uh, in the later statute. And however, if the company is declared null and void at one partner's request, it shall only be null and void as the date from which the court's ruling was issued. So when you have a dispute between uh, partners, uh, it is null and void. Uh, it's not it's null and void only from the from, from, from that time. It doesn't, it's not retrospective, it it's not void ab initio. But what one doesn't see in the 1984 statute, which is the relevant is any reference to that final sentence of 16.3 on which so much reliance is placed uh, by the claim. And then um, uh, if we go on to Article 18. OK, so this is the property. Sorry, this is the profit requirement. If the company contract excludes the partner from profits or exempts it from loss, the contract should be null and void. So pretty clear in terms of spelling out the consequences. Entitlement. But then Article 22. Eight. Without prejudice to the uh, commercial activities confined to nationals, either this law or other law. Yeah. Each each company established in the state shall include one or other national partners holding a share in the company's capital, not less than fifty one percent. So that's that's the nationality. Probably all we need to look look at in terms of the, the 1984 statute. That we say is the regime that applied in 2013 mm -hmm. when the side agreement was made with Mr. And we say that when under that regime a company is uh, rendered a nullity, it cannot by a subsequent statute uh, be resurrected or, or spring spring back to life. 
And obviously, where there are matters of public policy, you can have a statute which expressly has retrospective effect. So you can you can say this statute uh, shall apply even in respect to prior events. It's it's pretty exceptional, but where it, that is deemed necessary in terms of public, public policy, that can be um, done. So if there was a new uh, 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 requirement of public policy that could be applied retrospectively, but that isn't the term in the 2015 or the 21 uh, statute, which simply relax a previous public policy. But that re relaxation of a previous public policy cannot be effective in our submission as a matter of common sense and as a matter of first principle, cannot be effective to bring back to life a company that is already a nullity under the 1984 uh, statute. Uh, and my learned friend suggests that the DRC should be slow to identify uh, uh, issues of public policy. Well, the Lord, that would be true, uh, particularly in arbitration cases where it's suggested that a, an award can be uh, invalidated by reference to public policy. But we are dealing here with a, an established, uh, entirely clear point of public policy. And I would, we would further question uh, whether the DRC courts, uh, as Courts of the UAE um, can be required not to apply UAE public policy. They are in our submission required as courts of the UAE to give effect to the obvious uh, and uh, uh, obvious uh, public policy of the of the union. Um, the, the, the point of public policy, this has been raised before in the skeleton argument. And so oh, it's a new, new, new. Well, I, I think the point the point taken is that um, because the twenty, uh, 20 let's say the twenty twenty one, which uh, makes clear that the removal or the withdrawal of the national government, because that is said to relate to public policy, uh, that uh, that's that it, it, it may have retrospective effect, and we say we say no for the reasons I've just uh, I've just canvassed. I see. Yeah, it's par for reference, but I don't think I don't think we want to go back to it's paragraph fifty six of this of the claimant's skeleton. Yes, um, Lord, we do say in terms of nullity that there is uh, no requirement. There's no need as a matter of UA law for a declaratory judgment. Obviously, one can seek declaratory judgment, a, a declaration to that effect, um, but it's not necessary. And we look at um, briefly some of the Egyptian jurists on this subject, obviously, Murkos and Tsubasa um, uh, Sanhuri. We start, if we may, with K155623. And this is, as the side note explains, this is from um, this is from uh, Morcos Al Wafi explaining the civil law obligation volume one. And then picking up 235, how is annulment materialized? The general principle states that annulment is materialized by force of law. Thank you. Whether the nature of things require such annulment or the contract is in violation of the public order or morals as the contract shall not be existent in both cases. Hence, there is no need to render a judgment of the annulment thereof. Then picking up at 236, annulment results in making the invalid uh, contract being ineffective is discovered prior to the contract execution. Execution shall be irrelevant if the contract is The value of the fulfilled obligation shall be recorded, and your Lordship has the Arabic on the following page. And then picking up Sanhuri at uh, K155616. And paragraph so there's how to confirm annulment and invalid contract 332 there is no need for judgment to confirm annulment whether the invalid contract is legally non-existent there is no need to obtain annulment judgment nor to render a judgment of validity regarding the non-existent item 
this is a logical conclusion which is consistent in most cases. The party that has an interest in confirming another required to file a lawsuit in this regard. Instead, the party shall only give the contract as null and void and act accordingly. Uh, and then just picking up the last few lines of that page, the party which insists on the null of the invalid contract shall seek the same in most cases by way of defence and motion, not, not the lawsuit. So uh, again, it's, it's not usually the claimant but someone seeking um, pleads the annulment by way of defence, as indeed Armand does in this case. And, and in terms of the contract not uh, springing back, if we could just go to uh, 155620. <laughs> Yes. Again, this is from the Wasit. 315, if valid contract is not followed by confirmation, the first paragraph of Article 141 of the new law stipulates that in case of the contract is void, any concerned party shall adhere to the nullity. And picking up the following paragraph, invalid contract is not followed by confirmation because it's non existent. A non existence does not become an existence, even if it is confirmed. So again, uh, it arises um, on its own. So um, the court uh, is generally required to look through uh, nominee arrangements. Um, and if I could quickly pick up DCC, so Dubai Court of Cassation 330 of 2000, which is 154895. <clears throat> yes. Just following. I'm just, just. Yes, yeah, so um, picking up the head note, if you like, uh, uh, item one, halfway down, recording false information in the memorandum of association, the company, its effect, nullity of the company, considering it's a de facto partnership, and then. Point two, um, third parties may prove that it's a fictitious contract by all means of evidence. And then bottom of the page, the final paragraph, the last two lines. The legislator has criminalized the incident of recording false data contradicting the true facts in the memorandum of association. And then over page 154877. Uh, first new sentence, violation of the incorporation rules of a limited liability company shall result in nullity, and then two, well, a uh, contract that is based on circumvention of the law against its interest in order to reveal the nullity of the company. Uh, and then, Yes, um, if I could go to the top of page 154879. 154879. Oh, oh sorry. Um, uh, okay. So we're dealing with the two, the, the initial authorities bundle followed by the repaginated authorities bundle. So, um, so if we could go on to the third, the, yes, thank you. So the first sentence here, however, the documents acknowledged submitted to the confident bodies might be fictitious so the parties can circumvent the company's law and commercial registers law and soliciting the assistance of an expert is the means to prove that. And then if we can, um, just pick up the bottom of that page. Beginning about eight lines up, sentence beginning, the petitioner entity insisted that other respondents had not contributed to the capital of the first respondent company and have obtained a license, therefore, as a limited liability company by circumventing the law. And the petitioner requested 
the appointment of an expert in order to prove this. The contested judgment rejected the said request on the basis that the memorandum of association said company and the letter from the Dubai Chamber of Commerce and Industry regarding the data of the company's commercial loss indicate the company is a limited liability company and its capital and shares with partners therein have been established. The contested judgment also stipulated um, uh, that the petitioner's defence regarding examination of contributions of partners and the capital <laughs> company unsubstantiated statement. The fact that the documents of the case is sufficient for forming an opinion to decide this feed. However, this does not address the petitioner's request for the appointment of an expert in order to prove that the first respondent company is a shell company and as such request represents an effective means in evidence. So the party seeking to show the nullity has to, to show it as a matter of uh, as a matter of evidence, often by means of the appointment of an expert, but where it is where it is shown that the memorandum of the company doesn't reflect the reality. Uh, that is a uh, breach and that results uh, in a nullity. But the company, the court, sorry, is looking through um, such uh, arrangements have been uh, uh, put in place and it is to be shown by the third party on evidence if the company's contract uh, is fictitious. And of course, if there's a violation of that rule, then the company is found to be a nullity. And if we could just look at uh, BCC, so Dubai Court Accusation 318 of 2004. Uh, uh, do I have the bundle page? Sorry, 154947. Sorry, 154895. Sorry, it's 154947. Yes. And if we go down to the bottom of this page. Paragraph, last three lines. Any person who records false data or data violating the provisions of this law in the memorandum of association shall be punished. In other words, if it appears that partners in a limited liability company have recorded false data regarding their payment of shares or the share of either party, the said company shall be deemed null and void. And two, second sentence, thus the proper characterization of the second respondent's plea is that the first respondent company, which is a limited liability company, is a shell company because the petitioner did not pay his share of their capital contrary to what's established in the company's memorandum association. And because the certificate submitted by the petitioner regarding payment of shares appears to be forged, on this basis, the plea is a plea for nullity of the first respondent company. And your Lordship can, can, can read that, but essentially um, uh, the, that develops in the course of the judgment at this point about uh, false. Um, I, I, cannot, I cannot confirm that, but I, th I think from my, from my memory, um, the outcome for one party to be a shell or as a sleeping party, whatever, in the UAE company, this is should be just among the party themselves or the, the shareholder themselves, but the third party or the the people who's outside this company should not be affected by any side arrangement between um, between between shareholders of the company. Well, because uh, as we as we saw in the 1984 uh, statute, there is protection for third parties, and they are entitled to, to rely on the nullity of the company. Uh, we'll come on to Article 16.3 in the 2015 statute and whether that, as my learned friend suggests, uh, prevents in 16.3 the, the, uh, the third party from relying on the nullity uh, as a defence to a debt. Sorry to interrupt, but just, just to be clear, I mean, my, my position on de facto company doesn't depend on Article 16.3. Uh, no, I'm, I'm addressing particularly the third party concern. A de facto company, in my submission, is largely about the relations between shareholders. Insofar mm -hmm. as His Excellency was raising a question about third party protection, yes. and whether, it, whether, it, whether nullity affects the third party, we have seen, uh, and I can't remember the, the number in the 1984, the, the provision number, but we have seen that it expressly uh, allows the third party to rely on the nullity uh, in its dealings with the company. So that that third party um, uh, well, provision is expressly on the face of the 1984 statute. 
So I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt again. I, 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 my case is that the de facto company point means that the company remains in existence for all purposes, yeah. even if it is mostly nullity. But just, but just, I just, I thought my learned friend had conceded that point, but said it has I, limited effect. It's, he's, he I, says I, I, it I'm only not affects. I'm not, I'm not addressing my learned friend's case, nor do I wish to enter into a debate at this stage of the proceedings. What I'm seeking to address is His Excellency's question, specifically in respect to third party rights. Yeah, I'm so sorry to make things more complicated for both of you, but <laughs> this was one of those, uh, um, um, I mean, previous practice. But anyway, just, just carry on and we'll, we'll address this later on. So my Lord, we, we say the vice of a side agreement is to show, is to is essentially render false the company yeah. contract. And we say that de the deterrent consequence in terms of nullity cannot be avoided simply by the use of a, a side agreement. Um, so that, that that's essentially what we say in terms of, of nullity and the, and the, the, the side agreement. Um, it's suggested by my learned friends that um, to the extent that uh, Oman knew of or benefited from the side agreement, that it is somehow it is stopped from relying on it and relying on the, the nullity that arises from the false, the, the, the resulting falsity of the company contract. We, it should be, we should make clear that the knowledge that Arman had in respect of the uh, side agreement was very limited. There's a reference in the MOU, which your Lordship picked up on uh, this morning, uh, which was a, an agreement that the MOU obviously was drafted in the first instance by um, GM Globemed, as we have seen. And the side agreement itself was a document to which um, uh, OIC uh, would have had limited access in the course of the uh, the, the due diligence uh, exercise. OIC, of course, Oman is not taking the benefit of the uh, 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 site uh, agreement. It established the structure whereby, uh, and indeed it is it sought consistently to establish a structure whereby the majority of you know, it was uh, synergized. I don't think I need to say uh, more in respect of that, um, but that question of knowledge, etc., will no doubt be examined in the course of uh, evidence. So looking at uh, de facto agreement, there's an issue about the extent to which GM, GHS's claim is saved by a de facto uh, uh, company. Uh, there are a number of cases in the bundle on this. If we could turn to um, Dubai Court of Station 395 2002, and that should be at And if we could pick up a paragraph uh, two, if it's a judge, the company shall be invalidated the non-registration of the memorandum of incorporation in order to settle the equities of the partners that are all related to the business taking place before the request for invalidity. The memorandum of incorporation conditions shall be effective. So we're dealing here with a situation with uh, where the partners are seeking to um, settle their uh, claims as against each other in respect of business that has been conducted. This means that the company was existing actually between the partners during the period from the incorporation thereof the invalidity request when the legislator considered the company as invalid due to the non-registration of the contract. However, the legislator stipulates the company should have actually undertook some of the business thereof by acquiring rights and being obligated by undertakings in order to consider it as a de facto entity so that the partners can settle the joint transactions. This is in order for the consequences of the business of such company, including profit or loss, not to affect one of the partners only without the others. So all of the partners essentially uh, have to contract or have, or their issues are resolved by reference to the memorandum of the company, even though the company has been found to be uh, invalid. Uh, this results in resorting to the idea of the de facto company in the event that the implementation of the memorandum of incorporation as of a company does not commence 
before the judgment of the invalidity because of the failure to take the registration procedures and the said companies not practice any of the business thereof, then shall then such shall not be a de facto corporation existing during the term preceding the invalidity request. Accordingly, it shall not be considered as a de facto corporation. Uh, and then I don't think I need any more from um, that judgment. Possibly if I could go on to um, one, two, three, four pages. <clears throat> yes. Uh, and then just picking up uh, 10 lines down, sentence beginning, thus the said invalidity shall not have the retrospective effect before the judgment of the invalidity. Consequently, joint transactions made proceeding to the ability request shall be liquid shall be liquidated in order for the consequences thereof, including property loss, not to be enjoyed or incurred by one of the parties only. So, in order to ensure um, a just and fair result as between shareholders, the invalidity is not considered in this, in the as between partners to be of retrospective effect. Uh, and indeed. Um, there are no examples we have seen in the authorities of a de facto company being used to preserve rights against third, part third parties. What we do say, as my learned friend rightly states, is, is some references to liquidation being described in very general terms as about uh, paying the liabilities, getting in the assets and uh, distributing the remaining assets between, between shareholders. But we don't see what we don't see is an example of the de facto company being used to preserve company rights in specific claims as against uh, third parties. It, it is used in all the cases in order to preserve uh, rights and obligations as between shareholders, so between themselves, and also to preserve the rights of third parties against the companies, but, but not the other way around, not company rights uh, as against uh, third parties. Uh, so, I'll develop, I'll develop that point uh, uh, more. It said that um, it said that well, <coughs> I should just say it is it, it said that there is no clear distinction uh, in Arabic between uh, debts uh, and obligations uh, and uh, and that is that is um, that that point is illustrated. So, so to the ex extent that uh, it suggested that uh, that the, the third party rights um, or rights against the third party can be preserved uh, is, is limited to either obligations or debts. It's, it's quite clear in our submission that uh, debts and obligations are. Uh, in, the words used in the relevant provisions, and I think my learned friend took you to Article 3333 of the Civil Code and 391 of the Civil Code. Uh, actually, when one looks at three, Article 333, which is at uh, uh, I, I've got the old bundle, I'm afraid, before it was repaginated, helpfully. Um, if I can take you to what well, you can see, hopefully from the side margin, the um, the Whelan extracts. So if we could look at those. Well, actually, if we can look at the. Um, If we can look at the uh, civil code in its English translation. Yes, it says obligation. There's another much civil code uh, translation. It's one. 
one in tab three. Hang on, just let me know what I'm in nineteen eighty five. Sorry, my lord. This is this this is an illustration of what happens when paginations change. No, no, you can't give me the tab uh, section. Sorry, a or it's, or sorry I'm here. He, he, yes, so uh, if you go to tab three, I don't I don't think the extraneous case has been inserted by this point. Tab, tab, tab three means sec section C. Or, uh, you have right. section. Uh, have, have, that's uh, assuming tab. it's. Um, so I think I think my learned friend is asking you to turn to page bundle K, tab three, and it, I think he's taking you to page one one five four two two six. Yes, thank you. So tab 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 three, or but page one five four two two six. No, it is. No, this is the federal law. Yes, yeah, sorry, it should be the civil code. Yes. Does your lordship have that? If, yeah. if you're, Article 333, well, in this translation, the title, the heading is reimbursement of third party debts. And the first line of Article 333 is whoever reimburses the debt of another. And it, it, your lordship may be familiar with the Arabic, but in both cases the word day is used for debt. So the fact that the English translator in, in an, another translation is used obligation in one context and debt in another is, in, in my submission, takes this court nowhere. Um, can, can you show me that? Can you show me again the Arabic? Uh, 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 I, I don't have it to hand and you haven't been provided with the Arabic for the civil code. Maybe, maybe, let me see what I can find it here. Should be can I look to it later on in my but I thought it should be in the bundle anyway. Um, um so my lord you, you do have it. Yeah. Yes, yes. You'll see, see in the title the reference to Dean Debt. And then you'll see in the first line of Article 333, I mean, Alpha Dean. Well, so again, I'm sorry, to, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt. Two problems here. Number one, I can't see the page. Number two, I can't read the language. My other friend speaking in Arabic to an Arabic judge, probably without any warning, not appropriate. But, no, no, um, no. This is, this is translated already, right? So there's an argument my learned friend should have checked the point when he's trying to make a distinction between obligation and debt. Uh, by reference yeah. to a translation, where it clearly, when you look at the source text, it's a it's a bad point. That's yeah, that's, that's it's a short this point. Is, it's translated, right? I mean, this one has been legally translated, I'm afraid, right? The, yes, I found this on the web. This this article article been legally translated to this court, right? No. No, it, it's it's used by my learned friend as an example to suggest that uh, debt and obligation mean the same, uh, are the same, and because it sure. does. Sure, 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 but uh, my, my point, the, 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 this article from the, the commercial, from the, from the company law, um, is being provided to this court just as it is, or has been legally translated from, 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 uh, from Lexis Nexis, I guess. Yes, my lord, yes, the commercial, so the, the CCL provisions of 1984 statute, the 2015 statute, 2021 statute, mm -hmm. uh, Lexis Nexis translation. So yeah. I don't think the issue is to Le 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 a language point that obligation and debt mean the same thing as shown by a particular statute. He should, in our submission, take the take the trouble to actually check out check up the underlying Arabic. That's 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 the short point that we're making. Well, 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 with respect, um, I need to be told that there is an error in my translation. Uh, and when mm -hmm. parties put into the bundle an agreed translation, which, which is the wheelin which we put in, we all parties agreed to put it in, uh, then I ought to have a bit of advance notice about it. And I shouldn't have an advocate speaking Arabic to an Arabic judge in a court. Well, with respect, uh, uh, task three in the bundle is an is a is an is a translation which makes it clear that Reimbursement to third party debts and Article 33, whoever reimburses yes, the I, debt. I think ju just just for the cl clarity and record, we don't speak Arabic. We, he just want to 
and a pronounce the word in, in the Arabic uh, text that said the word itself. Anyway, let's don't make it too much of this uh, as an issue, so we can handle it in your final submission or during your week. My Lord, yes. All right, great, carry on, carry on. Well, look, so we've looked at uh, de facto partnership. Alternatively, uh, GMHS relies on Article 16.3. We do have that. Uh, that's the 2015 Commercial Companies Law, which is behind tab six. Uh, and uh, Article 16 uh, should be at 154616. Mm. And if we look at uh, Article 16.1, a third party may prove the presence of the memorandum of the company or any amendment by all means of proof. So that is the third party right to prove uh, uh, the memorandum. Also, such that it may hold to the existence or the invalidity of the company against the shareholders. Yeah. But that's the that's the right we rely on. And then uh, Article 16.2. If the invalidity of the company is ruled based on third party request, the company shall be deemed void ab initio as against such third party persons who are contracted. So uh, we've seen in respect to the de facto company that as between as between shareholders, uh, it's not void ab initio, it's void from the time of the um, um, relevant event or the, or the declaration. Persons who are contracted with such third party company in the name of the company shall be personally and jointly liable. So that's the third party protection by rendering the individuals personally liable. And then three in our submission is dealing specifically with a where an invalidity has been ruled and there is a liquidation. Uh, and uh, in those circumstances said that the debtors of the company, which we say are the shareholders, may not request the invalidity or hold thereto in order to be discharged from their debts to the company. Now, if we're right and that shareholders, then it's dealing purely with shareholder rights. If the if if well, then, if friend is right and the debtors is a, a third party, is an outsider, then that additional wording in the 2015 statute, uh, first of all, is within the context of uh, a liquidation. Second of all, creates an obvious uh, inconsistency with uh, part one of the statute, Article 16.1, and this court, as a matter of statutory construction, will be required to resolve that. But our primary argument is that the uh, this statute, the 2015 statute, cannot apply when it's absolutely clear that the uh, side agreement and that the uh, company contract are formed by reference to the 1984 statute, which took effect when the side agreement was executed and falsified the company contract back in 2013. And insofar as the company is void, uh, null and void ab initio, it could not have been brought back to life, staggering from the grave, by the passing of Article 16.3 uh, two years later in the uh, Commercial Companies Law 2015. Mm. And, and we say if, if the law were otherwise, then it would entirely remove the deterrent consequence of the illegality which is set out in the company law which is the nullity and the potential that, uh, as provided in Article 16.1 and as provided in the 1984 statute, a third party may rely on the nullity or the invalidity of the company uh, against, the, against its shareholders. If I can move to the uh, commencement issue. Yes. Commencement date, as we've seen, is left blank. GMG, GMGHS says that's by way of oversight. Uh, there was some discussion in following emails, but in the House submission, that was inconclusive. OIC's case is that the non agreement is precisely because of the VUPA clause, and we've seen that in the emails that's referred to. It has been hoped to secure VUPA's agreement before signing. Uh, as it happened, that wasn't achieved, and the Bupa clause is precisely about protecting Oman's position in circumstances where Bupa does not agree, uh, does not approve. Uh, it was uh, anticipated that would happen in a month. Uh, as matters transpired, it took uh, they, uh, even 
by late May 2015, they were still little further in the terms of achieving Bupa's approval. And as we've seen, Bupa was integral to the economics of the proposed joint venture. Um, GMGHS certainly wanted the transfer of the Bupa lives, uh, and a friend's right to point that out, but OIC needed the transfer because otherwise Amman would be paying GMGHS its fee and still maintaining, but still having to maintain its own claims administration. Now, there are two conditions precedent. The first we say uh, is, is, the, is, the, is the licensing. That we say is a starting point uh, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the, the, the interrelationship between the MOU and the TPA. Um, indeed, Mr. Karma of uh, GlobeMed concedes that link um, between the MOU and the, and the TPA. Uh, and if we could quickly look at F1-1794, Mm. This is Mr. Kama halfway down the page to Mr. Shuffle. Uh, the final paragraph of the sort of uh, another paragraph um, beginning, however, sentence beginning, however. We will need to wait reception of your comments on the business cooperation agreement. So that's the TPA entitled TPA service agreement that will govern our commercial relationship. The two documents he's earlier being referred to the MOU, which you'll see in the subject line. The two documents are interrelated from our perspective and need to be reviewed together. So this is Mr. Karma, who's essentially leading uh, on the GlobeMed side, explaining how the two documents are uh, interrelated and need to be reviewed uh, together. And of course, uh, the TPA in its uh, recital B precisely refers to GlobeMed as being a duly licensed uh, TPA. Uh, and uh, it is uh, made clear in Claude 1.2.4 of the TPA agreement the recitals are part of the agreement, even though they appear on their face to be mere recitals, they are part. So it's a part of the agreement, an integral part of the agreement. The GlobeMed should be a duly licensed uh, TPA. Uh, and indeed, the agreement then provides for GlobeMed to provide TPA, which it would require to be licensed. Um, and uh, uh, in, in those circumstances, in our submission, it is plainly uh, conditional uh, on the, the obligations are plainly conditional on, on uh, GlobeMed having been licensed. Without it being licensed, it couldn't possibly. Uh, provide the TPA services and it would not, in accordance with Recycle B, part of the agreement, be a licensed TPA. Now, in terms of the licensing process, uh, the DHA uh, had issued in 20, uh, early 2015 a PN1 of 2015. That's an F1609. Sorry, F12036. So you'll see at the top of the after the table, the preamble, all applicants for the 2515 health insurance permit should understand that the standards of assessment will be much higher than for the 2014 applications. And then over page at 2037, uh, after the uh, first heading application process and timelines, first bullet, health insurance permits remain valid until 15th February in the year following that in which they were approved. This means that all existing permit holders, HIPs for 2014, will be valid until the 15th of February 2015. And then applications have to be made by the 22nd of January. And uh, there was a little bit of a, an issue about that, but essentially it was accepted that an application had been made by the 22nd of January. Um, but Miss Atala's evidence, which we uh, have in bundle D uh, at uh, paragraph Sorry, in a second statement, I'll just quickly find the page number there. At uh, page 303, so that's D303. Mm. Uh, she accepts that GMH, GM, GHS did not have an unconditional license until the 16th of, uh, of June. 
So paragraph 33, subsequently on the 16th of June, the DHA issued General Circular 5 uh, and um, uh, announcing an unconditional license uh, in respect of uh, Globe Med. And uh, we can see that at 37, sorry, F 3798. This is issued, and you'll see halfway down the table at the top, issued uh, publication date the 16th of June. And it's probably worth picking up the last paragraph. Uh, although there are still a very small number of TPAs with conditional compliance status because they've still either to obtain an FI license, we've taken the decision not to allow this to affect the state of the insurers they service. However, they must still aim to comply and we will give them a final deadline after which point, if they remain non-compliant, their HIP status will become suspended, preventing them from renewing any existing business or accepting any new schemes. Mm -hmm. Dangers, if you like, of having a conditional compliance. But as of June, as of this date in June, the 16th of June, uh, if one turns on to page 3800 in appendix B, We can see that GlobeMed there on the left hand side uh, had unconditional compliance, but only from the 16th of June. And then in respect of HAAD, if we look at F1, uh, F1960, 1960, <clears throat> they had initial approval from the 9th of December 2014 until the 8th of March 2015. So those numbers right in the middle of the page, uh, right in the middle of the screen. The interesting issue as to what, what happened then in terms of uh, regulatory authorization. But in any event, uh, at 3779, Uh, we see the the license, the authorization certificate that was eventually given, and you'll see top left hand corner issue date the 27th of May 2015 uh, to expire 26th of May 2016. But of course, by that point, um, uh, Arman had exercised its, uh, had, had sent the notification letter and exercised its right to walk away from the venture. So that at the time of the notification letter, uh, it was not, there was no authorization from HAAD, they were still awaiting that authorization. You see that in this in this document here. Uh, the other condition to which I referred was the share transfer and clearly the, uh, the memorandum was premised on the fact that the parties were in, in discussion. Clause four of the memorandum, I don't think we need to turn it up, explains that where the, until the shares have been transferred, the present MAU shall be considered uh, as a shareholder agreement, it's clear that the wider transaction did not take effect until the shares were uh, transferred and we see provision in the agreement for the transfer synergized to, to acquire the 51 percent for the files to sign the necessary papers and indeed the shareholding structures to become as set out in the memorandum of understanding. And, and for, for Amman to make any profits from the JV, Clearly, two things had to happen. GM GHS had to be providing the services, and that we say is the basis of a licensing condition. And Oman had to have a participation in the profits, and that required the share transfer. So that's the second condition. And we say the parties clearly had an intention. The transaction should not come into force until both the licensing and the share transfer had been effected. Um, We do, in terms of uh, conditionality, uh, that is uh, commonly uh, understood by reference to Article 420 of the Civil Code. Um, that should be at 1K 155484.
So a condition is a future matter upon the materialization of which the coming into being or ceasing to be of governing force of a disposition depends. So coming into being being a condition precedent or ceasing to be um, being a condition subsequent. So that is the explanation as a matter of the UA civil code of the function and effect of the condition. And then uh, over page and uh, article 422, we see um, um, the provision in respect of, sus of a suspension. So in order for a suspension to be valid, the condition must indicate an event which has not taken place, which could take place, has not materialized and is not impossible. And then uh, 425 down the page, disposition dependent on the condition not incompatible with the contract shall not become effective until the condition materializes. So the effectiveness of the contract depends on the condition materializing. And then going over page, uh, one has at uh, 20656 the commentary, um, which explains that uh, as, a as a matter of, by reference to Al Murshid. Um, Mm. Uh, as you can read, can read that. Um, uh, in terms of the background, in terms of the Latin and German jurisprudence from which suspense, suspensive or cancelling conditions um, come. And then. Uh, and so where there is a suspensive condition, as we uh, we argue in our case, there is no obligation until the condition materializes. Um, as a matter of UA law, it's clearly for the party asserting a condition to prove that the condition has been satisfied. And uh, we can uh, go just to one case on that, an Abu Dhabi Court of Cassation case, 2010, 845-2010. And that, that should be at one point from that 026 under the new pagination. Uh, can, can you give me the number? 155. 0, 026. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, And if I could ask, if I could go straight to the second, third sentence, beginning the effect. Yeah. The act of Article 2042 and 45, which we just looked at of the civil transactions law, is that the suspension of the obligation on a future matter, the materialization of which is indefinite, shall result in rejection of the claim for that obligation before the materialization of the condition on which it is suspended, and the burden to prove such incident lies on the obligee. And my lord, we, we have similar. Uh, uh, observations and, and findings in two other cases, DCC, Dubai Court of Session 91 of 2022, which, and this is for your Lordship's note, at K155434, and similarly, Dubai Court of Session 48 of 2007, uh, K154989. So that, that is a pretty well-established proposition by reference to those articles uh, in the Civil Code. So until the conditions are uh, materialized, the uh, Oman, we say, is free uh, to walk away. There was no further agreement or provision to lock in OIC for any particular period. The parties had proceeded uh, at their own risk, which was limited initially to one month, being a period that was then subsequently extended. Now, the, the risk may have eventuated in terms of cost to GM, GHS, but that was a risk in our case, in our submission, the GMA, GMGHS took, and in those circumstances, has no rights to no right to claim its uh, alleged reliance losses, and still less any right to claim profit. It says it would have made if the conditions uh, had been satisfied. Well, I've got some uh, a bit more uncertainty, but, um, which I should be able to finish tomorrow morning. But I don't know if that's a good point uh, to leave. I, I, I've, um, I, I will have had. Uh, two and three quarter hours. So I've still got 45 minutes, but I should be able to finish that in the first 45 minutes tomorrow. I'm, I'm, to I'm told, just, just so you're aware, well, I'm told that I was three hours and 12 minutes all in uh, this morning. 
I don't particularly need to hold my little friend to any timing is and obviously we're in your hands, but um, your, your Excellency has indicated you're happy to sit for another 30, 15 minutes. It, it might be 30 minutes would be sufficient. I don't know. I'm, I'm fine. If both of you agree on this, I'm fine. So I'm happy to go on, my Lord, but it, it, it may be 45 minutes or so. If, if that's if that's right, then we can, yes, we, can, yes. we can nail it today. Um, my Lord, in terms of uh, certainty, we say it's axiomatic as a matter of UA law that damage would be certain to occur as a condition of probability. We say that arises principally uh, by reference to uh, Article uh, 292 of the Civil Code. Uh, your Lordship has that at 155478. Okay. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just turning on my AC. Uh, my apologies, excuse me for the interruption. This is Nikki, the court reporter. I was just wondering if we're going to go on for another 45 minutes, if we could have another short break, please. Yeah, you want to you wanna break at 5 or 5.15 or? Um, say 5 o'clock, if that's acceptable to you, sir. For me, it's fine. Mr. Robert, sorry, I don't. I, that's a fifteen-minute break now, and then forty-five minutes thereafter. Is if that's all right, then I'm happy with that. Whatever should work. Yeah, I'm fine. But continue until five, then we break at five for five minutes. Sorry, I don't know what. what if you, the court, what, 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 I mean, clarify. you. you you need you, how much you need it yourself. You need 30 minutes or 15 minutes. You said you need 40, 40 minutes, 45 45 minutes. Lord, yes. Yeah, I think she she want to break after I don't know after after 15 minutes. So depends on that. My lord, my, my point is that's right in the middle of a, of a submission, so that doesn't make any sense. I'm happy to break for five minutes now if that would assist the reporter and. and yeah, yeah. If she, if, she, if she want if she want that, that's fine with me. Yeah. So you, you want to break now? Should we break uh, now? Yes. Oh. Yeah, yeah, sure. We'll break yes, five sir. minutes, come back. No worries, no worries. Yeah. All right. Thank we'll see you. you. Bye. Well, Lord, yes, we're, we're moving on to the lack of certainty. Um, we're explaining that it's axiomatic as a matter of UA law that damages should be certain. As a condition of their recoverability, we were looking at Article 292 of the Civil Code, which uh, introduces the concept of the natural result of the harmful act, and that that has been the hook in terms of um, statutory provision for the requirement that damages be uh, be uh, be certain or inevitable. Uh, and your lordship will also be familiar with uh, Article 389, uh, the commentary to Article 389, to which I probably don't need to take your lordship now, but that provides essentially to similar effect uh, in respect of contractual uh, claims. Uh, if we do need to quickly look at the Union Supreme Court's decision in 621 of 2004, which I think under the new pagination should be a 154912. Uh, and uh, yes. if we if we could uh, go uh, go on in that report, uh, four pages to nine one six. And halfway down, the, or sort of two thirds of the way down the page, paragraph beginning, it has also been established. Uh, in the case law of this court that the determining factor for entitlement to compensation is the actual damage occurring at present or in the future as a direct result of the fault and not the potential damage and concluding that the occurrence of damage in the future is established falls within the authority of the trial court so long as its judgment is based on plausible reasons and then if we could go on to page 154920 uh, new pagination beginning the second sentence of this page, Article 389 of the same law stipulates, if the amount of compensation is not determined by law or by the contract, the judgment shall assess in an amount equivalent to the damage effectively suffered at the time of the occurrence thereof. This means the entitlement of an injured party to compensation is based on the condition that damage is a direct result 
of the fault and actually occurs at present or in the future. As for the potential damage that is not certain to occur in the future, no compensation shall be payable, therefore, unless it actually occurs, which means an injured party may claim compensation for future damage if it is certain to occur. And so that decision of the Union Supreme Court is, a, in our submission, a correct statement of, of the law as it arises in Article 292 and Article 389 of the Civil Code. The, the issue is not, uh, in our submission, the future nature of the damage. It's not enough for GMGHS to say, well, actually, as it happens, we're standing looking back at the contract period of two, two, 2015 to 2018. The issue is as to the hypothetical nature of the damage. And if one looks, for example, at the non-OIC uh, damages claim, asking uh, what would have happened if OIC had acted as a strategic partner, what, whatever that uh, analysis uh, means. Uh, would other insurers have flocked to use GMGHS as, as a TPA? Well, in our submission, th that is entirely speculative. Those damages are, in the language of the decisions, entirely uh, potential or prospective, and they're certainly not uh, properly described as being either inevitable or certain. And, and when one looks at the, 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 the language of the judgments, it's that language of certainty, uh, inevitability as against potential or prospective damage that one sees. An example of that is uh, Dubai Court of Cassation 371 uh, of 2004, <coughs> should be uh, K154953. If we could go on three pages. Oh, sorry, if we could go to the second page of the judgment, I apologise. The last um, paragraph uh, five, it is established that the compensation shall not be established unless there is a breach to the right or a financial interest to the damage. The damage shall be established that it shall be actually occurred or its occurrence in future shall be inevitable or inevitably, as the possibility of the damage shall not be valid to be the base for claiming the compensation. It's a rather unhappy translation, but essentially uh, contrasting on the one hand inevitability, which is required in respect of loss of future profit, and possibility of damage, which is not a valid basis for claiming compensation as a matter of UAE law. Now, faced with that uh, uh, case law and that, that those statute provisions and, and that jurisprudence, GMGHS's uh, belated response has been to suggest um, that uh, the court can ignore these requirements in the civil code on the basis that these are mere points of procedure, uh, notwithstanding they're in the civil code, and that on that basis, uh, the DRC court should apply its own laws of procedure, uh, and that, that for these purposes is a standard of proof, and all that is required to show is that on the balance of probabilities, uh, these losses uh, would be likely to have occurred. Now, that we say is simply wrong. That's, that's why the point wasn't, uh, was neither pleaded nor indeed uh, argued, uh, and, and essentially until the skeleton argument. Um, the relevant principles are helpfully summarised in Dicey, which your Lordship should have in K155552. And the rule, as in Dicey, at the top of the page, all matters of procedure are governed by the domestic law of the country to which the court, wherein any legal proceedings are taken, belongs. And that's sort of a lex fora, the law of a forum. Uh, and then there's a useful paragraph O page, so 5155. Um, I'm not sure what the new pagination is, but if we could go on to paragraph 4004. The difficulty in applying this rule lies in discriminating between rules of procedure and rules of substance. The distinction is by no means clear cut. In drawing it, regard should be had in each case to the purpose for which the distinction is being used and the consequence of the decision in the instant context. The rule under examination must be considered as a whole without giving undue weight to the verbal formula selected by previous judges or statute to introduce the rule. So the words where proceedings are taken in any court uh, have been held to introduce a rule of substance. The me mechanistic approach, sometimes found in English cases, of relying on the classification of the introductory verbal formula is used in a quite different statute. 
or of accepting a classification as procedural or substantive, made for some purpose quite unrelated to the conflict of laws, is now discredited. Pausing there, one had, for example, a situation where, uh, where one was dealing with limitation of claims, and in some instances that was described as uh, barring a remedy, in which case it was said to be a matter of procedure, where in other cases it was barring a right, and that was said to be a matter of substance. So if you take that formalistic approach, you end up with some pretty arbitrary results, and that is, uh, as described, the mechanistic approach that was sometimes taken as a in, in English law. Reading on, the distinction may have to be drawn in one place for the purpose of the rule, but another place for the purpose of the rule is that statutes affecting <laughs> procedure are, while statutes affecting substance are not, presumed to have retrospective effect. This is not to say that the distinction may not be drawn in the same place for many purposes. It's merely to deny that it must necessarily be drawn in the same place for all purposes. The primary object of this rule is to obviate the inconvenience of conducting the trial of a case containing foreign elements in a manner with which the court is unfamiliar. In pr principle, therefore, if it's possible to apply a foreign rule or to refrain from applying an English rule without causing any such inconvenience, those rules should not necessarily for the purpose of this rule be classified as procedural. So well, if, you, if your lordship feels uncomfortable applying Article 292 or 389 of the Civil Code as a matter of convenience because you're so, this court is so unfamiliar with the operation of those, uh, those principles, then uh, they should be uh, deemed to, or they're more likely to be deemed to be matters of procedure. Uh, and on that basis, the court could say, well, it, it, it's not required uh, to operate those rules. It can require, it can apply its own procedural rules. And then just over page, we have reference to the decision of the High Court of Australia, paragraph 4005. Nonetheless, in John Pfeiffer Party and Rogers, the High Court of Australia considered the English common law understanding of matter of procedure to be overly broad and capable of undermining the faithful application of the Lex Causae. Pausing there, the Lex Causae is the, is the law, the governing law in a commercial case that the parties have chosen for their own contract. And so if you read procedure too broadly in terms of applying the Lex Forae and, and displacing the Lex Causae, the law chosen by the parties, uh, that, that is considered by the High Court of, of Australia to be, uh, to be a wrong approach. Reading on, it adopted a broader understanding of what constitutes matters of substance and stated that matters that affect the existence, extent or enforceability of the rights or duties of the parties to an action are matters that on their face appear to be concerned with issues of substance. In Harding and Wheelands, however, the House of Lords restated the orthodox approach in English law and overruled the majority decision of the Court of Appeal, which had followed the Australian authorities, which narrowed the meaning of the term procedure. So, in essence, we say that the, what the Australian court has done is taken a common sense approach in uh, finding that procedural rules govern the mode and conduct of court proceedings, while substantive rules govern the kind or the amount uh, of damages. Uh, and one sees this uh, in the Pfeiffer decision. If you could quickly turn that up, that should be at 154859, new pagination. Mm. Right, just read from paragraph 99. Two guiding principles should be seen as lying behind the need to distinguish between substantive and procedural issues. First, litigants who resort to a court to obtain relief must take the court as they find it. A plaintiff cannot ask the tribunal, which doesn't exist in the forum should be established a deal in the forum with the claim that the plaintiff makes. Similarly, the plaintiff cannot ask the courts of the forum to adopt procedures or give remedies of a kind which their constituting statutes do not contemplate any more than the plaintiff can ask the court to apply any, any adjectival law other than the laws of the forum. Secondly, matters which affect the existence, extent or enforceability of the rights or duty of the parties to action are matters that on their face appear to be concerned with issues of substance and not with rights of procedure. If you're being asked to, 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 to uh, award a remedy of a kind which uh, the constituting statutes do not contemplate, then that is a matter of, that, that's a, as a matter of procedure, is a, is a foreign procedure which the court should not apply. But in, in our submission, the uh, issue here is whether uh, the recoverability of damages that are, that are uncertain, that we say is clearly a matter uh, of the of available 
heads of damage. It's clearly a matter of substance. Uh, and on, on that basis, the, the party should be held to the uh, to the governing law, the lex causa, which they have which they have chosen. This is not a case where there'll be any inconvenience to the DIFC court in awarding uh, damages or in, in, in failing to award damages that are uncertain in applying the lex causa, the, the civil code. Uh, and the issue of whether damages are recoverable in our, in our submission is a matter of, of substance, which uh, should be decided under, under UAE law. How that loss is then proved, uh, and we say Malone and Fred is right, that the, uh, as a matter of DIFC procedural and evidential law, it would be the ordinary civil standard proof uh, that then applies. So the claimant has to show on the balance of probabilities that they suffered loss, uh, future loss of profits that can be said to be certain in, in accordance with relevant provisions of a civil code. And, and we say when one looks at the approach of the DIFC courts, that's entirely consistent with that uh, pragmatic common sense approach of uh, of uh, the Australian High Court, uh, and we see that from the two cases that we have in the bundle. The first, uh, which my learned friend took you to, the the Lama case, which we'll just go back to briefly. That should be at K one five five three two three, and if I could go straight to paragraph twenty three at page one five five three two seven. Paragraph 23, Article 293 is a different category. I think the submission made by Mr. Black on the back of this provision in his written opening would have come more or less out of the blue, and there's a good arguable case it should have been pleaded. Oh, I think we can ignore that sentence, sorry, second sentence. The submission in question was made in the context of Larmack's case. The remedies for the breach of UA law were matters of procedure, and therefore, in accordance with English established English common law, the applicable remedies were those available in DIFC law, including multiple damages under Article 42 of the Damages and Remedies Law. In Harding and Whelan's, Lord Hoffman observed that in applying the distinction between the cause of action and the remedy in actions at all, the court is essentially the kind of damage which constitutes actionable injury and the assessment of compensation by damages for the injury which has been held to be actionable. The identification of actionable damage is an integral part of the rules which determine liability. And that, my Lord, is, is what we say this court is now, is now considering, the identification of actionable damage uh, pursuant to the Lex Cows, I pursuant to Article 292389 of the Civil Code. And that is a matter of substance, substance substantive law, um, um, the court to apply the Lex uh, Cows. There, there is also uh, um, uh, paragraph 219, we can look again at that. Uh, you, you were taken to it this morning. Um, if we just quickly get back to it. So it was argued that Article 42 uh, gave a right to damage in respect uh, of an additional head of damage. And because, the, the, as your Lordship identified, the substantive law was UAE law, that was found, uh, therefore, Article 42, because it provided a head of damage, was not applicable um, um, uh, because DIFC law was, was, the, was the, merely the procedural law and Article 42, 42 in providing a, a new, a, a distinct head of damage uh, could not apply because it was a substantive matter and the substantive, the lex causa was UA law under which there was no such uh, right to multiple damages. <laughs> the other case is Sky News and CASA. Uh, that should be a K155238. And if we could go on to paragraph, uh, so the issue that he, in this case is whether interest could be awarded. And if we go on to paragraph 26. As to the, as to the claim for interest under the governing law of the contract, UAE law, so the same situation, UA law being the lex causa, the DRC law being the, the procedural, the lex forae, there is an entitlement to interest where sums due have not been paid at a rate of up to 12% per annum, although it appears that the normal rate under, awarded under this provision is 9%. Article 17 of the DFC Law of Damages and Remedies entitles a party which establishes it's not been paid a sum of money due to it to an award of interest calculated by reference to the average 
short-term lending rates to prime borrowers. The situation, therefore, is that the law of contract provided for a particular head of loss, namely interest, and the law of the forum provides by Article 17 of the law of damages and remedies for an award of interest by way of, by way of remedy for that loss. Mr. Killen referred me to the decision of Mr. Justice Leggett, as he then was uh, sitting in the London Commercial Court in A.S. Latvius Crybanker. Uh, in paragraph seven of his judgment, Mr. Justice Leggett said, and then quotation from that, the proper approach in applying this distinction, distinction between matters of substance governed by the Lex Causa, matters of procedure governed by the Lex Foro, has been considered by the House of Lords in Harling and Whelan's and by the Supreme Court in Cox and uh, Rule. Those cases decide that the question whether a particular head of loss is recoverable as a question of substance governed by the law applicable to the obligations. On the other hand, whether there's a remedy available for any item of loss is a procedural question governed by English law as to the law of the forum. Following that distinction to a case of claim for interest, the Court of Appeal held in Maha and Group Armour Grand states that the existence of a right to recover interest as a head of damage is a matter of substance governed by the applicable law, but the Section 35A is a procedural provision which creates a remedy exercise at the court's discretion. The Court of Appeal considered this discretionary remedy is available, whether a substantive right to recover interest exists or not, although the factors to be taken into account and exercise in the court's discretion might well include the many relevant provisions of the applicable foreign law related to the covering of interest. I propose, uh, this is the judge in Sky News Arabia, to adopt this approach articulated by Mr Justice Leggett, Accordingly, I find this court in quantifying the interest recoverable should have regard to the substantive law of the contract. So the availability of interest is found uh, to be a part of the substantive law, in effect, a head of recoverable damage. Uh, and uh, as I've explained in this case, the issue as to whether damage is, rec is recoverable depends on its certainty. And we say that is a matter, that's a, that is a matter of recoverability. It's a matter of whether there is a, a, a head of damage, it's not an issue as to whether there is a particular remedy or not. Uh, and it, this is a remedy that the court uh, is well able to give as a matter of its own procedural law. And in those circumstances, we say it's clear um, that uh, UAE substantive law applies in requiring certainty as to recoverable uh, future loss and profits. Um, uh, in terms of the <laughs> Well, we say there is no possible basis for certainty, whether you are seeking to assess the loss looking forward or indeed looking back at what might have been hypothetically. Um, there there is, was potentially one arguable basis of certainty. That was uh, Annex 2 to the Memorandum of, of Understanding. It's, it's possibly worth just quickly um, turning up Memorandum 2, just so your Lordship has, has seen it. Uh, it's in bundle F. Mm. Um, and it is at page 2105. Essentially, these are, there's a huge amount of modelling that went on in respect of the TPA agreement. And that modelling you'll see is by reference to the three years of the term, the contractual term. And then there's uh, a, a, an estimate. So this is the essentially the P&L for years one, two and three uh, pursuant to that modelling exercise. And there you see some really quite detailed um, and specific assessments in respect of particular items of uh, revenue and indeed of, of cost. So that that might have been uh, uh, a guide in terms of providing some degree of certainty. But as, as you will see, uh, Your Excellency, it was abandoned, it has been abandoned by GMGHS's expert, Mr. Cottle, as a basis for uh, any modelling, not least because the lie, the, re the relevant number of lives uh, it, it was in that OIC, in fact, had was, yeah. was different to that assumed in the modelling exercise. Uh, and indeed, that point makes the further point that there's huge churn in respect of health insurance and that it's very hard to predict the, the, the relevant number of lives. And when one looks at the modelling, you, you, and we'll obviously explore this with the experts, you'll see that there are very significant issues as to the number of lives, as to when they would have transferred, as to whether BUPA would have transferred, as to whether providers would have and, and clients would have stayed, uh, and what, what the relevant costs would have been, which costs were fixed, which costs were variable, which costs were sunk, which costs were incremental. To the extent, if your logic has already started 
uh, embarked on the task of reading that expert evidence to your lordship will have a have a, some uh, understanding of the complexity of those expert issues that we will need to explore uh, next week. And in those circumstances, it's entirely unsurprising that the experts uh, end up with a range between 5 million dirham and 126 uh, million dirham. Uh, and we say that the exercise of uh, these experts uh, making those sort of computations and being cross-examined on them is not uh, a familiar exercise to, to the UAE law, precisely because UAE law is, is much more demanding in terms of the requirements of certainty and inevitability. Um, the learned friend correctly stated the, 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 the key issues in terms of uh, quantum. Um, the uh, firstly, in of, firstly, in terms of the contractual term, I, I think I've addressed your lordship on that. We say it's clearly um, three, three years um, in terms of the Bupa portfolio and whether it should be included, and in terms of whether um, the exception to exclusivity in respect of 50,000 lives, uh, how that's reflected in the quantification. We do, in terms of quantification, uh, make some wry observations. Firstly, that uh, the, the letter before claim identified the claim as being $14.5 uh, million. I, I, I'm not going to take you to it. The reference is G4889. Um, uh, uh, 4895. And of that, only six and a half million dollars was loss of profit. So um, so at that stage, the loss was identified as a relatively small sum before the expert had got to work. Um, uh, in terms of the particulars of claim, as you'll have seen, that, that is 36.5 million. Um, it, it, it is odd, and it's perhaps worth just turning this up in terms of the pleading bundle. Um, uh, page nine, A nine. Yes. So there you see the particulars of loss and damage. So forty nine uh, US million US dollars for OIC loss, twenty two million dollars for non OIC loss, and then thirty five uh, costs. So. If you if you took off the non OIC claims, you'd be getting back towards the 14 million that was in the um, letter before claim. But more importantly, at paragraph 26, the claimant has comforted his loss by reference to pre conjectural projections anticipated by the parties set out in Appendix 2. A detailed account from which the summary is drawn is at Annex 4 here too. The claimant reserves the right to amend the sum following disclosure of the defendant's financial state and, and actual levels of business that fell within the conditions of the agreement. Well, of course, their expert has denied uh, the relevance of, of Annex 2 and has renounced reliance on its uh, on any certainty that might have been deduced from the from Appendix 2 of the MOU. Notwithstanding that, the claimant has failed to exercise the right it sought to reserve to amend its claim. So its claim is still pleaded on the basis of Annex 2 to the MOU, but its expert has prepared his report on an entirely different basis. And insofar as the claimant reserved its right to amend, it hasn't in fact uh, done so. So there's a certain amount of confusion, even within the pleading and expert evidence on the part of the claimant. Uh, and the basis that the uh, claimant has instead preferred, or his expert has instead preferred, is that based on uh, alleged certainty provided in the evidence of Mr. Saliba, and we'll need to examine that, probe that in the course of cross-examination. Um, there are four uh, quick points on uh, quantum. Firstly, um, uh, in the hypothetical, um, GMGHS would have been majority owned by Synergize, and so would have had 51% of the shares. We simply say that as a matter of factual causation, given that GMGHS was uh, was simply a joint venture company uh, to perform the services and then to uh, essentially distribute the profits, those profits would have been immediately passed through to Synergize. So as a matter of factual causation on the hypothetical, but for the alleged breach, GMGHS would have been left with 49% of the profits. 
for GM GHS now to claim 100% would present it with a massive windfall, and indeed it would be better off by reason of breach. And it's true that Mr Justice Fields uh, did not allow Synergize to present, to prevent its, present its own claim. And, and one of the reasons he did that was precisely because he left open the point, or he, he made the point that it was still open to uh, uh, to uh, Armand to make its case that there should be a discount of 51%. And that indeed, that, that defence was on the pleadings uh, and that therefore, to some extent, he clearly believed that, that mitigated any unfairness to Armand uh, insofar as Synergize was not able to pursue uh, its claim. And you, you'll have seen the reference by my friend this morning to the fact that it was not allowed on the basis that it had failed to tender the one pound, one dollar required in order to uh, for it to sue on the requirement to, tr to transfer the shares. So that was that was a, a point in terms of its inability uh, to sue. Uh, my second point is respect to the term of the TPA, and that's clause 12.1. I've made my points on that, but essentially uh, it, it, the period was automatically renewable unless notice was served. Um, if notice was served, it, in my submission, it's clear that the uh, period, the term, that would have come to an end um, by, by giving the one year's notice. Um, uh, I'm not going to make the submissions again. We say it's clear that it's three a time. Indeed, we've seen the reference to year one, two and three in Annex two to the Memorandum of Understanding. Um, uh, my third point is that one cannot include with any certainty the pupa portfolio. We have no idea whether and indeed when it would have transferred if my learned friend wishes to show by reference to evidence when uh, that is likely to have happened, um, we will be we will be interested. But it, it seems pretty clear on the documentary evidence of the commercial discussions going on between February and May that, that the parties were getting no closer to uh, to uh, pupa approval than they had been at the beginning of the process. And fourthly, we say it's necessary to exclude the fifty thousand lives in respect of which OIC Amman could have used an alternative uh, TPA. Um, and as I, as I said earlier, there's no evidence that into any particular circumstances in which that right would have been triggered precisely because we, the notification letter meant that uh, the, the, that it, the uh, TPA arrangements uh, never became effective, never commenced. Um, and we say in respect of that exception, insofar as the parties have clearly negotiated, in particular Oman has negotiated an exception to 50,000, it wouldn't have done so presumptively unless there was a real prospect that it was going to face that issue in respect of particular insurers declining to, to, to go to GlobeMed or to want their customers to be dealt with by GlobeMed. So that it was clearly that concern which led to Oman feeling it necessary to negotiate that provision in, in the agreement. So finally, we say that the claim fails in our case, in our submission, to cross any of the necessary thresholds. Firstly, GMHS was a nullity from its inception because of the side agreement which rendered the company contract a sham and is not in our submission saved either by a de facto company, which would protect shareholders between themselves, or indeed uh, Article 16.3 of the Commercial Companies Law 2015, which uh, came two years, two years later. And secondly, the TPA was not intended to have commenced, didn't commence. And we say that it was clear that commencement required pupa approval and two, uh, the satisfaction of two conditions pressed and two substantive suspense conditions, both licensing and the share transfer. And until those conditions were satisfied, OIC Amman was entitled to withdraw. And lastly, we say that damage, the damage claim is not susceptible to any certainty even on the part of uh, GlobeMed, still less, less on the part of the on the part of the marketing and accountancy expert, which we will see and hear over the course of next week. And for all or indeed any of those reasons in our submission, the claims should be dismissed. So Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, I think uh, we agree for tomorrow you will have opening submission for two hours, I believe. No, but no, 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 I finished it. But this is something. Yes, yeah, sorry. We, my lord, I've I've I've, I've finished. Uh, and I'm grateful you, because to... I'm opening a document which says um, unless there is a, another 
Now, yes. so tomorrow but, we'll but, start with the expert. So no, my lord, we, we start with um, Maitre Atala, the in-house lawyer of GlobeMed, GMGHS, and then we have in the afternoon, possibly Mr. Roger Saliba. Um, mm. Are there, are there concerns about time table? Well, I think, yeah, but I've, I've received a, another document here from the registry, but um, anyway, might be some change happening. Uh, so tomorrow we'll, we'll start with the, um, with, with the expert directly without any su further submission, right, from both parties? Not, not with the expert, Your Excellency. So to, tomorrow morning, uh, we with, will start so. with the claimant's lay witnesses. So those are my non-expert yeah. witnesses. That'll be Mr. Yeah. Tala is giving evidence first. Um, and I don't know whether my learned friend has any idea how long that is likely to take. I mean, obviously, no one will hold him to his estimate, but if he has a view on that, um, he, he may say so. But um, if we if he completes that, then then my next witness will be uh, Mr. Saliba. Um, and yeah. at, at the moment that is scheduled, I think, to, to take us into into Monday. Have the oh, um, then I, yeah. I think, I'd I'd to, I think I'd want to take it to finish with Metra Tala tomorrow. That's that's what I think I've agreed to do, and I'm happy to, to be held to that. So thank you. Tomorrow, so tomorrow we'll start nine and we'll break at twelve. Then we'll, we'll resume at two p.m. until four. Is that is that correct? That's fine. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you for, for very much for your time, and I hope to see you tomorrow in court. Yes. Hello, we'll see you then. Thank you. Appreciate it.